Morning, everybody. I'm Steve Allen. Oh, it's just told you that, hasn't it? I mean, what's the point of telling you twice? It's lovely to have your company. Uh, I trust you're enjoying the sunshine because it's going to finish on Thursday. And then the thunderstorms come in and we'll have 36 hours of thunderstorms. So good opportunity to fill up your water butt. Good opportunity to make your grass look as green and lush as it can be. You get that, don't you? When you've had lots of dry weather, I've noticed I've sort of driven on the 316. It's a road. And uh, on one side, just uh, outside Richmond, uh, all the grass there just dried up. We have a downpour of rain and the next day, ping, looks all fantastic again. It's lovely. So uh, make the most of it. You know, if you're going to go to the beach today, I'll probably be about your last, uh, last, uh, last time you can go, really, uh, which is a shame. Uh, I've got a lovely story about a deaf border collie who had to stop because he, he was deaf and he couldn't hear, you know, she'd get <laughs> nothing. I couldn't hear. The dog was sitting there, like, doing its fingernails, reading a book, you know. But it's now been taught sign language. It's good, isn't it? They've taught it sign language. Uh, plus, the top cop who only kneels before the Queen, God and his wife, Anne Unrecognisable Robinson, takes over Countdown. When I say unrecognisable, you'll need to go onto the internet and put in Anne Robinson, click on images, you will be horrified at how different she looks. In fact, if somebody hadn't told you that it was Anne Robinson, you would think it was somebody dressed up as Anne Robinson. You know, the hair's roughly the same, and but the uh, the face is, is almost unrecognisable, which always, you know, makes me want to tell everybody, listen, if, if you... D I mean, why don't people just want to grow old gracefully? Why? What is this obsession with, with having sort of cosmetic surgery? Poor old Jordan, that faded old has-been has just jetted off on another holiday. This will be the third one. Uh, she's going to... Where's she going to? Turkey this time. So she'll have to self-isolate. But if she doesn't have a job, she'll just stay at home in the dirty, filthy, mucky mansion. And uh, amazing, she was pictured carrying boxes in. I thought she couldn't walk, but she managed to make it to the airport and drag her little tiny suitcase along with her. She's filming it for her, her YouTube thing. I've, I don't know how many people watch that. And Turkey's on the red list so she'll have to isolate when she comes home. She's gone there for cosmetic surgery and she's taken the little handbag with her. That's the boyfriend. And uh, as I say, his parents must have despaired by now. What a waste of space he turned out to be. You know, so they have little pictures taken at Stansted Airport. Such is her tragic life. And she's having more cosmetic surgery. You'd have thought she'd have looked at her face in the mirror at the moment and gone, I think we've screwed this one up. Because it just, it's not good. It's not good. It's, it's, it's not a good look. It's uh, bad. And the more surgery you have, the less chance there is of it getting better again. She will never, ever recover from what they've done to her face. And she's going to have, I think, this time round liposuction and just about everything you can think of, which is a uh, big shame. But once people become addicted to it, they become addicted to it. You know, I've seen models. I say models. Uh, you know, people who call themselves models when they can't think of any other word to describe them. Although we've, we've got loads. We've got loads of words for models nowadays. Useless, lazy, you know, you know, or, or feeling that, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so is a model, TV personality and featured on Love Island. And she got, her, she got her boobs out. So that was always good news, wasn't it? Unless they get their boobs out, they don't want them on Love Island. What they're looking for, basically, is somebody who's so trash... They're living on a caravan park in America somewhere. In fact, they seem to have quite a few Americans on this. I don't know whether perhaps it's the American version I was looking at the pictures of. Because they, they, they seem to... Most of them are sort of models. But yet you look at the pictures of them and go, models for what? What are you modelling, love? Toby jugs? They're really awful. Oh, it is the British one. I mean, yet they've got... Perhaps they couldn't find anybody who looked that bad. Perhaps, perhaps all, all of ours are actually quite good. Which is, which is a bit rare, but they, they've got a few... Of course, there's the obligatory stripper, you know. And uh, we were hoping that... Uh, oh, it's Love Island, isn't it? Love Island are going to have a disabled person on there, because that's not patronising. And we thought they'd have a gay person, but that, that would be a bit defeatist. You'd need two gay people, unless, the, uh, unless everybody's going to go swingy-swingy nowadays. I can't, can't see that happening either. Uh, grandfather died on an electric bike. You know, one of these uh, scootery type things. They call them e-bikes, don't they, or something like that? I can't remember. It's, it's, I don't know what it is. But anyway, he, 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 he died on it because he, he crashed, but he was three times over the drink limit. You know, you can't help feeling, uh, duh. Listen, I couldn't even ride a scooter, you know, in a, like um, a little motorbike 
type thing after you'd had a couple of drinks because you can't manage it, let alone somebody going on one of these electric scooter kind of things where you just turn the handlebar and off you go. So he obviously zoomed off, crashed and died. I mean, but surely it must be illegal that the government don't seem to have brought in anything. They need to sort it out in Twickenham. Because every morning the kids are out there on these things. Sometimes no lights going the wrong way up the roads, on the wrong side, against the traffic. It's going to be a going to be a death very very shortly, and you know you feel like sort of going well. You know, big surprise there. I mean, e-scooters are illegal to drive on public roads and pavements, even when sober. City of London police and the Met have been clamping down on the use. Almost a hundred people were caught illegally riding them in one week. Yeah, but what the, why don't they just take them and crush them? The only way you can ride them on the roads and on the pavements is if you've rented it. If it's your own one and you know that because they, they look a bit cheap and tatty. And uh, just absolutely awful. You're going to be seeing more and more deaths on them. And to be honest with you, I can only hold my hands up and go, told you so, told you so. You want to come, come here in the morning? You know, we've got Charing Cross Police Station over the road. Bloody useless. Because every morning I see these people. And if I see them, surely... Surely the police officers must see them in their cars. There's one bloke going up there on a skateboard, which is motorised, and he's just leaning. Yeah, every morning. You know, so they're not exactly difficult. Yes, Nick Ferrari getting to work a little bit quicker. <laughs> I love it. Steve, I've got a portable air conditioning unit in my bedroom. I'm listening in La Rochelle in France. Been here since 2017. Really hot here the last few days. 31 degrees, says Travis. 31 degrees. It's a lot, isn't it? Isn't it funny? The moment we get we, we get sort of a, a little bit of a heat wave in this country, fans are appearing everywhere. Every go, oh, I must get a fan, you know, which you know, which people people like. Uh, is Love Island, Love Island, about the best island in the world? I shouldn't think so. And uh, Steve, I visited Yorkshire Wildlife Park yesterday. Pleasant day we had, and to see the new polar bear family. It's only fifteen minutes from Hatfield, says Rob. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a mother and cubs, isn't it? Mother and father and cubs, or just mother and cubs? I think something like that. Makes sense about polar bears. We're at the same latitude as Hudson Bay. Yes. Oh, we've well, we got to do e- emails this morning, haven't we? We'll do the emails. I know there's one for Noreen in there. She can't believe how, how quickly people, people grow. You know, like all my, my, my godchildren. You know, when I, when I think now Charlotte is 25, I mean, it doesn't seem, only seem... No, no, they, they, they're, they're grown up. They're all working, all working, which is uh, you know, a godsend in itself. But yeah, I mean, I remember when she used to crawl into my flat and she'd, she'd stick her head around the door and then she'd come and sit on the settee and she'd watch television for about a minute. That was, that was the attention span. And then she'd get off the settee and crawl out and go back into, uh, back into mummy and daddy's place. <laughs> Happy birthday to Noddy Holder. Come on, feel the noise. He's 75 today so many happy returns thousands of bone fragments dug up under a cannibal's home in mexico they reckon there could be more than three and a half thousand bits of bodies in there well three and a half thousand people lost their lives and this is the end of them i didn't even know cannibals still existed but somebody told me in some of the uh, some of the jungles there are still cannibalistic tribes ah, doesn't seem possible does it really but I remember some, was it some years ago, the, uh, one, of the, one of the big magazines ran a feature on a tribe who they, they called them the Lost Tribe, I think. They'd found them in the middle of the jungle and they'd never met other human beings or anything like that in their entire life. And it turned out the story was a load of old spherical objects. It was a load of old rubbish. The, the, uh, the tribe had known about people for a long, long time. There is, a, there is one particular island where, you know, you, you don't venture ashore in it because they, they would kill you i think yeah inside the world's last cannibal tribes that still eat human flesh and use corpses in bloodthirsty rituals they also don't don't have any clothes good lord they don't have any clothes to wear either this is the kurawai tribe uh who uh, you know i mean it's all sorts of people i mean the uh, agori monks of india use herbal drugs alcohol and meditation as well as human flesh in their rituals In 2015, US broadcaster Reza Aslan met a number of the monks and he was filmed eating a human brain whilst taking part in a ritual. Dear. See? Quite a... Oh, dear. Obviously had a bad day, hadn't they? Poor soul. So, weddings are on. Good news. Uh, No dancing. No dancing. Uh, So, which bit pointless going to... So, what do you do? Sit there with a lemonade 
How dull. Steve, if, you, if Jordan is potless, how can she afford more surgery? It'll be free. It'll be free. So somebody would have negotiated that. You know, give us lo loads of plugs. Uh, for the for the which which they've already done they've already named the place she's going to that's their their plug I mean when they say she's having twelve thousand pounds worth of surgery that's that's what it would be if you paid for it but in, in fact what it actually costs the the surgery would be a couple of thousand if that if that you know if you're if you're using bandages and stuff like that but the trouble is she's too stupid to realise that she's basically screwed everything up because she looks ghastly. That's why you see her now. She trowels her makeup. It's like polyfiller. It is troweled on to cover all the horrible mistakes that they've had. So she should, she's also having her veneers done again. You know, and she, she shouldn't be doing any of this because, uh, you know, I think, I think it's also a sign of loneliness and desperately unhappy. And of course it would be. I mean, she's had, what, three husbands already and she still can't find one, one to settle down with. She's got the latest one, but, you know, and he's the one. Well, he's the one till about Christmas and then she'll be bored with him and she'll find somebody else because she ha she has to make money. But she doesn't know how to. She's a bit like Kerry Coke. She doesn't know how to make money either. So she's had to move up north where it's cheaper. Obviously, her agent said, listen, love, you can't afford to keep renting debt. She doesn't even own a property. Doesn't even own a property. I think she might have actually got round to getting one or something. But up north, pff, dirt cheap. Dirt cheap. Not like London. Uh, terrible. Also, we got letters from Scott's Polar Trek up for sale. And Tesco's under fire for a Frenchy cake. Not Frenchy the people, it's like a French bulldog. They've got those big ears and this is a cake. And apparently vets have complained about a cake being sold in Tesco because apparently these, these particular dogs have, they've got uh, snub nose faces and they have breathing problems. What's I got to do with a cake? I've got no idea. You think vets would keep their beaky nose out of it and sort of go and do something a bit more interesting. Astronaut Tim Peake uh, says that life has no meaning without consciousness. Whatever that means. I've got no idea. We didn't understand that one at all. And a rare Henry VIII coin has sold for about 300,000 quid. Just one coin. I wish it was me. I wish I had it. And, um, England hero, Calvin Phillips' girlfriend, is unbelievably proud. She also hasn't got any, any sense of fashion at all. She dresses like she's about to work the Reaper barn. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. These people go out there. It was like, do you remember that poor old Jodie, whatever her name was, Jodie Marsh? That poor old reprobate. My God in heaven, what does she do for a living? She used to go to nightclubs with this belt around her boobs. And it was a case of, you saddo, you saddo. And then she went out with, who did she go out with? She went out with somebody from... I think it was a group and he turned up on programs and she would turn up with him as well. And you just think, oh, my God. Yeah, we'll find out after the break. You can ponder on that one. OK, because it's all happening this morning. It's LBC. It's Steve Allen's Early Breakfast with you till seven. The moment you hold your grandson for the first time. The moment you say goodbye to a loved one for the last time. The moment it's time to hand over the family business to your daughter. Erwin Mitchell's legal and financial experts understand the complexities of life. We offer a tailored service to help you plan for the future and protect your legacy so you can enjoy the moments that matter. Authorised and regulated by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Botox is, is one of those things that people go, oh, I think I'll have Botox. You go, please don't. Please don't have Botox because you'll have it and then oh, you ha I can't remove anything. It'll all be a little bit rigid. And uh, then you have to keep having it about every three months, don't you? Because it only lasts a little while. And you do think that it's not uh, it's not particularly good for you. But then, you know, people become addicted to it. I've seen loads of people. Look at the Bride of Wildenstein. Look what she looked like in the paper. And we go, bloody hell. You're not telling me that a cosmetic surgeon let you walk out. Yes. You know why? Don't need qualifications to be a cosmetic surgeon. It must be the, one of the only practices in the medical world that you don't need to, uh, to qualify. You can go and buy the equipment. You can set yourself up. I could be, you know, Steve Allen, cosmetic surgeon to the stars. And I could start hacking around because you, you, you don't need it. It's only if you're doing it through the NHS or something like that or, or privately. But anybody can set up. I can go and buy equipment in America and in this country, which will enable you to do all sorts of procedures. 
And um, it's like liposuction. I can go and buy a liposuction machine and start operating Steve Allen liposuction to the stars. You know, and you only have to look at Jordan to realise what, my God, you've screwed your face up, looks like. What with that? And then you look at Anne Robinson. Now, she might look in the mirror and see something completely different. She might do. I don't know. But when I looked at it, I was horrified, absolutely horrified. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It's ridiculous. Uh, da -da -da -da. What did you say was going on in Green Parks, says Iceman? Elephants. 49 of them, I think. 49 elephants. They're there now. Just standing there. They don't, they don't move. OK, 49 elephants. Just so people realise what, uh, what they are nice, you know, about. Uh, Steve, Noddy Holder looks better than Anne Robinson. Well, some people don't age. And I have to say it, black people don't age. They really don't age. Look at Diana Ross. She, do, she doesn't look any different now to she did years ago. I don't know if she's had surgery. I used to share a flat with a... With a, a <laughs> He said a black stripper. Um, he, was, he was a stripper, but he didn't do that all the time. And he was in his 50s. He didn't look old at all. And I remember saying to him, I said, are you using something? He said, no, I just use like a face cream, something like that. He said, and, and he just didn't age. And I thought, oh, dear, you know, there's me. I thought I was ageing every five minutes. But when you look at Anne Robinson, she obviously thought that she needed to, to look good and tighten it all up. But unfortunately, it just doesn't look good. She, she looks unrecognisable because she's had all her features around her eyes taken away. So they basically might have just started with a blank sheet of canvas and just sort of poked two holes in it. And that could be where the eyes are. I mean, to be honest with you, the drag queens look better on RuPaul's drag thing. You know, bag of chips and all the rest of it. I mean, because they know how to do their makeup. Well, I think somebody needs to... If somebody had taught Anne Robinson how to do her makeup properly, that would be a lot better. I mean, Dale used to spend ages. You know, if, if, you, if he was doing a television show, he'd want to make sure. And the problem they had, and this is where it all falls apart, is... Uh, oh, he had loads of things. He had his nose done. He had the full face lift. Then he went back to have little bits and pieces. But they brought in high-definition television and that screwed a lot of people up because the makeup was then sprayed on. Before it was, it was the little sponges and putting it all on. And he'd sort of, he, he loved the makeup on. He loved it. John Barrowman used to walk out on the streets with his makeup on because he just looked because he had such good skin. It just seemed to work for him. But you look at the drag queens; their makeup is perfect, perfect. Look at Ru RuPaul and all these other people who've been on. And who was that one who uh, sings? and is Australian, no, and was over the back here, drag queen in a thing, and I can't remember who it is, Courtney Act, stunning, stunning, in fact it was so funny because I think he was on the same uh, reality show as Anne Widdicombe, she was a bundle of laughs as you can well imagine, Courtney Act, there was a piece on the, on the internet of him putting his makeup on and transforming himself into Courtney Act. And you look at him and you think, good looking bloke, very good looking bloke. And then he ends up as a fantastic looking woman. I mean, just fantastic. You, there's no other way around it. It is said, I don't know how true it is, that operating in Shepherd Market behind the Hilton, most of the prostitutes there are in fact men men just telling you that now and i've known that for years but courtney act i remember watching the whole makeup procedure and he would he would alternate in the house because he he's he, he's not he's not transsexual or anything like that he's a drag queen but it's a complete difference and if you look at what he looks like you know normally and then you look and you think wow and women are fascinated where does he put it that's the big question Danny LaRue used to come on stage and say, that's the big question everybody asked. He said, well, I tell you, I've been doing it so long, he said, now I whistle and it goes away by itself. <laughs> and it, but the Courtney act, I always thought, and then he appeared in Sydney at the Opera House with Conchita Wurst, uh, who was singing, who again, was sort of another drag queen, but with a beard. And it took it to another level and everybody's going, oh, amazing, absolutely amazing. And, but Courtney act, I've always thought, it's like Danny LaRue. Look at, go onto YouTube, put in Danny LaRue, and, and you watch when he walks onto a stage, he had 
a way of walking. And he'd come on stage and go, watch her, mate. Just so you were aware that it was a bloke. Of course, we knew because it was Danny LaRue. But, I mean, it was the costumes for him. He didn't have to wear little short skirts or anything else. It was all, you know, very much Edwardian, Victorian type clothing. And unless he was doing his, his complete stage show. But, I mean, he looked fantastic. And people would go, but he's got boobs. And you go, no, he actually hasn't. He actually hasn't. And I used to know a, a drag queen called Martin years ago. And he was, he was a biggish bloke. Uh, but and <laughs> he would put his sort of frock on and all the rest of it. But he had a bra... And if you if you push in, if you're a man, if you're sort of quite big up top, you push together, it can make it look as though you've got cleavage and it's your own skin. And it's very handy. And people just say, he's got boobs. You go, no, no, no. It's just that he's a large sort of sort of bloke. But uh, over the years, it's been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, Steve, speaking of uh, Katie Price, she had Harvey on yesterday morning and he dropped a swear word. He did it on Loose Women. I'm thinking to myself... Uh, you know, will that woman ever learn? No, she doesn't learn. She's she's unbelievably thick. That's why she's bankrupt. That's why, you know, she lives in a mucky mansion. And the only way she can make a living now, because nobody asked her, they have to now call her a former glamour model, because it was so many years ago, and she's unrecognisable, unfortunately. And so she, she goes on to television with Harvey, because that would probably pay a fee or they'll send a car or something like that. And... Um, and, and and that's it, really. But I mean, she's already dumped him because she's she's off on holiday now. So she must have literally gone from there to the airport because all the pictures were of her at Stansted Airport flying off to Turkey for this, let's just call it a procedure, shall we? Very odd. Liberace did exactly the same. He had lots and lots of cosmetic surgery. So when he went to sleep at night, he couldn't close his eyes. They'd taken away so much skin. And somebody said, a boyfriend, uh, said, it's it's really bizarre because you would think he was wide awake, but in fact he was asleep. I know it sounds odd, doesn't it? But uh, there it was. But he actually had uh, a boyfriend called Scott, and uh, he took him to his co cosmetic surgeon, and he wanted Scott to look like Liberace did when he was younger. So Scott had this cosmetic surgery. And in fact, you can see it on the Liberace shows. He drives the Rolls Royce onto the stage, and he says, oh, this is my friend Scott Thorson. <laughs> That's how Liberace spoke. And uh, and Scott would stand there, bleach blonde, looking like a muscle boy, but uh, not really. And uh, in all the wrong places. So there you go. You're right about drag queens, uh, says Shane. And uh, Courtney Act is a nice person. I slipped over at the Mardi Gras and he helped me up. I think he looks amazing. But did you notice that when he was on the toes with, with Anne uh, Widdicombe, she didn't like things like that at all. She was very funny about it, mainly because... He was a bloke who, when he was dressed up, looked even better than Anne Whittacombe. Because let's face it, I mean, even if she had all the cosmetic surgery in the world, she ain't never going to be a looker. You know, I don't want to be rude about it, but let's be honest about this. She's a little dumpy ex-politician, sort of ex-politician. Now, don't really sort of hear much from her. But uh, she has a column in one of the newspapers. And, um, and she's carrying a bit of weight. You know, she could lose the weight if she, if she chose to do it. I mean, I've, to be honest with you, all the programmes I've ever seen her on, she never appears to be eating. And yet she must be at some point, mustn't she? Because she's, she's, she's carrying quite a bit. But uh, no, I mean, I don't know if she's ever thought about having cosmetic surgery. But in the early days, because I'm of that age now, you know, our grandparents looked like grandparents. They were lined. They, they just looked like elderly people. Nowadays, you can't tell if your grandmother's older than you or younger than you. It's very difficult. Mind you, in some parts of the country, there's a very good chance they could be younger. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning. Nice to have your company. It's Steve Allen's Early Breakfast. It's LBC. We're bouncy, bouncy, as they say, through till seven, Monday through Friday. And it's now the 15th of June. And you've got a debt. What's today? Tuesday. So tomorrow, Wednesday, sunshine. And then Thursday, thunderstorms. Debbie and Lester says it's the Lady Boys that fascinate me. Have you ever seen the Lady Boys shows? Very, very popular. Very popular. But these are people who have had surgery. Lady boys have, have definitely had surgery, whereas, you know, drag queens haven't had surgery. But lady boys have had surgery. It's, it's quite, uh, quite normal. Quite normal. Michael Jackson, Steve, was a plastic surgery addict. And uh, Maria says, Anne Widdicombe is a practising Catholic. Perhaps the, that's the basis of her not being comfortable. What, are you telling me that you can't be Catholic and dress up in women's clothing? Well, heavens above, of course you can doesn't seem to do. and let's face it the catholic church has had more problems 
with, uh, with priests and any other religion. In fact, the Pope, I think, one, one year, was it a couple of popes ago, he fired 260 priests for sexual abuse. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't quite understand how somebody can sort of have, you know, a basis of not being comfortable with something. I mean, Courtney Act was a put, but wasn't it Anne Widdicombe who said that, you know, science will have some answers for us on why some people are gay? Well, I mean, she's got loads of gay friends. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit double standards. Uh, somebody else uh, uh, wants to know what's happened to Anne Robinson's eyes. They look dreadful, but I bet it cost her a fortune. Well, yeah. Josie says, I mean, oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, the pictures are unrecognisable, aren't they? They, they? they really are. I was so I was so shocked when they went on there. And I, but she's not that old. She's not that old. Not as old as some people. You know, she, look, she looks OK. She's, uh, I mean, 10 years older than... Yeah, anyway. So, so she's 67, 70... She's 79. 76 years. Oh, right. Well, she looks terrible for 76. She sort of left herself as she was. That would be easier. Uh, Mark says uh, the government has changed the date to 19th of July. In the first week, they'll change it again. No idea what they're doing. Well, it's the theatres, isn't it, that they've screwed up. It's, uh, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I wasn't really planning on going to a discotheque or a nightclub anytime soon. I'm way too old. It's far too noisy. So we don't do things like that. But um, it's, 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 it's going to screw some people up. It's going to make it very, very difficult. Very, very difficult for people. But I did predict yesterday. I did say there was no way it was going to be sort of a couple of weeks. This, is, this was going to be a bit longer. I actually thought it would be an extra week on top of it. So uh, I've, I've, I went a little bit wrong, but only, only slightly. Only slightly. Uh, busy weekend, says Noreen. Says uh, it was a busy weekend. I was driving here, driving there, and then the next day then driving there and then back again. And I can't believe how old the godchildren are, although our two are 16 and 10. Nathan's looking to buy property. Wow. Yes. I mean, Charlotte is 25 now. Nathan, I think, is 22 or something. I mean, he used to be, you know, when, when he came to the show that we did at the Fairfield Halls in Croydon, he was a little lad. And we kept thinking, perhaps he's not going to grow. Perhaps he's not going to get tall. And then blow me down. He's six foot two. Six foot two. And as for Danielle, blimey, wouldn't recognise her at all. But uh, yes, I've got an appointment to the hospital today, Noreen. It's the eye thing today. So at one thirty this afternoon. So I shall I shall get up there and also wish Janice a very happy birthday from Patsy, me and the gang. So Janice, many happy returns of the day. So it's such a ridiculous time of the morning, but most people podcast this this programme. And very popular it is too, I have to tell you. So lovely to hear from uh, young Noreen. And uh, a lot of other people are now finding... Have you seen the Friends reunion? No. Jennifer Aniston and Courtney Cox look like their faces were going to split when laughing. Well, it's, it's like... Um, um, what's her face? The, uh, the Beckham woman who's, who's got a little clothing outlet. Uh, Vic. Vicky. Oh, Vicky. All right, Lev, what you got? You got got some old schmutter for us come on and she wears sunglasses all the time because she thinks that the sunlight she's quite right can ruin your eyes you know you've got to be very careful because the skin around your eye is very thin and so you just have to be careful but the trouble is that's why he you know, doesn't smile a lot dave just looks slightly peculiar but the friends people i mean i think david yeah i mean D david schwimmer looks okay and they said how old is he? 55? All of about 55. Yeah, Joey's put on a bit of weight and he's gone uh, gay. Grey. He's gone grey. And uh, the other one's looking a little bit older. You can always tell when they start gelling their hair up that it ain't working. But the girls look, I think they look great. Don't they? They really do. Jennifer Aniston doesn't see it. That is Jennifer Aniston, isn't it, in the middle? Yeah. Who's the one down, down the front? That's Courtney Cox, is it? And the other one's called Lisa Cudrow. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean, I think they look good. But the trouble is, in America, there is there is far more pressure on you to look good. You know, and when you see because they don't like the aging process. Have you seen pictures of Jane Fonda recently? Have a look at Jane, Jane Fonda. She looks amazing for her age. I mean, she I think she's in her 80s now, whether or not it's because of the uh, uh, the exercise and stuff like that. I mean, look. 
I mean, you know, to even keep your own hair is a bit of a miracle in this day and age. So she, look at her, how old is she, what do we say? How old is she? She's 83. I mean, look, look. I mean, inside, she's probably dead. But on the outside, she looks fantastic. You know, that, that's very much the American look, isn't it? The hair that you would, you would get done and all the rest of it. But it's, it's a classy look, like the, the Joan Collins pictures we had of her and Sandra. She just looks like she's stepped out of an Agatha Christie or something like that. I don't know whether she's had work. She's very small. She's very tiny. Very tiny. Uh, Dan says, hope everything goes OK this afternoon. Yeah, I'm sure it will, actually. It's, uh, it's going in there. What were they saying the other day? Oh, the, the new symptoms of COVID. I told my friend Rich... Um, they were saying is the sniffles, hello, and sneezing, hello. I've been sneezing and I've had the sniffles and everything else. And then I think, I mean, not, not official, this is what, it came out in a report, came out in a report. And then I thought, but what about all the people like me who, who suffer with hay fever, but only when it's particularly bad? I don't suffer the rest of the time, but when we were in Hyde Park the other day, I could see all the pollen and all the rest of it and it gets into your throat and it, it was really a, a bit bad not too bad not too bad yeah apparently you can feel like a bad cold for younger people i don't do you know i've not had a cold for ages i'm really quite lucky actually i'm, I'm normally that first sign of a cold i'm immediately onto my uh, on onto some tablets <laughs> i don't like to get colds it annoys me <laughs> That annoys me a lot. Shane says, good day to you and all the spikers. We don't, we don't know what Shane sounds like, but we know he's in Sydney so, and we know he's Australia. So uh, I think a lot of people talk like that, you know, like they've just sort of wandered out of uh, home and away. I've never been to Australia. People say to me, you know, do you ever want to go there? I went, no. Why would I want to go all that far? They're all over here anyway. I don't need to. I mean, what would I want to go to Australia for? The only thing I'd go for is to go and see Ayers Rock. I'd go and uh, meet some Aborigines. I'd buy some Aboriginal art. And I'd want to go to the Great Barrier Reef. I don't want to go to Bondi Beach. I've seen the people that go on it. Chav would be an understatement. Horrible place. Horrible place. And um, you do get the lifeguards running up and down in their little speedos, though. And uh, But there's loads of thefts that go on. Bondi Beach is notorious for people being mugged, having their bags. People walk across the beach. And that the lifeguards are there mainly to a rescue people who are a bit thick. And uh, and also to watch for people who are picking up people's bags and just walking off with them. And uh, that's that's a bit bad, isn't it? And uh, and that, what, what else would I go there for? I can eat food here. There's nothing, nothing in Australia that I, that I couldn't get. So it's, it's only really the Bondi Beach, uh, Great Barrier Reef. Australian food is the best you've ever had. Well, what do they have? Tastes nicer. Tastes nicer. Snob. And... Uh, <laughs> You see, there's nothing that interests me. Nothing that, that interests me in the slightest about going there. And also, the flight is like forever and a day. I could grow a beard on the flight. Sue says, Jane Fonda had a facelift and then had the audacity to advertise face cream. Yeah. Well, they all do, don't they? I mean, everybody does it. Uh, Dale went, went to Switzerland for his cosmetic surgery and he was very happy with it. And I think that's what it comes down to. I think it comes down to, listen, if you want to do that, that's your business. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. But when you look as, as bad as some people do, you feel duty bound to say, it doesn't look good. And the Anne Robinson doesn't look good. I mean, how much makeup they're going to have to put on her, I don't know. It's a very unfair. I mean, also, how many of those programmes on Countdown do they record a day? I think they do five a day. I think so. I think it's something like that. The trouble is with them, they have to keep it in in sequence don't they but uh, on, on a lot of on, on Dale shows they weren't in sequence at all they didn't have to do that right again five is it five in a day <laughs> it's embarrassing isn't it so I, mean, so I was thinking to myself the other day sometimes I remember that I'll be watching something on the telly like we all do and something will sit in my mind and and I'll think, oh, I'll regurgitate that at another time. They, so they do five episodes a day, but you have to change outfits. And they're all filmed three months in advance. At the beginning of every episode, the presenter gives an anecdote about a day, which is three months later. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, a lot of people do that, don't they? I, I knew a presenter on LBC years ago. He used to work overnight and he would record his... Uh, he would do two hours of the programme pre-recorded 
uh, the last two hours so he could leave early. But he did it in real time. He could give time checks. I mean, this show was recorded last Christmas. You think that it's the 15th of June. No, 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 no. This is now December the 16th. This is where we come to get away, to think, to feel, to breathe. Where we can be together or be alone. Just us, our thoughts and the trees. Standing tall, always there. Will you be there for them? Join the Woodland Trust for £4 a month to help protect and restore our woodland havens and create new ones too, for our well-being, for our wildlife. Join today at woodlandtrust.org.uk. 2019. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Enjoy the sunshine. You've got two days of it and uh, try and digest what Boris didn't give us yesterday. Uh, today you've got uh, 25 degrees, sunny intervals and a gentle breeze. I don't mind the gentle breeze. I can, I can cope with the gentle breeze. I've got the hanging baskets arriving today, so by the time we get to Thursday, we'll have drowned them. Uh, and that'll be quite nice. Tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, 28 degrees. And then Thursday, dan, 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 it's uh, thunder and lightning and a gentle breeze and 23 degrees. So it's going to be sort of a little bit muggy. And it's the yellow warning of thunderstorms so you should see them i think probably late wednesday through friday with that potential for travel disruption and flooding small chance homes and businesses could be flooded quickly doesn't seem possible does it really one minute blazing sunshine now there's a small chance homes and businesses could be flooded lightning strikes hail and strong winds there is a, a small chance that some communities become cut off by flooded roads it's very dramatic, isn't it? This. There's a slight chance that power cuts could occur and other services to some homes and businesses could be lost. Spray and sudden flooding could lead to difficult driving conditions and some road closures. And um, it, uh, there's, there's definitely going to be, you know, lightning strikes and that will lead to cancellations of trains and bus services. Lovely. It's like Armageddon, isn't it, really? You know, yes. Welcome to Happy Tuesday. Steve Allen brings you the best news in the entire universe. <laughs> That's lovely, Steve. So, so so, what do we have to do? Well, tie down the garden furniture to start with. Nothing worse than your umbrella floating about all over the place, is there? I always have to, whenever we have that and it, it gets a bit windy, I just take the umbrella down, not physically take it down, but I and tie it up so it doesn't, the wind doesn't get underneath it and rip it to pieces. Uh, Steve, I'm off to Royal Ascot today. I know it's lovely. Uh, the Queen will be enjoying that. Uh, it'll be very nice. I mean, last of the sort of the decent weather, there'll be some ghastly people there. Ascot seems to, it's limited to 4,000 guests rather than the, uh, the, the, the 10,000 they normally have. But hopefully it'll keep out the chavs. Oh, there's been some ghastly people trying to get into the Royal Enclosure wearing wholly inappropriate outfits. Really? I mean, any of these sort of race meetings, they seem to attract the worst type of people. So uh, the Queen, I mean, luckily they keep the Queen well away from them. It's going, hello, hello, hello. Wait. I wonder who's actually, oh, do you think Biden will be in the carriage with her? Oh, he's gone to Europe. Oh, I wonder who she's going to be in the carriage with. That'll be, a, that's always my, uh, not going to be Prince Andrew, is it? Because we'll be booing him. do not about booing at football, Prince Andrew. Boo, boo. I was watching the Emily Maitlis interview the other day and actually on, on second watchings it she did ask him some questions of which he didn't he didn't give any answers you know i don't i don't sweat i have this unusual yeah whatever <laughs> whatever dear so uh, say hello have a lovely vintage dress that i'm wearing well brian i'm very pleased for you i'm sure you'll have a lovely time and so we've got here we're not sure if she's going to attend every day she's missed the meeting only once in her 69 year reign that came last year when the whole event took place behind closed doors due to covid it seems so silly doesn't it having horse racing and there's nobody there so you have to get people there and um you've got uh the customary royal procession held before each day's race and will not take place this year oh well she'll just go there in a car and they'll take her up to the royal box she likes it though she loves it you know Mm. I don't, I'm not really interested in watching it because the BBC and uh, I think BBC and ITV, they have sort of a plethora of reporters who all had to dress up for it. They look ridiculous. You know, at least you get to see Claire Balding in a frock, which uh, which is quite nice. And uh, and all the other people there. And they've got loads of people I've never even heard of. Never even heard of. There's all sorts of 
uh, you know, they say, and now we're going down to the paddock. Well, I don't want to go to the paddock. Leave me where I am here. Thank you very much indeed. Steve, why did Harry complain about being cut off financially when they're meant to be making so much money? Uh, well, he was left millions by Diana and the Queen Mother. So it was a load of old codswallop. It was Harry being economical with the truth. But of course, nobody ever in Harry's existence has ever challenged him on anything. If you think about it, he's, he was very young when Diana was killed in the car crash. So people then treat him with kid gloves. But they were always like that with him. They always, you know, looked at him. He, he managed to persuade the Queen to do a few little bits and pieces where she became a little bit commercial, as it were. But nobody's ever told him off. So when somebody turns around to him and goes, do you remember the, I mean, the classic example of how far removed they are from public life is Prince Edward did the It's a Royal Knockout. And so you had Sarah Ferguson and all the, Diana and all the other members of the royal family taking part in It's a Royal Knockout. And then uh, Prince Edward did an, a, a press interview thing. And the press, of course, very, very jaded and he said, so what did you think of it? And they went, uh, yeah, whatever. They did. They couldn't care less, really. And he said, and he went, oh, thanks. And he had a bit of a bit of a tantrum. Oh, thanks very much. And you think, well, you know, that's how they are. And Harry's exactly the same. Little tantrum boy. You know, the, the press are taking a picture of you and you're, you're drunk coming out of a club. So he kicks out at them. And you think you need to grow up, mate. You need to grow up. We didn't vote for you. We didn't put you in there. You earn our respect. That's why the Queen gets the respect from people. That's why, you know, Charles, I mean, he went through his mad phase of talking to plants and flowers and everything else. But uh, It's a Royal Knockout was, uh, it was staged, I think, at uh, Alton Towers. And uh, although regarded as a failure... A similar show without royal involvement was made the following year at Walt Disney World and they had loads of uh, celebs there. But taking part, Prince Edward's team, Toya Wilcox, Barry McGuigan, Christopher Reeve, Steve Cram. Do you remember that? Uh, Tessa Sanderson, Sarah Hardcastle. Who's Sarah Hardcastle? I know she is. Who is she? Oh, she's a competitive swimmer. Uh, John Cleese, Nicholas Lindhurst, Dame Kieran Nikanawa. Duncan Goodhue and Sharon McPeak. Who's she? Who's Sharon McPeak? She is uh, a former high jumper from Northern Ireland. Lovely. Uh, team two, the Princess Royals team on behalf of Save the Children. Debbie Flintoff, Cliff Richard, Emlyn Hughes, Jenny Agata, Kelv Kevin Klein, Jackie Stewart, Eddie Grant, Peter Blake, Walter Payton, Virginia Leng, Sunil... Gavaskar, Sunil, Anthony Andrews, Tom Jones and Sheena Easton. Team three, the Duke of York's uh, team, Duchess of York's team, uh, Meatloaf, Tamara McKinney, Pamela Stevenson, Mel Smith, Jane Seymour, Chris DeBurn, Viv Richards, Gail Green, uh, uh, Michael Brandon, Ben Cross and Steve Corvin. Apparently the show was conceived and organised by Prince Edward, very keen to develop a career in TV and theatre after he left the Marines. And it featured Prince Edward, the Princess Royal, and uh, the Duke and Duchess of York as non-participating team captains. The show was hosted by Stuart Hall, Les Dawson and Sue Pollard. <laughs> you can imagine, can't you? Uh, Paul Daniels and Jeff Capes were timekeepers. Alid Jones... Rowan Atkinson and Barbara Windsor were heralds of the tournament. There's a large lineup, a cast of millions. Uh, the Duke of Abercorn, the Duke of Westminster, Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Roxburgh acted as impartial judges for each of the four teams. <laughs> I, mean, is there, I might as well have mentioned everybody in the entire world took part in it. But Edward was, had, had a bit of a tantrum because they weren't used to somebody going, actually, it was rubbish. We weren't really interested in it at all, but people, people watched it. And so Harry has never had anybody who's ever told him off. You know, you, you don't like to upset him. It's like, you know, Charles telling a joke at a banquet and people just sitting there going, well, that wasn't very funny, was it? But of course, everybody laughs. So he then thinks he's funny. Harry obviously thought that the public absolutely adored him. And of course, they did until he started behaving like a complete and utter dipstick. You know, because he thinks he can do anything. And so this time he's lost the favour of the public. The public don't like him. Bit of a shame, really. But uh, Prince Edward snapped at the journalist and he walked out of this, this press conference. I mean, a real, a real tantrum, a real tantrum. So, you know, which, you know, I quite like. I can only, I, I only, uh, I only hope you've enjoyed yourselves, so he remarked to journalists. Uh, a few murmurs in response brought the retort from the prince. He said, well, thanks for sounding so bloody enthusiastic. 
I mean, honestly, you could actually call it a royal tantrum. You know, I put a lot of effort into this and you don't like it. And the journalists were just going, well, isn't it's not for us. It's for it's for the people. If the people liked it, the people liked it. But I mean, grow up for And he sat there in his little outfit and we all looked at him and went, you look like a complete so and so. <laughs> Shane says, Steve, the UK temperature sounds good. Bloody cold over here. Yes. Well, that's the way it goes. I wonder what. Sorry. It's winter in Australia. I know it doesn't seem possible, does it, that you can have winter in Australia? It really doesn't. I don't know why I say that. Just feeling feeling very sort of, you know. Hmm. Uh, also, uh, I don't think uh, they need left money. They collect a lot from renting houses and land. Who are you talking about, Mike? What, the royal family full stop? Or, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, there's so many dud members of the royal family that we don't need. We don't need Prince Andrew. We don't need Sarah Ferguson, thank the Lord. I bet she's very, very grateful that Prince Philip's not there to ruin Christmas for her because she was never allowed in the house with everybody else. She had to sit in a little place on the on the edge of Sandra. Yeah, he hated her, hated her, in keeping with the rest of the country, of course. And um, and so and you don't need their two ghastly children. You can keep them. Uh, we don't effectively need Edward and Sophie, lovely though she is, and their their two kids. I think we just need the Queen and Harry. Uh, not not Harry. I think we need William and um, and Charles, and that's about it. I don't think we need anybody else, do we? You think? I mean, there's a few other sort of nice ones, but you know, basically, you know, they are a, a family. Of, I mean, I don't think we think we need Princess Anne, even though she's very hard working. I just wish she'd change her hairstyle. That blooming rice pudding she's got stuck on her head looks ridiculous. Like a cottage loaf, isn't it? Really. Um, Steve, Steve, Steve. Wonder what horses make of Ascot. Well, they, they've got no idea. They, they just they just go there and they race, don't they? Uh, Steve, uh, Royal Ascot, 12,000 people get it right. Well, sadly, not this year. 4,000. It's going to look very, very empty per, per day. 4,000 per day. Uh, I saw a film, uh, says Roger. Good for you. <laughs> best film about... Oh, no, somebody else talked about the best film about Liberace. But, uh, and somebody else saying that they're very pleased with my uh, Australian accent. Uh, what else we got here? Working out or quitting smoking as a young adult. The best ways to avoid heart attacks. Oh, do you know what you haven't done? You know what you haven't done? Yeah. I knew you'd remember. I knew you'd remember. We'll, we'll do it in a, in a minute. We, we, the, the poem of the day. That's coming up. There's a monstrous load of ghoulish goodies for one pound and under at Asda this Halloween. Our medium pumpkins are an unearthly one pound. Our toffee apples are freakish 75p each. Our Halloween bunting, a spellbinding one pound. Get into the spooky spirit. That's Halloween done fright. Asda, that's more like it. Selected Asda stores and nine, subject to availability. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody telling you in the paper today the uh, the coolest ways to beat the heat wave. I mean, here we are in the year 2020, for goodness sake, 2021. I mean, you think by now people know that, you know, it's ice creams and drinks and all the rest of it. Here they are, the perfect 10 on the dating show where the aim is not to get steamy. It's a bunch of um, a bunch of people. And here they are. This is too hot to handle. Oh, it, it, it isn't. It, it's, it's too hot to handle. It's a, it's a dating show. I didn't know that's what it was called. Apparently, unlike its rival, Love Island, the contestants on the Netflix show only win the cash prize if they manage to resist getting it on with somebody. So you've got Peter. Peter's from New York. He's a personal trainer. He's 21. He gets 200 messages a day from admirers. It isn't all vanity, though. His mum is his number one woman in his life. Uh, Larissa. It's a lawyer from New Zealand, Larissa Trounson, and she really looks as though she's passed her sell-by. She said she isn't a one-man kind of girl, which is why when she's not immersed in the legal world, she's out partying. Wow. Telling the catchphrase on her Instagram pages, you can be intellectual and wear a bikini too. I'm going to face on that one, honestly. Very miserable. Very miserable. Nathan is a former uh, stripper former stripper. He moved to Texas for a job as a Magic Mike-style erotic dancer. He's 27. Uh, Chase. I love all these names. Carly. Carly is a model from Canada. They've obviously lowered their standards over there re recently. And Kayla is a surfer and also a model. 
Uh, she loves checking out men, partic- particularly bad boys, and claims she's never been rejected by the opposite uh, sex. Lovely. And there's a model from England here called Emily, Emily Faye Miller. I mean, judging by the photograph of her, I don't think she's going to be a fashion model, put it that way. And uh, she's the life and soul, she wrote on Instagram, a little party never killed nobody. It's anybody, dear. I'm just trying to correct your English. You're obviously a bit thick. And uh, but as I say, we don't really know what she does. So can we look up her, her name? So it's Emily Faye Miller, F-A-Y-E, Emily Faye Miller. And uh, oh, she, does she not feature on the Internet? Oh, she's not at all well known then. I mean, she's fairly ancient at 27, but um, it's nothing at all on the Internet. Emily Faye Miller, E-M-I-L-Y, Faye Miller, Mill, M-I-double. L E R, nothing at all. My God, she really is a nobody. But here she is. She has no interest in commitment and says she always gets what she wants. Yeah, unfortunately, darling, you don't even feature on the internet. I mean, blimey, even I feature on the internet. And uh, Emily Faye Middle M- Miller, twenty-seven, model, England. Obviously not, dear. Perhaps it's what they they've given you that that name because I can't think of anything else to call you. But you don't feature on anything at all. Bit embarrassing, isn't it, really? So, you know, a, a real nobody. A real nobody. I've got a poem for you. Little poem. At 20 past the, uh, the hour. It's by Max Hill. It's called When Someone's Late. Someone is late. And so I wait. A minute, two or ten. To me the cost is good times lost that never comes again. He doesn't care how I shall fare or what my loss shall be. His tardiness is selfishness and basically rude to me. My boys be spry, the moments fly, meet every date you make. Be whether fair or foul, be there in time your place to take. And girls take heed and work with speed, each task on time begin. On time begun and work well done, the highest praise will win. There we go. Short and sweet this morning. Hope you enjoyed that. Always a little bit of an intellectual moment on the uh, programme. It's a bit like sort of university challenge, this this programme, without the university or the or the challenge. So basically it sort of comes down to something like that. Did you see the horrible family that left their dogs in a car on Brighton Beach? Oh, you always get stupid people. The police had to smash into, uh, into the thing and then the family came rushing back to confront them. What was even more horrid, they were in a cafe being filmed stealing the tip money on the counter. Oh dear. It's not nice, is it? Don't like things like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But also people who leave, you know, dogs in cars and things like that with the windows done up, they are, they are limited intelligence people. Uh, Steve, love your humour on the world every morning, says, uh, says Philip. Uh, similar tantrum to Piers Morgan then? No, because they've uh, they've asked Piers Morgan to go back. They're, they're, they're hemorrhaging audience on Good Morning Britain like there's no tomorrow. And yet, it, it's, you know, you, I mean, you do need certain people. So Piers just went, no, nah, sod it, I'm not going to apologise, I'm not going to do anything at all. So that's why, he, uh, well, that's why he, he, he walked out. I mean, you know, you either agreed with him or you didn't agree with him. It doesn't make any difference. He's, he's not going to lose sleep over that. But they, uh, they were sort of, I think actually, his final week on Good Morning Britain, they hit 1.8 million people. He leaves, they lose 1.2 million. So Wednesday's show had a peak of 660,000, average just 440,000. And then they went, I mean, sort of up. He, he admitted he's sad the breakfast show ratings have plummeted. But I um, mean, there is a chance because they've had all sorts of people doing it. They did a big plug the other day for Richard Maidley, you know, with Richard, you know, showing us his funny side and this and that. And I thought, I hope to God they're not going to give it to him. But it, it was almost like they were sort of going, and don't forget, this week you've got Richard Maidley. And and I thought, well, there's a switch off immediately because he's not heavyweight. He really is. He's sort of he he's sort of light end, and he and he's still on. He's he's, he's on this week. Oh, I wonder if they're going to give it to him. To wait and find out. Uh, Ahmed said, "I'm I'm looking forward to retirement. Only 21 years to go." A friend of mine's just retired. Just retired. And uh, another one here says, "You never did tell us who Jodie Marsh was with." Oh, it was Kenzie. 
A young boy in a boy band. Strange match. Yes, I mean, it was very... I think it was all a bit new for him. I don't think he may, never met anybody. He was in that little little popsicle group called Blazing Squad. Remember them? Meet you at the crossroads, crossroads. And they all walked across the stage and as if they were sort of on a zebra crossing or something. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I thought they were a bit naff. They, they were a little bit like E17, but uh, they didn't have the talent, which was a shame. But it was Blazing Squad. And I don't think they exist anymore. Well, I don't think they do. Kenzie then sort of joined a gym. I think he's got his own gym now. And, uh, and he just turned into basically sort of a gay man's dream, which is uh, they disbanded in 2009. Very sad. I think just a, a small moment of silence to acknowledge the fact that uh, Blazing Squad are no more. And Kenzie, as I say, is in the gym. I mean, he, he, he sort of went, he, he basically had a body that looked like a xylophone. It was all muscle and everything. He obviously became obsessed with it. And I was looking at a picture. I don't know if he's still got the same body because I'm, I'm always led to believe with, with bodybuilders, if you do sort of stop doing it, all of a sudden, pfft, turns to flabs. You've got to be a very uh, I'm a classic example of... Uh, but he, he's, still, he's still got it. He was a little boy and that's what he looks like now. Looks like he's been dipped, doesn't it? But when you look at what he looked like... When he was on, you know, te- there he is with his girlfriend, Jodie. But they, but they put him down as a rapper. So, uh, Bla- Blazing Squad were a 10-piece. He's a personal trainer of Studio 23. He stars in the Active Channel Star Trainer. He appeared on ITV's Celebrity Juice programme alongside Keith Lemon and Vern Troyer. Who's dead now, isn't he, Vern Troyer? He died. That was a little bloke. Little broke. Yeah. Little mini me, I think, but uh, can't bear celebrity juice. Can't bear it. But uh, in, he was injured in a car accident. Dated model. Model? Jody Marsh, I ask you. And he's been with his current girlfriend since 2012. He's got two daughters, Winter and Willow. Willow spelt W Y L O W. Hello, Chav Alert, Chav Alert. And the other one, Winter, spelt W Y N T E R. I ask you. <laughs> you sometimes lose the will to live, don't you? Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, also, and da, 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 so I'm trying to fall asleep listening to you. That's a bit stupid, Maria, isn't it? That's a bit daft. Why would you try and fall asleep listening to somebody? Why don't you just turn the radio off? Goodness sake, honestly. And um, so Jody, a lot of people came up with sort of Jody Marsh and, uh, and wondered whatever happened to her. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? She had her little sort of moment where... I'll tell you what she did. She turned up on one of the Big Brothers, the celebrity Big Brother, and didn't somebody make her cry on the programme? I seem, I've got this story in my mind that somebody was on there, and I think it was the bloke who did the You Spin Me Right Round, Baby Right Round, Pete Burns, who died, didn't he? And I think he said something to her, and she burst into tears on the programme, which, of course, actually is a gift... To a reality show, if you make somebody cry, laughing's OK, but, you know, crying is even better. They love stuff like that. And I think Pete Burns said something to her. She went, oh, my grandfather's just died or something. There was something about it. I can't remember what it was. And so we had the complete, the complete meltdown on television. And it was Pete Burns, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought so. He was very odd. He was very odd. I can't remember. He, he died years ago now. I, I keep forgetting all these people who've, who've died. And I remember sort of thinking, Pete Burns, he wasn't that old. You know, he, he, same, same big brother as Rula Lenska and, of course, George Galloway. That was the pussycat thing, wasn't it? Which George and Barrymore was on it. Blimey, that was a good one, wasn't it? When you think back on it, they, they were very good. But when you think a lot of people on Big Brother have passed on now. So I just have a quick slurp of my tea there, which is getting a bit excited, being it's a, a Tuesday. So tomorrow it's going to be a little bit hotter than today. Not that you'll notice any difference, but uh, it'll be your last opportunity today to go to the beach or to go for a day out. And tomorrow to go for a day out because on Thursday, well, in fact, in the night. So I think when I come in here on Thursday morning, I think the rain will have started by that time already. So uh, you have been warned. OK, just make sure that uh, you've got everything anchored down that needs to be anchored down. Steve, these Love Island types should just be honest to begin listing their occupation as, yes. Well, no, Lara, they they like the term model because model covers everything. 
you know, model covers everything, but you only have to look at them to realise they're not really models. They're not really models. They're sort of people who take their, their clothes off. That, that's not actually modelling. That's called you're not good enough to be a fashion model. OK, that means you really are a bit of a disaster. But some photographers go on, listen, getting your boobs out is quite normal. And they go, is it? You know, and then so they go like that. But I mean, we couldn't even find this woman. And she's supposed to be an English model at 27. We couldn't even find her on the Internet. And normally they put any old has been on the Internet. And she's not even on there. That's an embarrassment, isn't it, really? What do you do, love, a model? Well, have you done anything? No. <laughs> but I thought I'd be a model. You know. I always have to laugh at them because it does it does cover everything. Uh, Steve says, so Stella, I met Russell Brand a few years ago. Got chatting. I'm surprised that he's very quiet, different to his TV persona. Can't stand him. Can't stand him. I never liked Russell Brand ever since he uh, he together with Jonathan Ross did that dirty, filthy phone call uh, to what's it's Andrew Sachs's. Uh, what was she related to Andrew Sack? Granddaughter. And I thought, no, tacky. Very tacky. Uh, Richard Madeley, apparently, is a real Alan Partridge. Yes, I mean, the trouble is, when Richard sort of holds his pencil and tries to look very serious, it just looks comical. It just doesn't look real. He's going, but when we... And I thought, no, you can't do this, Richard. You're light ent, love. You know, you're, 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 the, you're the one with sort of, you know, Judy Finnegan, you know, on your little programme. She loved Fridays. She loved Fridays. Fridays was her favourite day of the week. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, apparently. Uh, Steve, Nick Abbott is the real Alan Partridge. Nick Abbott, he won't like that. That's not very nice, is it? He's, uh, he's a marvellous person. One of my closest friends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, guess who's back together? Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. Uh, they, they were together, they were engaged in 2002, then they split up in 2004, and uh, they were in a restaurant and she's all lovey-dovey, so it's Benefer. Benefer. And they were helping to celebrate the 50th birthday of J-Lo's sister, but appeared to spend most of the time gazing at each other or kissing. Ugh, kissy-kissy stuff. How unnecessary. Who wants to see that? I mean, she looks a bit, you know, and she's one of these people who closes her eyes when they kiss. Well, how do you know you're kissing the right person? The whole idea is you look at, you keep your eyes wide open. Generally freaks them out completely. She is the same age as Jacob Rees-Mogg. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the point of that one is what? <laughs> An insider has been quoted as saying 75-year-old Guadalupe is happy. Ben is back. Who on earth is Guadalupe? But anyway, Ben is back in Jennifer's life. So they've rekindled their relationship. Lovely. They were in, they were in Malibu. Oh, J-Lo's mum is called Guadalupe. Funny name. Guadalupe. <laughs> That's your mother's name. What happened to Mary or things like that? <laughs> Guadalupe. Uh, a wedding without dancing because of the coronavirus. Not for us. Cat uh, Ridley's wedding. Date set for June 26th says, uh, I'm angry and everyone in our position will feel the same way. Kate Bell, due to get married in August, says, I could do an, ex an exercise class but not dance at a wedding. I mean, well, sit down and relax. Take the weight off your feet. You'd have been standing up long enough in shoes that, you know, that really hurt. So, uh, you know, not sure about that. Holiday insurance probably won't cover full COVID. But uh, couples who reacted to news about the 30 guest limit on weddings will be lifted. But social distancing measures will remain in place. Because, you know, my brother's youngest is a wedding photographer. She's got, uh, in August alone, she's got 19 weddings to photograph. I mean, she's going to be so tired at the end of it. Luckily, it's, she's got a team of people that do all the printing of the photographs and everything else like that. So the limit on the number of people will be scrapped from the 21st of June. So that's about a week's time. But rules on singing... What is this singing malarkey? Rules on singing and dancing will remain, the government have said. So there you go. So you can't sing. Other restrictions being eased before the new Freedom Day on the 19th of July. We'll see at least 40,000 football fans allowed inside Wembley to watch the Euro 2020 semi-finals. But don't sing. You won't be allowed to sing. OK, so I don't know what they sing. At. Yes, I mean, I don't know how they're going to manage that at all. Oh, football's coming. No, you can't do it. And of course, it will sound quite, quite loud, won't it? I think couples have voiced their fears 
on the weddings that uh, the wedding plans would be ruined if the 30 person limit was not removed because it's trying to work out who can go to the wedding who can go to the reception you don't want you don't want little children at the wedding do you because they, they they scream halfway through the service and if you're filming it which most people do you know it's not very good at all is it uh so here we've got uh this is who is that this is uh ashley behan I don't know who any of these footballers are. I really don't. I don't know who these people are. The Leeds deal, prospect, and um, all the mothers are vastly overweight. I've noticed of all these football. The footballers are terribly fit, but the mums are all sort of quite hefty. And uh, and they've got the you know the humble hero is an inspiration. Pfft. Not as far as what happens if you don't like football? Why would somebody have to be a an inspiration? Did you see that picture of they they caught them at a, a football club? And some vandals had broken in and they destroyed a defibrillator. Can you believe after, you know, we'd had that player who collapsed on the pitch. Anyway, they've got the person. It's a 17-year-old. Yeah, Chris, Christian Eriksson. But as somebody said, they were literally, you were watching somebody dying in front of your eyes. But these boys had broken into this other football club and smashed up the defibrillator. Luckily, the CCTV, which captures all of it. So they've got a 17-year-old boy. At Buxted FC. Um, 1.4 million people have viewed this. Somebody said it was disgusting. I absolutely agree. Hopefully they'll be named very shortly. Isn't that awful that somebody would actually... They caught them vandalising the defibrillator. So if somebody had a heart attack at Buxted FC in East Sussex, they couldn't use the defibrillator. Um, all things to do. People like that are filth. Absolute filth. Anyway, South East Coast Ambulance Service have loaned a defibrillator to the club for as long as it's needed. Well, good for them. Good for them. That's very nice. So they've loaned the club a, a defib for as long as, it, you know, something like that. You never know when you're going to need it. You never know. Actor Martin Kemp retweeted Buxted Football Club's CCTV footage and described what happens as the pits. And uh, he says, I really get upset, angry or surprised by people's behaviour. But this is the pits. I hope they'll be disgusted with themselves. Shouldn't think so. Be more worried about being caught because they probably didn't realise that the CCTV that's in there is night vision. We have CCTV night vision at home and it makes things turn into daytime. And it's uh, very good. You have to watch, you know, if people sort of start, you know, vandalising things. But especially something, something like that. Something like a defibrillator, which could save somebody's life at the last... Dreadful. Dreadful. Uh, what else we got? Uh, statins can more than double the risk of dementia. I never know whether you're going to get the onset. I don't know what sort of dementia, how it starts, and whether you can avoid it by doing various things. But they've said here, scans of patients taking the cholesterol-reducing drugs showed a high significant decline in metabolism in the area of the brain that is first affected by Alzheimer's disease. I mean, I thought we were relying on these tablets, aren't we? That they're, they're trialling in America, and apparently they've been successful for specifically Alzheimer's, which, uh, which I think is fantastic. Uh, Monica says, I'm busy making breakfast scones, bacon, shallot and cheese. Oh, bacon, shallot and cheese. Oh, you like that sound of that one, do you? Oh, right, yeah. Not, no, not the shallot. I didn't think shallots either. But uh, b b bacon and cheese, I think, goes very well together. <laughs> But, or actually, I'll tell you what goes well together. Cheese and Marmite go very well together. I've had a few of those paninis, which they do. They're actually very nice. They, they pop them in this little machine that they've got, which sort of basically sort of crisps them up and melts the, melts the cheese, takes the roof of your mouth off. Uh, fingerprints spotted on Neolithic clay belonged to two young male potters 5,000 years ago. Canada's University of Manitoba says the ridges of the prints and their location gave an unparalleled glimpse into life at this complex where they found them and handcrafting techniques. A lovely fact. Fancy being able to see that you can do things like that. Very interesting. Uh, Kath, no. And, uh, and then Taylor said, here we go, you're about three days out on this one, who says, did you hear Nick Abbott on Friday choking live on air with the biscuits you left in the studio? I didn't leave any biscuits in the studio. He tells fibs. What can I tell you? But we did that a few, few, few days ago. I'm sorry you're late to the party, but uh, you need to keep up. It's no good just sort of popping in and out on the programme. You've got to be with it all the time. Uh, strawberries have plummeted. No, I've not noticed strawberries plummeted. Although uh, Paul Cooper was doing two punnets for three quid, I think, yesterday. 
for British strawberries because soaring temperatures and blazing sun have created bumper crops snapped up by the supermarkets. You can get a kilo for three quid compared with two pounds for a punnet. A kilo for three quid. Got to eat them fairly quickly, haven't you? There's an abundance of strawberries despite the damp May. Big, sweet and full of vitamins. So that's good. So if you want cheap strawberries, that's the place to, uh, to go and get them. Supermarkets have got them and you'll find the, uh, the grocers will have them because they'll be at markets. So that's very nice. Uh, also, other stories here. Nicole Scherzinger. Lots of pictures of Nicole Scherzinger standing on beaches, not wearing very much. Uh, Catherine Ryan's given birth to a, a baby, as opposed to a fridge freezer, I suppose. Uh, Kevin Bacon is welcoming two new kids into the family. Um, these are kids as in goats. We used to live next door in, in Brentwood. The house next door to us in Westcott Road had a goat and it used to uh, just eat the grass and things like that. And, there, and we used to sort of look over the fence and go, hello, to this goat. And uh, it was a bit of a novelty in those days. And former Strictly Come Dancing contestant, the Reverend Richard Cole, says he wears his late partner's cologne to stop his memory of him fading. Oh, dear. The ex communard star told of his loneliness since the Reverend David Coles died in 2019 after a struggle with alcohol. Richard, who lived with David at their vicarage in North Hants, told The Big Issue, I've got a new dread of him fading. So at nights I put on a dab of his cologne. I have the dogs in bed with me. One of them sort of sounds, a, sounds a bit like him. Uh, there's that under there. I keep discovering things under this desk. I found, I found something the other day. There was half of a cup sitting under the... I know, I know half a cup, I ask you. But he says, so I put the dab of the cologne on. The dogs are in bed. And he says, telling of his life with an alcoholic, he said so much of it is to do with fear and shame and people aren't at their best in the grip of fear and shame. I had a producer who was an alcoholic. He couldn't function without the alcohol. It isn't just a case of he liked to drink. He, he couldn't do a programme without the drink. So he, he would come in on a Friday. We were setting up for the, for the weekend. And he'd go, hi. And I'd go, hi. And he'd go off to the pub for a few hours. And... Um, and, and that was it. I didn't, uh, he didn't try and hide it, no. The, the worst thing was, it was easier in the end, because as anybody will tell you who's, who's ever lived with an alcoholic or worked with an alcoholic, it was easier to go for a drink with him than sort of sit there waiting for him to come. Because you never knew when he was coming back. We didn't have mobile phones in those days. You couldn't phone somebody up. So people used to have to phone the pub and go, is so-and-so there? They go, yeah, so-and-so, yeah, and give them the phone. I mean, it's amazing how times have changed very, very quickly. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Nice to have your company. It's uh, 10 to 6, Steve Allen's early breakfast. Uh, Jim Encumbria says, a week into my retirement and loving it, drinking a cuppa in bed and deciding what to do today. That's the thing, isn't it? When you retire, somebody said to me, you've got to make sure that you've got enough things to occupy your time. And uh, some people say, oh, it just means I can stay in bed and I can sleep long. You think, no, no, no. The whole idea is to try and cram loads of things in. And I have known people who've retired and they've said, I'm busier now I've retired uh, than when I was working. So it's finding something to do. It's like joining different organisations, Jim. You know, Am Dram and stuff like that, or the Bowls Club or something. But uh, there's all sorts of things that you can do, or you can sort of catalogue your DVD collection, or you can decorate, or you can, do, you can do all sorts of things. But it's keeping yourself busy, because tempting though it might be to stay in bed all day, uh, that's not the best way to go. So I, I love the idea that you're sort of just a week into your retirement and loving it. <laughs> it's like being, well, put it this way, it's a bit like being on holiday. You know, when I, when I spoke to this friend of mine and she's, she's retired and uh, she told me how big her pension pot was and I thought, wow, that was quite a good pension because you, there's a certain amount you need, uh, you know, before you can retire. So uh, I'm just sort of waiting to find out how much that is supposed to be. Uh, there's, this is an odd story. Uh, I don't know if you've been to supermarkets and had a look at birthday cakes, but they do some really good birthday cakes now. Uh, Mass-produced. Very nice indeed. And Tesco have come under fire for one particular birthday cake. Uh, this is a dog breed. It's uh, plagued by ill health, but it's the character for a party cake. Uh, this is an £11 Frankie the French Bulldog cake. Features a breed popular with stars, including the Beckhams and Lady Gaga. But Frenchies are known to suffer from uh, breathing 
eye and skin problems. The British Veterinary Association has been lobbying firms to stop using flat-faced breeds for adverts. Jemima Harrison uh, says use of flat-faced animals says it may seem like it's arguing over a cake, but many French bulldogs are suffering. Tesco said its Frankie cake production would not be axed, although it was open to feedback. So vets are blasted. It's a, it's a cake that just looks like a dog's face. And um, it's, it's just a party cake. I don't quite get it, actually. I mean, I, I, mean, I understand that, that you know, dog breeds are prone to all sorts of little bits and pieces. But, you know, to the kiddies who are going to be eating this, it's just a dog. OK, it might look like their dog, might not look like their dog. But that, that, that's what it is nowadays. Vets start complaining about the shape of cakes. I suppose we'll have people complaining about caterpillar cakes or something like those squirrel cakes. Because squirrels, you know, sort of get, especially at this time of year, they get run over quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, Tim Peake is in the paper today, the astronaut. He believes the universe has no meaning without conscious life in it. He's 49. He said in the absence of any known living beings out there makes England special. Speaking on this podcast, he said without conscious life that can self-reflect, it makes universe meaningless. You see, already I'm, I'm confused by the whole thing. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I do like a rare Henry VIII medal has sold for £246,000, which is four times its estimate. The Gold Supremacy Medal, one of only five known to exist, sparked a bidding war at auction. It's the only one not in a museum collection. The artefact from the year 1545 commemorates Henry VIII becoming head of the Anglican Church and turning away from Rome. The auctioneers are in Switzerland. They said it's the kind of medal that only appears on the market once in a lifetime. And it's got a hole in it and it's, the edges are not sort of straight. But the vendor will donate the proceeds towards the reconstruction of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Isn't that fantastic? People do the nicest things nowadays. Uh, they think it's the first English commemorative medal ever produced. So it comes with, uh, with that and the fact that it was probably touched by Henry VIII as well. What a lovely thing to have. Uh, other, what did I do with that? Oh, sorry, just lost something, actually. I thought there was a colour supplement that came with one of the papers for this morning, and I suddenly realised there was no colour supplement. They're all looking forward to Anne Robinson uh, arriving at Countdown. In fact, actually, they must have started filming. I think they might have even started filming already. But if you look at the pictures of her on the, uh, on the internet, uh, she'll bear no resemblance to the Anne Robinson. You are the wicked slink. Goodbye. You know which apparently took ages to record, ages to record. Lots of people having fun in the sun yesterday, people with ice creams, people with... It's amazing how, how quickly drinks warm up. Very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Uh, also, the Maddie prime suspect. This is the prime suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. This is a convicted paedophile called Christian Bruckner. And he's issued a typed press release denouncing the investigation of him as an unbelievable scandal. I said at the time, they kept naming this bloke who's in prison at the moment. He's currently serving a seven year prison term for rape. And uh, he said the prosecutors investigating him should resign for persecuting an innocent person. You know, he's he said, I mean, I don't know how likely it is that, you know, if he was guilty, well, then, you know, he'd have talked about being guilty. But he said it's nothing to do with him. But of course, he's basically been libeled by just about everybody, you know, and um, it, it's he, he's, you know, he has been, you know, convicted of abusing girls before. But he said Madeleine McCann, nothing to do with him, which is sort of it, it kind of means that we're back to square one with the Madeleine McCann case because we're no nearer finding out where she went to than, you know, than anything else. I mean, she just vanished off the face of the earth. But somebody must have seen her 14 years ago now, 14 years ago. I mean, she's going to look, if she's alive, completely different. I still think she came out of the apartment and uh, I think she wandered into the road and I think she got hit. I'm, I mean, where else? Nobody saw anything at all. It was almost like the, the you know, it's I think she was hit by a lorry or a car and they picked her up. And sort of so she otherwise, you know, you'd have somebody saying a child was knocked down in the road. This was the, the lorry. that we saw. That's what I think happened. But there again, you know, my my guess is as good as any of the police have come up with. And they've tried everything so far. They've managed to get through 12 million pounds. And we're nowhere near. They've taken dogs over, special equipment. They've looked in drains. They've looked just about everywhere. But 14 years ago, 14 years ago, 
So here it is. It's the, the Tory Civil War. And uh, they've done a, a list in the papers of everything. Nightclubs. Uh, the reopening of nightclubs put back till July the 19th. In the unlikely event of the Indian variant, which is now called the, the Delta event. Because everybody has to say, of course, it's now called Delta, but it was the Indian... The, so it goes on. And not proving as virulent, virulent as it appears... It could be brought forward to July the 5th. Freedom rating 0 out of 10. Uh, pubs and uh, restaurants. So actually, we were hoping on June the 1st, 21st, that everything would open normal. That means pubs and restaurants would be able to open normally. Customers would be able to wait at the bar. Huh. Long forgotten pleasure that. People like waiting at the bar. So that's been, that's been scrapped. You'll have to abide by the rule of six indoors. No groups of more than six people or two households able to gather outside. Theatres, you know, I mean, this is just, you know, I mean, theatres, 50% capacity. Well, you can't survive on productions with 50% capacity. We were hoping that, uh, that it would change and the theatres would be open as normal. But uh, whilst, you know, there is still the danger existing out there, uh, they've said no. So that's not very good, is it, really? I mean, you can't, you can't have half-empty theatres because they don't, they're not going to make any money on them at all. Uh, social distancing, care homes, holidays. The roadmap said international travel will return on May the 17th as part of step three. Well, it hasn't worked out like that at all. As ministers are still saying, quarantine-free travel is allowed to a limited list of countries only. Yesterday's announcement has done nothing to change that. So freedom rating, zero. So christenings uh, and wakes... We had been hoping that the limits would be lifted on wakes and christenings, both of which are limited to 30 guests. Funerals are already allowed to have more than 30 mourners because that would just that's the ultimate cruel factor, isn't it? So you can't say farewell to somebody. But the limits have been lifted for wakes with the same social distancing rules uh, that have been announced for weddings. But christenings will stay with a limit of 30. I mean, to be honest with you, you never really get any more than 30 at a christening anyway. We're, we're, what are you doing? We're having a christening. Oh, OK. What does that mean? That means that the kiddie will be sort of held in somebody's arms. The vicar will sort of open up the lid off the font, do a bit of dabbing. The kid will scream the place down and you'll go back for tea and sandwiches. That's about it. <laughs> I quite like the idea. Only 30 people for that. But as I say, anybody else, you know, thinks they're really exciting things. Yeah. I mean, some people are not christened nowadays. People don't seem to bother with stuff like that. I think I, w I was christened. I think, actually. See, why were girl dancers some years ago referred to as go-go dancers? Because they go 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 That was I don't know why they were called that. I've got no idea. That's the sort of thing you need to ask James O'Brien on his, uh, his programme where he answers all those mystery hour questions. So, go-go dancers. I used to work with go-go dancers, you know, years and years ago. <laughs> what a night that was. And, uh, and they, they danced in their sequin bikinis under flashing lights and everything else, and they were go-go dancers. I don't know why they were... I'm, to be honest with you, a go-go was a dance because there was a song called Go Into A Go-Go, which I think was by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. I'm never wrong. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Did you know I was, I was practically right on the go-go dancing? There was um, a club in Juan Le Pan, which we spoke about the other day down the road from Cannes, called the Whiskey A Go-Go, where there was dancing girls there. So uh, the bar's name was taken from the French title of the English comedy Whiskey Galore. Uh, it was then licensed to the club Whiskey A Go-Go, which opened in 64, uh, to reflect the already popular craze of go-go dancing. Sounds like somebody with a bad stutter, doesn't it, really? You know, go, 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 go. They used to... Didn't Keith Chegwin used to do it? He used to have a, a, a quiz show on the television for kids. And he'd go, 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 go. Or was it Mike Reed? It was Mike Reed used to... I'm sure he used to do that thing. And it was... I can't remember what the, uh, what the quiz show was called. But I always remember thinking, God, that was, that was one of those really action-packed shows. But go-go dancing was there. Smokey Robinson and the Miracles did have going to a go-go. And I'm assuming that go-go was... Um, you would go there to dance like that because some people used to dance together and go-go dancers, and I used to work with quite a lot because I used to share a house with quite a few of them because that's how they supplemented their income by go-go dancing in some of the uh, some of the discotheques. Cheeky Pete's in Richmond used to have two podiums right next to the DJ box with lights above it and lights in the bass 
and about I think twice an hour the girls would uh, would come on they used to wear bikinis they'd made them themselves which were sewn with sequins so they would reflect all the lights as well and they would they would tell you what they wanted to dance to and uh, you totally ignore them and put on something else and they would and people the boys would stand there and ogle the girls you know, and it was it was very popular. Go go dancing was very popular. I, I don't think you could go in a London club back in sort of sixties, seventies, and not find go go dancers. <laughs> Dale used to joke. Used to say, talking about run around was the program. There you go, run around. Go 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 go. He used to say, Do you not? Know, yeah, run. Have a look at run around. I'm sure it'll probably. Um, probably uh, tell you that he used to do that thing and I'm sure it was Mike was it Mike Reed or oh, I hope it was I'd be I'd be terribly embarrassed if it wasn't Mike Reed produced by that Mike Reed thank you and his place was taken now does it say go I mean it was so funny actually because it also uh, incorporated the two seasons of the short-lived ITV Saturday morning show Saturday Banana with Bill Oddy now I remember this program for one reason in particular that Bill Oddy it was a live show, and I think it was filmed Southampton. It might have been Southern, anyway, whatever it was, Saturday Banana. There you go, Southern Television. And they did it live, and Bill Oddie had all these kids, but he couldn't control them, and he lost his temper with them. All these kids were sort of running riot in the studio on a live programme, and he's trying to do bits to camera, and in the end he said, I'll clear this studio, and he did. They were all herded out. They were all herded out. It was hilarious. But uh, it was, yeah, it was called Saturday Banana. But I used to like Metal Mickey. Metal Mickey was one of my favourites. Please don't write in with your favourite shows. It's not one of those sort of programmes. And, um, yeah, there you go. Mr Neil knows. Might read Run Around. Thank you. I didn't know that loads of other people had done it as well. Loads of other people. There were all sorts of shows uh, on, on the television. Some of which were, were, were terribly sophisticated. Terribly sophisticated. There was a, a spin-off called Pop Around, uh, which ran for you know, one, one season with Gary Crowley. I said, where's Gary Crowley now? Is he still around? Is he still around? Oh, I love the way you're shaking your head. Do you know? Is he oh, he's just around? Sunset Strip as a whiskey a go-go. Very famous club. Goes back years, says Side the Truck. Of course, you'd know. You'd know these sort of things. Uh, Steve, the programme's called Run Around. Mike Reed, you're right. I know, sometimes I remember things and sometimes I... I'm totally convinced. I remember saying to my mother once we had a particular car and she said, no, we didn't. I said, Mum, I remember this car because my mother had driving shoes in the car. She had shoes that she walked in and then she put on shoes to drive the car. Don't ask me how it worked. I don't know. I was convinced it was worked by uh, hamsters on wheels inside the engine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Steve, your g -g 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 go sounded like normal wisdom. No, it was definitely Mike Reed. Definitely Mike Reed. Thank you, Chris. So, Sunset Strip. There used to be a programme on the television called 77 Sunset Strip, and I don't know why. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve. Uh, an irony that uh, nothing has worked with the £12 million spent, says Bev. This is uh, looking for Madeleine McCann. The trouble is, if you, if you look at it, I can understand, and I've heard loads of presenters, even on LBC and, uh, and you as well, talking about, well, you know, we could do so much more. This is £12 million on one child. And it was only because they met the Prime Minister, if you remember, then all of a sudden this money was forthcoming. And they don't... As, as a parent, I don't think they're actually able to say, OK, let's just forget about it. They can't do that. They can't do it. They have a million pounds themselves if ever the government pull the funding on it. But I mean, I don't see any end in sight for this. I, I think it's going to be it's going to be ongoing. But but there are no leads. The person that they thought was their suspect, their chief suspect, has written them basically a letter to everybody. It issued like a press release saying, excuse me, nothing to do with me at all. But you know what people are like. Uh, so questions and answers for you. Can you have a big wedding? Yes. The 30 guest limit is being removed for services and receptions from Monday. So does that mean you can go into the church and there won't be socially distancing in the church? Up to... Oh, it's up to the venue, is it? Right. Because I've seen people going to church and they've removed all the pews and all the chairs. So it's up to the venue if they can socially distance. Right. Appropriate. Oh, right. So they're still having to socially distance. Oh, my goodness me. So, although, you know, guests will have to be seated in groups no bigger than six, 
Tables will have to be socially... Di oh, dear, honestly. We're not really anywhere, are we? That means small venues will not be able to accommodate large numbers because you've all got to be separated. Will you have to wear a mask? Yes, you will have to wear a mask. Throughout the ceremony and receptions, except when sat at a table. Well, are you supposed to eat? I mean, even the bride and groom. Yes, of course. Well, presumably the vicar will have to wear a mask. Yes, you may kiss the bride through the mask. Hospitality venues such as hotels will have to do risk assessments for planned weddings to see how many people can be accommodated while maintaining the social distancing. Can you dance? The newlyweds can enjoy the traditional first dance, but at private weddings, dancing will remain against the government's guidance. Oh, for goodness sake, honestly. So, so then there's no singing. You can't sing either. And commercial venues will still be legally required to keep their dance floors closed. I mean, what are they going to... I mean, do you think the police will turn up? Sorry, we distinctly saw somebody doing the hokey-cokey. Oh, but we didn't. We didn't. You were doing... You were doing go-go dancing. I distinctly saw that girl doing go-go dancing. Can you have other entertainment? OK. I mean, I don't know what I'm thinking about here. But existing government guidance remains in place, which permits professional performers, as long as they can socially distance, and recommends they play outdoors. Other popular activities, such as the photo booths and the signing of guest books, are discouraged. Book a magician. Book a magician. Book a go-go dancer. Do marquees count as indoors or outdoors? What do you reckon, Joe? What do you reckon? Well... If two sides of the canvas are lifted up, a marquee reception is counted as being outdoors. Quite ridiculous. And how many can attend a home wedding? Come on, have a guess at that one. How many can... Yes, six, if it's inside. But the limit is increased to 30 if it's a, a deathbed ceremony when the bride or groom... Well, I've never heard of this one. Where the bride or groom is seriously ill and not expected to recover. What, what sort of wedding is that? Have you ever heard of that? A deathbed ceremony. I'm reading it as it is writ. When the bride or groom is seriously ill and not expected... I mean, I've heard of these things because I've seen pictures in the papers. My favourite was a lady. She was dying, but she wanted to see her horse. So the staff, the nurses, pushed her bed outside and they brought her horse to her. And the horse nuzzled her. It obviously knew exactly who she was. It was the most touching thing. And then she died after that. But uh, they're called deathbed ceremonies. They do them in, in, sometimes they do them in hospitals if they know somebody's not going to survive, but they want to, uh, but they want to get married. So basically we're nowhere. Basically, you know, even with lots of people, you know, going to your ceremony, they've got to be socially distancing. It's not like a proper wedding at all, is it? Very dull, very dull. Steve, I went to the launch, says Jill and Island of the Whiskey A Go-Go Club in Wardour Street. In 1959. It's not possible. 1959. Good Lord. And, um, and somebody says, Steve, we will all die. Nothing is more certain than that. Absolutely. Yes, that's the only thing you can guarantee in life. You are born, you live, number of years or not, as the case may be, and then we pass on and go, we hope to a better place. We hope to a better place. <laughs> uh, another one here which says... Uh, how come I can remember my landline number from 1977 and the registration number of my dad's dad's and chair for the 70s? And yet, says Sal, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. Oh, we get that here. When we, when we record your little bit extra, we have to do a little script for the end of the programme, which you'll hear, you know, in a, about 45 minutes time. And we have to sit down and go, what do we talk about today? We can't remember. Seriously. I mean, whether or not it's the early onset of sort of forgetting things, I don't know. Uh, to, yeah, well, he's only 32. <laughs> uh, 84850, oh, steve at lbc.co.uk. Shane says, I used to love Skippy in the 60s. I still think he was a bit stupid. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it was, listen, it was Skippy, for goodness sake. He was a bush kangaroo. Uh, Keith Chegwin did Cheggers Plays Pop. Cheggers Plays Pop, Tom. Of course, he's not with us either. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? All these people that went, he was married. They, they was very popular on Multicoloured Swap Shop with Noel Edmonds and Maggie Philbin. And he married Maggie Philbin. Keith Chegwin and Mary Phil, uh, Maggie Philbin got married. And then um, 
He was only six. Yes, he was very, very young, but he did a naked game show on the television. Do you remember it? It was the weirdest thing ever. They said Keith Chegwin's going to be doing a naked game show. And, of course, nobody was quite prepared for the fact that he was actually stark naked, full frontal. He came out from behind the set and I thought, oh, he'll be wearing a pair of pants or something. No, no, completely naked. I sent a letter of sympathy to Maggie Philbin immediately. <laughs> I said, uh, I mean, just amazing, just amazing. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. <laughs> Steve, um, ba -da 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 -da. my friend's father owned the Whiskey A Go-Go in Wardour Street and my parents met there, says Ambrosine. How oh, lovely. You see, I'm, I can remember various places. Where did I go to in so And I remember seeing Adam and the Ants and they were in this club. What the dickens was it called? I could, I could take you to where the club was. And all the people who were moving all their equipment around were um, like children. Hence Adam and the Ants. And, um, and I interviewed him, actually, years and years ago. I found him quite fascinating, quite fascinating, because he was sort of, he, he became a cult, you know, very quickly. And of course, he did put the immortal Diana Dawes in one of his, uh, in one of his videos, which is lovely. Uh, also, uh, somebody else talking about what, what things you can remember and what you can't remember as you get a little bit older. I know... Uh, Metal Mickey loved Irene Handel. Yeah, me too. She was, uh, she had one of those, I can't do her voice actually. It sounds a bit ridiculous. <laughs> sounds a bit ridiculous, but, uh, so theatres, so weddings, so still socially distancing. So basically nothing at all. We're not getting anything. You can have more people at the, uh, at the wedding. I presume, I mean, I don't know. I'm just beginning to wonder whether or not my brother's daughter can still take photographs. Yeah, she must be able to take photographs, mustn't you? But you can't have a a photo booth or something. Yes, that's a, be 29 guests. So every time you have an extra person working there, you take somebody else off your list. Oh, well, that's who's going to come in and count? I'm sorry, I think you'll find you've got 31 people here. No, we haven't. No, we really haven't. Look, she's not eating anything. She's my Auntie Enid. No, seriously, she won't eat. She's just sort of sitting there watching. Oh, it's not so exciting, is it, really? Not so exciting. Um, an obesity warning. When is there not? This is cheap and readily available uh, pizzas, breakfast cereals, industrial produced breads and some ready meals are fueling childhood obesity. You do see more fat children now, don't you, than you, than you ever used to before. I don't remember when I was at school we had fat children. Oh, there was one in our class. He went on to be a vicar. Surprising. That's the only thing I remember about the... Uh, the uh, and he had glasses on, so he looked studious. I remember thinking, that's quite nice. My friend Ian says, my friend Stephen and I were just watching Minder, because we're both Brits who live in America, and like British telly, on our TVs. Do you remember the episode with Mark Farmer from Grain Chill playing a ticket tout? No, no. I don't remember Mark Farmer from Grain Chill. I did used to watch Grain Chill because all the kids loved it because it was... And then they, they sort of found out what happened to them all, didn't they? Sort of years later. Did you watch Grain Chill? Da 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 I thought it was very good, actually. I liked all those sort of things. I liked all those things, but I don't remember Mark Farmer. Wait a minute. Did Mark Farmer go into... I might be getting confused with somebody else. Mark Farmer, actor... He played basically... Oh, right, there you go. He died, age 53. Had a brief battle with, uh, with cancer. Have you got a picture of him? I just... I, I, I might recognise him instantly. Oh, I do remember him. Absolutely. Isn't that amazing? You look at a picture of somebody. Good-looking boy. Good-looking boy. And, uh, and he, was, he was there. And, uh, and then he died of cancer. Very young, 53. Yeah, he was very good-looking. Very good looking. Such a shame, isn't it, when you see all these people and you think, oh, they still... And sometimes I've sort of said, oh, I enjoy watching so-and-so, and somebody will say, oh, they died. And you think, really? Can't believe it. No, he was, he was good. So he was, uh, he was in Grain Chill, but Grain Chill was tremendously popular. Tremendously popular. That, um, I, I must have done a tribute to him, actually. I did a tribute to so many people in the early days. But you can't, you know, after a while, you, your memory fades Ian, uh, as you know. Uh, see, the COVID restriction will continue until a bunch of pathetic idiots stop refusing to have a COVID vaccine. They're a menace. Yes, so wait a minute. Stop refusing. Yeah, I mean, 
to be honest with you, everybody should have it. I told you, I was at Waterloo Station again the other day. Well, I'm get there every day. I'm practically a regular. I know Lenny down there and a few other people. But uh, over 23s can all have the vaccine. The amount of people who are working at Waterloo Station, are manning the barriers, no masks on, nothing at all. And I'm thinking, and well, I've said it a million times, you can't all be asthmatic. It's just not physically possible. You know, you know, where do all the asthmatics go for working? Waterloo Station. I don't know why it's sort of people who don't want to wear a mask or they don't really care about it. And you think, well, what happens if you catch something? You know, do we have to do we have to treat you or do we have to say, listen, to give you the option, you know, at least to sort of give yourself some sort of protection. Ridiculous. Uh, Steve says, Keith, pay for chefs, waiting staff going up, which is good, but more expensive. Yeah, I mean, is this for, I mean, when you're doing the wedding then, when they say 30 people, is that 30 people en masse or is that 30 friends? Because that's not very many to invite to a wedding. I've been to weddings where, well, in fact, the Indian weddings, there can be thousands of people there. Really, Indian weddings are absolutely enormous. How are they going to cope with something like that? So 30 guests, I would say. So that does not include staff. Staff are separate. Or separate, as he typed. It's our new word of the day. It's all secret, which we like. Uh, 84850, steve at lbc.co.uk. Who was the comedian who married, says Nicky, his long-term partner before he died in order to deprive the tax man of his, uh, of his uh, share? I've no idea. No idea. After next week, it can be more than 30. Yeah, but if you've only got a little tiny venue, are we still socially distancing? Well, that's, I mean, it makes no difference. I mean, because you might not be sitting next to anybody, you know. Well, you probably won't be. You won't be sitting next to anybody at all. It looks ridiculous enough in a theatre. When are we going to allow people? If all these stupid people who won't get vaccinated, they're the ones who are holding it all up for us. I booed somebody the other day. I don't know why. I booed, I, I booed them. There was somebody, they were walking, where were they? Oh, Waterloo Station. Passengers, boo. And as he walked past, I went, boo. <laughs> <laughs> made him jump. No, well, I had the mask on, so he didn't know it was me. I mean, just absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, people will, will not do this, and it's going to be here for ages and ages. And very shortly then, of course, there'll be no staff at Waterloo Station. And, uh, and they'll go, oh, no, terribly sorry, but a lot of them have come down with COVID. You go, well, they weren't wearing masks, were they? Those would be the people. Those would be the people. Uh, what else? We have? The Valbon Club off Oxford Street. The in place to go. I went to the Valbon once. I didn't like it. It was okay, but you know, not my sort of not my sort of place actually. Sue says that the Minder episode is called "Long Drive Back to Scratchwood." Says Paul in Walton on Thames and R.I.P. Mark Farmer. Fancy remembering that? How can you remember something like that? Amazing, isn't it? Fantastic. You've, you've got the most amazing memories. Was it Ken Dodd? Well, Ken Dodd, he lived with his girlfriend for years and then they did get married, I seem to remember. Ken, Ken was the one, if he'd had, he'd had a bit of a run-in with the tax man before. He used to keep it in a tin box under the bed. Because some of the, these people used to earn an awful lot of money. I, I, I know people who used to get paid for gigs, half in goods and half in cash. I mean, there were all sorts of dreadful fiddles going on and things like that. But uh, Ken Dodd, in 89, he had stashed in suitcases in his attic £842,000. That's what he... In, in today's money. In today's money. So it was 336000 in cash. When asked by the judge, what does 100000 in a suitcase feel like? He said, the notes are very light, my lord. He said, I'm not mean, but I'm nervous of money. Nervous of... Of, of having it, nervous of not having it. And he said, and he said because you, you couldn't, he was, he was represented by George Carman, who in court quipped, and George Carman QC, mega famous, some accountants are comedians, but comedians are never accountants. He described Ken Dodd as a fantasist stamped with lifelong eccentricities. The trial lasted three weeks, he was acquitted. <laughs> But he used to say, good evening, my name is Kenneth Arthur Dodd, singer, photographic playboy and failed accountant. He used to tell all sorts of jokes about and other people turned turned jokes in. He also made a joke when income tax was introduced. It was a mere two pence in every pound earned, followed by the punchline. I thought it still was. <laughs> you know, that he made. I went to see him. Well, not intentionally went to see him, but he was on. Everybody sending me now. It was Ken Dodd. 
you know, I mean, I, I loved his funeral service. I thought that was fantastic. But he was, he, you couldn't get him off stage. Once he was on stage, they had to put a clause in his contract. He would go, the staff would be sitting there going, we want to lock up and go home. And so if he overran, there was a forfeit to pay. So they had to make sure. But he was like a machine gun. He just went on and on and on. And he was on a Royal Variety once. And I must be honest, I never found him. You know, he, some of his stuff was really clever and really funny. And he was obviously, a, you know, a, a master of it. I never thought he... I thought he was just not my sort of comedian. You know, I don't know why, actually. I, I suppose everybody's different. God knows I'm different. But, uh, no, his, his funeral was, uh, was lovely. And he was such a good singer. Such a good singer. But he lived in the same house for donkey's years. Donkey's years. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning. Nice to have your company. So the 10 corniest dad jokes have been revealed in time for Father's Day. Somebody's come up with this wheeze because it is Father's Day, isn't it? So I, I offer them to you now. I mean, either you find them funny or you'll find them dreadfully tedious. Uh, number 10. Just adopted a dog from the local blacksmith. As soon as I got him home, he made a bolt for the door. OK. Uh, the other day I bought a thesaurus. When I got home and opened it, all the pages were blank. I can't find the words to describe how angry I am. I've just quit my job at the helium factory. I won't be spoken to in that tone. I used to be addicted to the hokey-cokey, but I managed to turn myself around. My pet mouse, Elvis, died last night. He was caught in a trap. I've got a pen that can write underwater. It can write other words too, but underwater is one of my faves. My girlfriend said, you act like a detective too much. I want to split up. Well, it, I don't, I'm just telling you, my girlfriend said, you act like a detective too much. I want to split up. Oh, like detect... Oh, I don't get that one at all. Uh, number three, why can't Elsa be trusted to hold a balloon? Because she'll let it go, let it go. What's the best part about living in Switzerland? I don't know, but the flag is a big plus. OK. And the number one, Dad's corny... I'm so sorry, I do apologise for this. Nobody else will be doing this today. I went for an interview. They said, can you perform under pressure? I said, I'm not sure about that, but I'll have a good crack at Bohemian Rhapsody. That's... that's that. I mean, they're not just so much corny jokes. They seem to be recycled. I mean, I don't think there are many, many original things in there now. But, some, but that, Ken Dodd was like that. He had all of these... And Tim Vine does exactly the same. He does all these lines. And uh, and very good he is too. But of course, comedians are not working at the moment, are they? Although the good news is that Wimbledon finals day is going to be a full house. That's what they've said. 15,000 tennis fans will fill centre court for the second week of July to watch the men's and women's deciders, despite the delay to the easing of lockdowns. Other Wimbledon matches, which start on June 28th, will be held with 50% capacity. I don't know how they're going to manage all of this. I mean, it's all so, it's, so the Wimbledon singles finals will be the first major outdoor sporting event held at full capacity. So that's the second weekend of July, but that's not the twenty-first, is it? So I, I don't know how they're managing that. Perhaps there's some deal going on. A, 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 a cracking Tim Vine joke: crime in multi-story car parks. It's wrong on so many levels. It's all stuff like that. But there's people listening to this program this morning just doubled up with pain, sewing their signs up. Uh, Matt is back again after a rude awakening at his hotel. You remember Matt the other day was going off to his hotel. He said, a 6am fire alarm. A 6am fire alarm. Is that where you have to sort of rush outside in your pyjamas? And then you suddenly realise you don't wear pyjamas. So you're the only one there in your pants. He said, thankfully a false alarm, but we did get some lovely Glaswegian farmer to wake up to. <laughs> God, sounds like another one of those jokes, doesn't it, really? Uh, did you ever meet or interview Benny Hill? No. No, I didn't. No. I saw him on numerous occasions. He, he would go to the supermarkets in Twickenham because he lived up the road on the road to Kingston and he would buy the tins on the reduced shelf. Don't ask me why. It was, it's funny, isn't it? He had all that money. Ken Dodd outsold the Beatles in the 1960s. Uh, and Brian in Luton, says there's a statue of Ken Dodd in Liverpool Lime Street Station. I know that station very well. Very well. Do you remember Danny Kendall and Mr Bronson in Grain Chill, says Kath? Yes. Yes. 
And uh, Sue says, there's someone I know called Delphine who's telling everybody the virus is a hoax. Oh, there are people who are, who are going for that one. They're going, oh, it doesn't exist. You think, God, oh, really pray you don't get anything. The Wimbledon finals will be contested in front of capacity crowds. Wembley will be hosting 40,000 fans for its final four Euro 2020 fixtures. The government has confirmed plans for up to 20 pilot events across sport and entertainment. Oh, how lucky. With Wimbledon and football's European Championship, the big winners, yes. Oh, how lucky. Do you think they'll be given free tickets, the government? Do you think so? I mean, I wouldn't like to imagine... I can't imagine they'd be offered. I mean, you know, I, mean, I have I have seen Burko down there at uh, things like that. Do they have to declare it? Do they have to declare that? Yes, I'm sure they will. I mean, you know, somebody somebody says, "Listen, a pair of tickets for you here." It's like watching Yes Prime Minister, isn't it? And uh, all of that. I was told actually that uh, that was more accurate. <coughs> excuse me, than we ever thought. Um, 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 uh, somebody says, talk about Ken Dodd and accountants. And uh, Jeff says there was a great line by Pop Larkin in the Darling Buds of May to an accountant visitor who asked him if he paid income tax. He said, I don't have the money very long, so I don't bother. Isn't it funny? You only have to mention the word tax man. Uh, Boko is not an MP anymore, so he can do what he likes. Yeah, this, this was when he was uh, Speaker of the House. I think, I think he took Sally the Burke with him as well. I think that they went there. Mind you, I always remember, who was it who went... Who were those two footballing wives who were arguing? Um, one was uh, Colleen. It was Colleen and Rebecca Vardy. Where's that gone to? Is that finished now? Have we had the, uh, you know, you said this, I said that. You said this, no, I didn't. Well, let's go to court. Wagatha Christie, that was. You remember? I was so excited. Luckily, we haven't heard of Rebecca Vardy since. Colleen was pictured the other day. She was out with her husband, <laughs> uh, which was very nice. Uh, very nice indeed. Uh, oh, guess who joins Nick Ferrari this morning? Michael Gove. Michael Gove. I'm sure you'll have questions there. I'm sure you'll have questions. And Steve, I used to work in a menswear shop in Oxford Street. Uh, and the first club I ever went to was Le Kilt in Kingley Street, which is parallel with Carnaby Street. I had heard of it, Patrick, but I'd, I never, I never went. I don't think we ever had the money for things like that, to be brutally honest with you. I was surviving on, you know, on basically air. I didn't have any money at all. And when I did start working in a, in a discotheque, I managed to get a gig there. It was eight quid a night. Eight quid a night. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't think about tax. It was really bizarre because every time I moved property, an, another bill would arrive in from the tax man. And I can remember, and I'll tell you this now because it was such a long time ago, and it was, and I'd never, I'd never had an accountant or anything like that. I didn't know about paying tax. I didn't know anything at all. And I got a tax. But bearing in mind, I was earning eight pounds a night, and I got a bill in from the tax man for three and a half thousand pounds. Well, I nearly passed out because what they'd done is they'd estimated what they thought I would be earning, and I went, huh? I, d I didn't have three. I didn't have three pounds, let alone three and a half thousand pounds. And then a friend of mine said, oh, I've got an accountant and give it to him. So I gave it to him. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it for you. And, oh, thank God for that. That's always the blessing of accountants. And he got the bill down to, you never guess, never guess in a minute. So three and a half thousand pounds, which I didn't have. He got the bill down to the tax man, 33 quid payable in three installments. That's how long ago it was, you know. Two, two groats and an oxen. Uh, it was all very, very exciting. But, and that was my first encounter with the tax man. But ever since then, I've sort of happily paid tax. Because, I mean, there must be loads of people who were paid cash in hand. You just didn't, didn't think about anything in those early days. But uh, how nice that Wimbledon are going to be allowed to open to capacity. Will we all be... Wait a minute. Will we all be sitting there with masks? I've never been to Wimbledon. I've never been at all. It just doesn't interest me in the slightest. I know that if you own a house around Wimbledon, you can rent it out for huge amounts of money or your drive you can rent out. You know, park here, 60 quid the day. <laughs> Think they'll all be declaring? I do hope so. What's eight quid a night equivalent to in today's money? Depends what it was. Well, I don't know. I can't remember when it was, actually. A uh, long time ago. 19... Yes, it would have been... 79, 79 I joined LBC, so it would have been prior to... Yeah, probably about early 70s. 71? Something like that. Be interesting to find out. <laughs> Another dad joke. Thank you so much. 
The funeral of the inventor of Tupperware was postponed yesterday. They couldn't find the right lid for his coffin. Thank you very much indeed. £100 today. I was very badly paid. Very badly paid. <laughs> Easter Theatre in uh, Brick Lane still going, says Martin. Thank you. Uh, Adamant the Roxy, says Nige from Ponticloon. Lovely. And uh, apparently, Graham says, on social distancing, you can still play Pass the Parcel as long as you use a Hermes Courier. <laughs> and uh, somebody else says, oh, yeah. What do you call a man with a rubber toe? Robert, oh, you knew that one, did you? Oh, I'd never even heard of it before. I don't, I, know, I don't know these things. I don't. I'm still trying to get over the fact that eight pounds a night was only a hundred pound in today's money. Whereas I've heard of DJs working in uh, the, uh, the the sunny places where they have these big things, twenty five thousand pounds a night, fifty thousand pounds. Calvin Harris got a hundred thousand pounds a night in Vegas. A hundred thousand pounds a night. Good Lord above. That's like. That's like silly money. 100,000. Would you like 100,000 pounds? Not really. See, where are they playing here? Is this what, what are they playing? Uh, they, Roger Federer. That, that's Federer. Is that, well, well, why are all these people there? Why are they not socially distancing? How does this work? Andy Murray, former Wimbledon champion. He turned up on a programme on the television. Which one was it? It might have been QI or something like that in the audience. He was very good. Very good. He'd, he'd apparently been quite a few times. He's quite sweet. Very sweet. Oh, another phone call. Dear Steve, I'm your accountant. You now... Oh, oh dear. Oh, things like that. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning. Nice to have your company. It's uh, 10 to 7. This uh, Tuesday. So you've got one more day of sunshine. No, you've got today's sunshine. And then tomorrow. Sunshine. And then you've got the rain. And the lightning. And... Joking aside, hailstones. Seriously, that's what they've uh, <laughs> that's what they've said. I don't believe it actually. Uh, what do you call a lady with egg and chips on her head? Here we go. Calf. Thank you. I know they're all out this morning. They're all out this morning. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I definitely can't say that one. Uh, Adamant, as I said, the Roxy, and uh, and I, st I still quite like that one. Lot. Wait a minute. That's. Uh, uh, I, uh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, you have to be very careful on some of the jokes you're sending in. They're not, uh, they're not repeatable. Do you know that Jackie Collins died in 2015? I got a letter from her, um, her agent because she was due to come and see me. And uh, she, she took ill and the agent said she was really looking forward to seeing you. Uh, because we got on really well. She was, she was just lovely, actually. You would sit there and you'd just go... She was just, she was just really, really nice. Uh, also wearing a leather Nike baseball cap and skinny jeans. Oh, look, Shamima Begum again. She wants to come back to this country to help people, to help rehabilitate others. Now, well, you've tried everything else, actually, dear. She's now wearing red nails and a baseball cap. Doesn't really sound that believable, does it? But uh, she's been stripped of her UK citizenship. And, uh, and she now can't, can't return. But uh, she wants to appeal against the removal of her citizenship in 2019. And, uh, and there's somebody here who went to, uh, to do an interview with her. But as recently as 2019, she refused to condemn the Manchester Arena bombing. I don't think we want her back here at all, thank you very much indeed. I don't think we need people like that. And guess who's done an interview in the Daily Mail today? Julie Birchall. Now, she was fired, if you remember, uh, because she had a... It was... Sorry? No, I'm not going to say the name. But um, she says uh, the wokerati will never silence her. Well, I remember reading about Julie Birchall from a long, long time ago. And so I thought it was a joke. I thought when, when they said she'd been fired, I thought perhaps they thought she'd been fired. But no, she had been. And so she's, uh, she's talking about... She says, we live in an age of insanity where harassment is justice. And uh, so basically she's been sort of complaining about it. But she, she, she's, write, she's writing a book. That's very appropriate, isn't it, really? But she's always been one of those sort of people who sort of does that, that kind of thing. People sort of rock the, uh, rock the Casbah, as they say. Uh, Noddy Holder is 75 today, lead singer of Slade, not with them anymore. He's a radio presenter. He's not been with them for, for some years. He said, but he said, he said, you wouldn't believe the offers I get in December. I do appear as Santa for charity, real reindeer and everything, but people think I live in a cave all year and come out in December shouting, it's Christmas. 
But uh, he, but he's not with them anymore. They had uh, six number ones, including Merry Christmas, everybody. I mean, to be honest with you, as he said, it's been, yeah, the rest of Slate. Slate we found, we Dale and I landed in, there we go, we've, uh, Ibiza or somewhere like that. And queuing the carousel to get their thing was Slade. Well, Slade, so Dale was having a good old chat to them, which was quite good. So they, they split last year, did they? Oh, right. Well, they must be getting on a bit now. If he's 75, but um, the Merry Christmas, everybody, has been a very good pension plan. Right, write a single that, uh, that everybody plays every year on all the radio stations and uh, you've got a nice little income. So that's why you sort of you think about some people, you know, because you're always going to be listening to music on the radio, aren't you? Really? Uh, also, Sir John Redwood is 70 today plus born on this day now tell me you won't know i bet you won't know this but i'd heard this they get what five hundred thousand pound a year in royalties do they really what five hundred thousand each overall five hundred good lord above wow who do you think lisa del giancondo is it's a, it's a, th this could really be one of those questions on the quizzes that you can never answer on the television. Lisa Del Giancondo. I'll tell you she was born in 1479 and she died in 1542. That, and, no, no, no. She's a noblewoman thought to have been the subject of the Mona Lisa. Yeah, the Mona Lisa. That's who they thought. And uh, she had a portrait commissioned in Florence by her husband, Francesco. Mona Lisa roughly translates as my lady Lisa. So now you know. So there you go. Harry Nielsen was born on this day in 1941. Uh, died in uh, 94. He was described by both Lennon and McCartney as their favourite singer. Uh, father of seven, he wrote for artists including Frank Sinatra and uh, whilst performing the Lumberjack song with his friends, the Monty Python team. Harry Nielsen, he did a, had a very big hit single, as far as I remember, with, called Without You. Oh, I can't forget the feeling. And it was one of those really, really, really good records. Really, really good records. And I went to interview him. He was staying in a London hotel. And the reason uh, was he was over in the country. I think he was either doing a concert or there was a single or something. And so I was, I was a bit new at this. And they'd given me a machine called a ewer, which was a, a very expensive tape machine, which you just literally pushed record and play. It had piano keys on it. Years later, it turns into a cassette recorder, which they did a, a mic. I've still got one, actually, one of the early LBC ones. <laughs> Never gave it back. And, and you plugged a microphone into it, and, and so it all packed into your pocket. But this ewer was quite big. You had a strap thing and all the rest of it. And so I, I went and did my interview with Harry Nielsen in the Dorchester, and I uh, thought, so, yeah, pretty good, you know, get all the way back to the studio to then take the tapes off because you could then edit the tape that you just recorded. You didn't have to transfer it or do anything. What had I not done? I'd push record and play. Unfortunately, I'd left the pause button on. So, in fact, the interview didn't record at all, but the little green light flashed in the middle of it. And so it looked as I was recording it, but I wasn't recording it. And I had to go back again to record it again. I said, yeah, I'm terribly sorry. I said, but I, they, there was something the matter with the machine. And so, but of course, it never works if you do a second interview with somebody because you're not sure, because you think you've answered all the questions in, that he was, I'd, I'd given him the, uh, the questions and then he'd sort of answered them. Bit of a bit of a pain, it really was, but never mind. We, uh, we managed it. But uh, without you and everybody's talking, was that the, everybody's talking at me? Yeah. I don't hear a word. That, that was Harry Nielsen, was it, as well? Good Lord. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I did a tribute to him. I seem to do a tribute to everybody. But uh, the Marl Farmer one upset me a little bit this morning because I remember looking at him thinking, all these people, when you see them later in life, everybody's aged a little bit more, but he didn't, he didn't make it. And uh, Tommy Vance used to tell a story of interviewing Nielsen when he was so drunk, Nielsen fell off his chair. Oh, I could, I could tell you stories of people who... Uh, uh, there, there was one artiste who uh, was due to be coming in but unfortunately they hadn't sobered her up from the night before so the interview never went ahead and i'm not going to tell you who it was because i'm that good uh, slate had seven number ones in the 70s not six no i think you'll find they had six i can i can check it i'm i'm very good at checking you know uh i think i think six well the the papers are saying six number ones you think seven 
It was six. Sorry, you're wrong. Goodbye. There you are. You've been deleted. Uh, I've got to go. I've got to go. But not before I tell you we have a little bit extra podcast. And uh, it's well, well worth having today. Harry Styles pictured looking very cool. David P- uh, Beckham pictured looking very uncool because you've seen pictures of Dave Beckham before. Every time they have a picture of him, they have to mention the entire family. It's so dreary. Another royal marriage breaks down, surprising nobody. And Anne Robinson looks unrecognisable as she takes over Countdown. Just check out Anne Robinson and you can uh, you can see a picture of her. She's She looks completely... Morning, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. I mean, enjoy it. It's going to be... Uh, I think today's going to be hotter than yesterday, but then tomorrow is when we come to work in canoes and paddle boards and stuff like that. It's really going to be... Uh, ted- I mean, the more I read about the weather warnings, the more depressing it becomes. Uh, this morning, celebrity chef Tom Kerridge says washing dirty dishes is a highly skilled job. Uh, Britain secures a trade deal with Australia. Never thought we'd be saying that, did you? Uh, The good, the great and the very cheap go to Ascot. You know, a few people you might have seen on the television, but you wouldn't recognise them. Barbara's bikini sells for £9,500. The circus boss, who's offered a reward to help reunite a clown with his shoes. Somebody's pinched his clown shoes. I mean, they can't be for everybody, can they? You look silly walking down the street in clown shoes. Shamima Bagan said she was dumb. Yeah, we're not buying it, love. I'm terribly sorry. I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. And first-time dog owners treat their pets like children. That's nice, isn't it? Tell I'm in a good mood this morning. And the nurse who sued British Legion for the birthday card trauma. I was so traumatised. I don't know what to do. But uh, she lost. She lost big time. Uh, Plus, Ramesh hits back at uh, at a vile troll. And a quote of the week from Maureen Lippmann on Naked Attraction. Plus, uh, happy birthday to Lamont Dozier, who was part of the Holland Dozier Holland uh, songwriting team, responsible for tons of hits. We'll tell you what they were a little bit later on. Zara Tyndall going to Ascot. She's such a busy person, isn't she, really? God knows what she does with that dreary old husband of hers. In fact, he, he been, went on so many reality shows and failed on every one of them. A little bit like Jordan. Oh, the hot news in the Jordan department. Brace yourselves, kids. Brace yourself for this one. Yes, Jordan has got some very important news she wants to tell you. She's writing a book. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, and it's called uh, Harvey and Me. And it's about how, you know, she's juggled her busy showbiz life, don't make me laugh, uh, with bringing up Harvey and everything else, even though she's just popped him in a home. It's so he can be independent and doesn't have to rely on her all the time. Doesn't quite sound how it's supposed to work. But there again, she knows best, of course. This is the woman who has a restraining order on her for uh, for uh, attacking some poor woman as she went to the school. This was the woman who's going out with her ex-husband. Uh, plus, what else has she got? Oh, bankruptcy orders. Uh, then she was banned from driving. She really is a total failure, actually. And the very idea she's written a book I find almost laughable because we know she never wrote any of her own books. They were all they, they were what, what we call ghosted. If, if she wanted to write a novel, uh, she would sort of go, OK, it's like girl, big pair of bazookas, uh, wants to be fashion model and opens a riding school. There you go. That's the that's the and then somebody would write it. That's yes, that's the bio. That's exactly how it was. Somebody would then write it up for her. She never wrote anything in her life. So the idea that she's written a book about her and Harvey, I've got no idea. And the funny thing is, you know, me and Harvey, it's like it's this and that. She's just been on three holidays. Has she taken him? No. No, he's been shoved over here. You know, somebody else will have to look after him. She's far too busy going to get cosmetic surgery. But uh, at least she's managed to walk again. There's obviously a miracle operating there. She's still living in that filthy house. And she's got the new uh, the new boyfriend. Well, I say the new boyfriend. I mean, he'll be the husband. We'll have the pictures taken. She'll make a bit of money. Although, to be honest with you, he should get half of it. But I bet you she doesn't share the money. I bet you she won't share because uh, you need to kind of teach her. In fact, she needs to be taught everything now. They, they now have to describe her as a former glamour model. She was never very successful at glamour modelling. She just became sort of a bit sort of tarty. Mind you, talking of tarty. Oh, we found two crackers this morning. Two people who actually got evicted from Weatherspoons. I mean, what do you have to do to get evicted from Weatherspoons? You wait till I tell you the story. You will be absolutely wetting yourself on this one. It's a it's a crackingly good story. Uh, Gary Lineker is gagging to hit the clubs with his sons. Oh, not dreary old George again. George, who they desperately used to take round to every club, trying to find girls who wanted to go out with him. But unfortunately, neither blessed with looks or talent. It was a case of, oh, and your claim to fame is... Uh, Gary Lineker's my dad. Oh, right. Riveting. We've met Wayne, the other half of the family. 
not exactly that exciting, but uh, I think you need a cup of tea this morning. Go get yourself a nice cup of tea. Is that a recent picture of George? I love it. It so makes me laugh. It really does. He's got his dad's sticky out ears and, uh, and uh, yes, and, uh, and I think he might have found a girlfriend. Although, to be honest with you, he looks a bit, a bit nerdy. He looks a bit nerdy. I think what they did, they, sort of, they actually sort of, sort of took him out to nightclubs and tried to hook him up with all these girls. And they went, I'm oh, sorry, love, who are you? <laughs> you know, the moment they, oh, your father's Gary Lynch. Oh, yeah, I'll go out with you. It was like that. Generally speaking, I, I don't think they would. But uh, what's the one here? School, school after son fails. Lineker blames £25,000 a year school on son failing to, and we shall never know, make the grade. Oh, right. What's that mean? Make the grade. All right. 25 years. And, and, there's, and there's Gary Lineker's son, George, because he went to uh, Charterhouse. He'd chosen to send him there. And uh, the qualification is said to be tougher by education traditionalists. Yeah. I mean, George did the pre thing and they seem to have been much harder. In other words, he just wasn't up to it. We're all very disappointed. Yes. Even the poor girl who at least got her picture taken with him. Can you go back down again? Show me the the girl. She looks absolutely his uh, type. Blonde and boobies sticking out. So there you go. Absolutely classic. Whether they're still together, we have no idea or care even less, I'm afraid. Uh, Another one here. Oh, Dawn Neeson's on Ginge and Whinge again. Somebody keeps writing to me about them. She's obviously one of these sort of... She's it's ever so funny. I'm, I shouldn't, shouldn't really laugh at her. But uh, she sort of keeps writing about, you know, that, that uh, Ginge and Whinge are really the most popular people in America at the moment. And, uh, and ba- she thinks I'm jealous of them for some peculiar... Why on earth you'd be jealous of, of two not particularly talented people? I have no idea. But uh, she keeps listening, she keeps writing, and we keep putting her in the dump bin, which is the best place for her, poor soul. Uh, what else we got? The pool's heir wins the fight with his brother over a £40 million win on the pools. They, 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 they made a lot of money, actually, the pools. But this, this particular company, was the, the will was worth £40 million. So even if you halve it down the middle, it's still £20 million quid. Uh, Peter Andre stops telling his daughter to be a nun... Yeah, whatever. I'm not too sure where Peter Andre is coming from, actually. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, the oh the lyrics for "Candle in the Wind" sold for fifty five thousand pounds, which is they were then changed. Goodbye, England's Rose, Norma Jean, which was uh, which was very very good. I mean, I have to be honest. He wrote some good stuff. No denying it, is it? Uh, Richard Madeley slammed for saying it's embarrassing for men to cry. Which, of course, it, it isn't. I got my eyes tested yesterday at the hospital and uh, and the girl was... She, she They ask you, you know, your date of birth and everything else. They always ask you, everywhere you go, each room, and I saw three different people. Uh, first one is, uh, OK, hold this thing up against your eye. Now, how far down this leaderboard can you read these letters? Well, I got as far as, like, two from the bottom and that was about as far as I went. And then I had another one where, you know, put your chin on this thing, OK, and open your eyes wide and... That's where they blow air into your eyes so they can get a photograph of it. And uh, and then I go to another one. OK, I'm going to give you this thing here. And every time you see the little white light, you push the button. Well, I just pushed it. I just carried on pushing it. Didn't see any lights at all. And uh, and then then you see the doctor who evaluates you. And he said, um, he said, it's good. He said, it's good. He said, uh, uh, you know, I don't need to see you for another nine months. I said to him, I said, you hate me that much. You know, I thought they'd want to see me a bit more sort of sooner. But no, he said nine months. I've got an appointment in nine months time to go back to the hospital. But the woman in the in one of the things where they were going into your into your eye. Have you never had the eye thing? Yeah, they do that a lot. It sort of opens up the eye. And then he he actually put drops in and they sting like blinking. Oh, gosh, they did. And um, and she said, oh, Pisces. She said, I'm Pisces. I said, I know all about Pisces. Let me tell you. Yeah, I know all about Pisceans. I think Pisceans are great. I said, but the one thing that we do is we do cry a lot. We're a bit emotional. We wear our heart on our sleeve. So we do cry at movies. I mean, I cry at the stupidest movies. Even movies I've seen before, I still cry at the same place. Me and my friend Jimmy used to watch every Sunday. He'd come round to my place and I'd cook a Sunday lunch. Well, I'd throw things in the oven and heat them up. And... um, yeah, I mean, last week with the D-Day veteran, I, it doesn't take much to get me going. And we used to watch Little House on the Prairie and we'd look and see who was the first one to start crying at the, the tales of the Ingalls family. <laughs> and I do it now. If, if I watch E.T., I'll cry again at the same moment. 
you know, whether, whether things... I just can't help it. So uh, that was that. So that was that was all in all a good day. But, oh, by God, getting back. You can get to Kingston Hospital. It's easy. The bus takes you directly there from the bus station. When it comes on the way back again, it doesn't drop you at the bus station. It drops you in the middle of bloody Kingston. And you've got to walk all the way through to go and get my bus, which was the 281. By the time I got there, my feet were aching. I'd f Oh, it was like Waterloo. Like Waterloo Station. I managed to make it yesterday. I was wearing the wrong shoes, I think, yesterday. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to wear because I've I've got those nice ones from Jonathan Shallot, which are very nice. Got me some very nice trainers, very posh trainers. Uh, no, no, they don't know posh trainers. Oh, very expensive, but uh, very nice. And um, and uh, and I, I sh I'm going to wear those. I think you're supposed to wear different shoes every day so that your feet do not acclimatize themselves to one particular shoe. But the shoes I was wearing yesterday, unfortunately, it did say that they're for the gymnasium. Well, I'm not in the gymnasium and I had to walk all the way back through Kingston. I must have looked like a 90 year old man. I was sort of clinging on to anything that was, you know, strangers on the street and stuff like that. I loved it. Uh, Charlie Girling's up. She says, I'm finally here from the start up feeding the baby. How are you going to cope with the heat today? I'm not. I'm not. I, d I mean, I, I stay in. I bought two little fans from JML. They were advertised the other day and they're called, I forget what they're called, they're 20 quid each, little tiny fans, but you plug them in and charge them up and you get six hours. Fat, so, and, and it either clips onto something or it'll sit flat, so there's no trailing cables or anything else. So I sat there with that on yesterday. That was very nice after I got back from the hospital, which is, uh, which is very good indeed. So today I'm going to go out, go and get some more jeans. I've got some money I need to change up as well. Because, you know, I, well, what I do now, I, I save all my change every day into a jug. I empty my, my pockets out and then I take it up to a supermarket who's got one of these coin star machines and I change it up. You have to pay for the privilege of doing it. But to be honest, who can be bothered to sit there and bag stuff up, which I used to do years ago, but I haven't done that for donkey's years. I don't mind paying a commission to the supermarket. You remember we had the trouble with Sainsbury's in Hampton where the girl said, you know, we, we won't be doing this amount again. And uh, do you remember I got I got told off by, by an assistant in Sainsbury's and I said, get me a manager. You know, she was arguing because I had so much change that I think it amounted to something like three or four hundred pounds. Whatever it was, there is no I said, but there is no sign on the machine that says we'll only do it up to 50 quid or something like that. I said, you're actually making money out of this. Well, you know, we, we, we won't be doing it again. <laughs> you bloody well will. I got the manager. I went, manager. I said, uh, I've been told that you won't you won't change my money up again. Is there something the matter with it? And he went, no, not at all. And there was another old woman on the on the desk at Sainsbury's in Hampton, and, and she accused me of speaking to this other girl badly. Whereas in fact, I've just I've just given them like thirty odd quid in commission, and they haven't had to actually move one foot in front of the other. I thought I'll have you, mate. I tell you, don't mess don't mess with the Allen. Not in a Sainsbury's. Good Lord above. It's uh, oh, it's four fifteen. <laughs> There's a heavy little bear at the end of my bed. I'm Heidi from ID. Stop hibernating! You could get a better phone deal. <laughs> ID Mobile could save you an average of £215 a year versus the major networks. I must be dreaming. 99% coverage of the population does feel like a dream, but it's very real, Alan. ID Mobile! Visit idmobile.co.uk forward slash save for verification. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Nice to have you company. It's Steve Allen's early breakfast on uh, LBC. I get so cross in shops nowadays. I really do. Yeah, there was somebody in Iceland yesterday, one of the young men on the till, and I bought some, some biscuits and said, not for me and not for Nick Abbott either. We don't leave biscuits for Nick Abbott. Honestly, he's got enough money of his own. I mean, do you know how rich he is? Did you know that he won the lottery? I bet nobody knows that. He seriously, I mean, he, he's kept it. As quite, I promised I wouldn't tell anybody. And, uh, and he... And, and, and he, he won money on the lottery, but he's so squeaky tight, he's, he's he's not spending it. I thought he'd buy another Wendy house or something, but he didn't. He didn't bother with it. So anyway, so I, I, I changed the time that my car is picking me up in the morning, almost on a regular basis. And uh, yesterday I, I got back from the hospital, nursing my poor feet. And I then, um, and so I phoned them up and they all say the same thing. They go... Hello, how can I help you? Can you give us your booking reference? Well, I I never see that because I can't get my emails at home at the moment. It's a bit of a pain. 
And so I said, I've got an account number for you because I have a pri private account, you know. They always sort of say, you know, and the account name is, I go, Steve Allen. And your name is Steve Allen. And so she said, right. I said, I need to change the pickup time. I need to bring it forward. So we did that bit. She said, and I'll send you an email to steve at lbc.co.uk. Just confirm it. I said, thank you very much indeed. She said, one final thing. I thought, oh, here we go. I'm going to be in a survey. She said, I love listening to your programme every day. And she's in Peterborough. The call centre is in Peterborough. And I went, thank you very much. I'm so grateful I didn't shout at her. Because <laughs> I've had a couple of people. You, you get a couple of the, of the miserable old bags who answer the phone. And, uh, and they go, so I need a booking reference. And I go, I don't have a booking reference, OK? I've got an account number. Well, I don't think I could. I'll, I'll have a look. OK, so you give them the account number. And the name, Steve Allen. I don't appear to have any bookings for you for tomorrow. I said, well, I've been having it five days a week for the last five years. How come you, you know, the person who needs to go to Specsavers can't see it? And then she goes, oh, I found it. I thought, of course you have. Suddenly realised you actually set the account up for me. One of your big bosses, wasn't it? But uh, no, so she was listening in Peterborough which I thought was very good. I've never been to Peterborough, but it's, it's gone up in my estimation, and uh, which is very nice indeed. Uh, so what else we got? Oh, the Ab Fab star hits out at the Woke Brigade. Yes, Jennifer Saunders has said she couldn't make Ab Fab today. There's too many people complaining about everything, especially when you get this, this nurse who tried to sue the British Legion for a birthday card trauma. You wait, when you hear this story, you'll be going, is she mad? And the answer is, no. She's just a bit simple because she didn't say anything when they gave her the birthday card. And it was a f she said, if my 20 year old son had given it to me, I would put it down to a bit of cheekiness. And you think, but not at work. Wouldn't bother me in the slightest if somebody put down, you know, I don't know, Steve, some old man on a motorbike. You go, Steve Allen. I mean, it was a, to be honest with you, I thought it was quite funny. But it's a birthday card from people at work. She obviously they must have hated her because... Oh, well, I'll have to wait a minute. Wait, I'll, I'll tell you now, because now you've pushed me for it. I'm going to have to tell you what it is straight away. <laughs> it's only because the moment I read it, I thought it was very funny. Also, I'm going to talk about the uh, abuse of the BBC man hounded on the street. Uh, this is Nick Watt, who had to flee to safety. And uh, he's Newsnight's political editor. And there's a, a few, let's just call them thugs, shall we, out on the street, who rounded on him and sort of blamed him and hurling insults at him. And there's another one of these peculiar people, you know, the one with the glasses on the head, the open neck shirt, slashed down to the navel, a bit of a thug. And uh, even, even Boris has said it's disgrace. I mean, he had to run at some point, these stupid people. They really are dumb. Right, wait a minute, wait a minute. I shall, if, I, if, if I live to be 37, I shall find this blooming story. It's only because it was so, so ridiculous that I, I couldn't believe anybody would ever complain about anything like this. But um, she obviously thought it was... Now, whether or not she was complaining to think she could get money out of it, I don't know. Her name is Eileen Gleeson. OK, there she is. Oh, doesn't she look a happy little soul? Anyway, she sued the Royal British Legion for discrimination after colleagues gave her a birthday card saying it's not about age, it's about attitude. Eileen Gleeson, 58, took the chari to a charity to a tribunal over the card which featured a photo of a pensioner riding a motorbike. She told the hearing she was offended and branded it insulting. However, the tribunal was told she didn't raise it at the time. Miss Gleeson of Southampton also sued the Legion for victimisation and unfair dismissal after she was sacked over her performance. The judge, Catherine Rayner, threw out the case. She ruled that in the context, the age reference was not discriminatory. And she concluded Miss Gleeson's age played no part in the way she was treated and there'd been no discrimination. What a stupid person! So she's only 58. She's got one of those irritating faces. I don't know why it's a case of... The, the judge said it was her lack of cooperation and refusal to communicate with managers which caused the ongoing difficulties, and that's why they terminated the contract. You know, if somebody don't fit, get rid of them. So she went, and you gave me that birthday card and I felt humiliated and all this kind of thing. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Because otherwise I'm going to hire loads of pensioners with grey hair to cycle up and down past your house. I mean, it's just, goodness sake, grow up, woman. Grow up, it's ridiculous. But uh, age played no part in the way she was treated. No discrimination. She's a nurse, for goodness sake. You know, everybody loves nurses. Well, we don't love that one. But I mean, and she actually wanted to sue the Royal British Legion. The Royal British Legion. Go, oh, dear me. Never mind. Now you've been made to look a fool. And, um, and you're in all the newspapers. You know, 
full of young people, the Legion. Yeah, I mean, the Legion is just, you know, it's full of, you know, just wonderful people, you know, except her. So they're better off without her, much better off without her. Um, Bradley has a pop at perfect ploughing because he's playing Pop Larkin. Uh, also, Elon Musk has put his last house on the market. 100 million he's looking for. He's got to fund this thing up into, into space because obviously times they are hard. And uh, what was the other one that I quite like? I quite like Tom Kerridge. I think washing dirty dishes is a highly skilled job. When we were younger, me and my brother, it was a case of one would wash and one would dry. I never wanted to do the drying bit. I always wanted to do the washing bit. The washing bit I always thought was easy. I don't know why, actually. Uh, the two women thrown out of Weatherspoons. You're going to love that story. Uh, and Yuri Geller, the spoon bender. Honestly, what a marvellous thing. He's changing the molecular structure of the metal in the spoon. No, he's not. It's absolutely rubbish. Absolute rubbish. You know, if he was examined nowadays on the television, you'd have him exposed immediately. It's, uh, it's just, it's not physically possible to bend metal with the power of your mind, OK? It's as simple as that. You can, you can sit here till the cows come home, but I can tell you that there is no chance that you can sit there and hold a spoon. I mean, put it this way, if you can bend metal with the power of your mind, you'd put the, you'd put the spoon on the table and we'd all sit there looking at it. But, of course, he has to hold it. And in holding it, you know, he has to do... Yes, it does not. They, they did it. They actually gave him a... What was it? He, he went to a country house, a stately home years ago on the television, when sort of metal bending was, you know, bend, bend. I mean, it was just an act. You know, bend, bend. And, uh, you know, <laughs> just sort of a very good joke, actually, but I can't tell you. And, and what, what they did was they... Uh, after he'd bent the metal, he went, look, it's, it's going soft, it's going soft. And then the, the bowl broke off. So after he'd actually sort of left the spoon there, they picked it up and they put it under an electron microscope. And they found out that the metal had been weakened beforehand because they could see the structure inside. So obviously, because there are ways of, of doing it. Uh, well, no, he didn't. He didn't, but he'd obviously found a way of, of manipulating the spoon. Because if you actually get a spoon... Oh, I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to sneeze. Uh, <laughs> pfft. Ooh, pfft. Oh, they were a bit silly, weren't they? I'm sorry. Very girly sneezers. But, um, yeah, the, uh, if, if you take a spoon and just bend it backwards and forwards a few times on the bowl until you get to that stage where you think it's, it's going to break, then you just stop. And, you, and you, you can, you know, look at it, you can tap it on the table and everything else. So then when you apply a little bit of pressure to it, the bowl will just break off. And people will, I mean, I, I have the power. Well, because it, it doesn't really work with, I mean, knives, because they're, they're flat. So it, it's really only spoon bending. You know, you get people who, who can bend forks, but they just, the prongs bend and stuff like that. But I mean, spoon bending, I mean, Yuri Geller made a fortune out of just basically doing an old magician's trick from years ago. But, uh, you know, he, 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 and have you noticed, whenever anything happens, like when Big Ben stopped years ago, he said, I did that. And we all went, yeah, well, why didn't you tell us beforehand? You told us after. Because to be honest with you, I stopped it. You didn't stop it, I did it. And he's going to help Scotland win... Uh, at the football on Friday against England. And how will you be doing that, darling? Do, do tell. Do tell. Of course, if they lose, he will say not enough people, you know, did it. It's like a, a lot of these sort of people, these charlatans, as I used to call them years ago, they were exposed by the Davenport family. They would go round and uh, they, they would tie people up in, in uh, ropes and boxes. And it's a case of uh, they, they would then draw a curtain round it and tambourines would go and things would be thrown over the top and then you'd fling open the curtains and they'd still be tied up. His performance included spoon bending, describing hidden drawings and making watches stop or run faster. He says he performs the feat through willpower and the strength of his mind. It's a load of old codswallop. I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you that. You know, and I'd tell it to him if he was sitting in the studio. In fact, he did appear on LBC some years ago. Yes, and here he is. Hello, Yuri. Hello. See, he said he's with me in the studio. Uh, so, uh, so why do you tell people you do it with the parry man? Well, because I do. There you go, and that's his answer to everything. And of course, if if it doesn't work, it means you're watching him too carefully. You know, there are always listen. That's the whole fun of it. People like to be fooled, but don't tell people you've got special powers when we all know it's a load of old codswallop. You know, you've got to be honest about things. I was always told, do not tell lies to people. Exaggerate, but don't tell lies.
<laughs> so much better. So easy, this programme sometimes. Uh, Steve, I've just got back, says Shane, from Phoenix, Arizona, where today it will be 47 degrees. 47 degrees. So double it and uh, and add 30, approximately. I mean, give or, give or take a few degrees. Nobody can tell, can they? So 80, 94. Oh, my God. I mean, it's going to be 29 degrees today. Sunny with a gentle breeze. That's the bit I'll be looking forward to. But uh, there is the yellow warning of thunderstorms from six o'clock until... Well, in fact, you're going to get it for 24 hours, isn't it, practically? 24 hours. So be warned be wa- until, until Sunday. Good Lord. So Wednesday through Friday with the potential for travel disruption and flooding. This is for Greater London. I'm sorry I can't do the, the entire... Um, the entire country, but uh, thunderstorm. We haven't had, th- and the reason we've got thunderstorms, I'm assuming, is because the weather has been so hot and it's the atmospherics, isn't it, and things like that. Birds seem to enjoy it, don't they? Have you seen birds, sort of, you know, swooping around in the sky, and you think to yourself, do they feel the heat? Do they sit there going, where's the ombre solaire? Where is the ombre solaire? And uh, oh, I was watching. What was I? Oh, I'll have to tell you in a minute. I was watching another one of those uh, robbers caught in the act on the on the 999 te- nine, nine, some i can't remember what it was but it was very good one one particular bloke who actually went in to rob a shop unfortunately the woman who'd worked in there left got her husband who was a bouncer you could tell he was a bouncer she had no teeth at all apart from one in the middle and he this bloke produces a sawn off shotgun but the bouncer takes a risk to keep my business ahead of the game i knew i needed some fresh ideas and fast. That's why I decided to host a young person on a T-level industry placement. My student has already brought loads of new skills into the workplace. Plus, we're getting first pick of new talent coming into the construction industry right here in the east of England. It's been a total win-win. Go next level with T-levels. Search Skills Revolution. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. That mouse thing, the the mouse uh, trap, or whatever it's called, the little nipper, because basically it's sort of it. Because mice are very fast, very fast, and there's a ho- some horrible things on um, uh, on YouTube where they've sort of invented things that catch mice, and it's basically mice walking up a thing, and they can see the food. The moment they fall in, it's electrified. And uh, and mice sort of tend to follow each other into a, a place. Now, it's not very nice at all, but I mean, it depends. I mean, if you're terrified of mice and you've got them in, in your house, I mean, that would freak me out completely. I'm not very good with stuff like that. We used to have a very old house in Yorkshire. Well, it wasn't old till we moved in. And, um, and you could hear the mice behind the walls as they would scamper up and down. Yeah, very hard upbringing, yes. <laughs> I were up chimneys as a lad. Uh, In Uzbekistan, Steve, only 95 degrees. Oh, positively balmy. 100 degrees by uh, by Saturday. (laughs) Uh, Shane says, I missed the last 10 minutes of the Hungary-Portugal game last night due to test and trace phone call. Oh, right. And Sean says, Roland Rat phoned me up once when I was a mere four years old. I still remember it now. That's nice. The Meerkats ad is very funny. Dame Edna Everidge is on the ad with the Meerkats down here. So Shane in Sydney. Well, that's a bit of a a nice little sort of uh, trio of people, isn't it? Or actually more of that. Uh, What else we got? What else we got? More of your texts and emails. 84850 steve at lbc.co.uk. Barbara's Bikini, as I say, sells for £9,500. And the money goes to Alzheimer's, which we're uh, we're very pleased about. I think that uh, that was a very good outcome. I mean, when you think, it, yeah, the bikini wasn't worth nine and a half thousand, but somebody was willing to pay that. In fact, there was quite a quite a frenzy in the uh, in the bidding world. So in the paper today, oh, actually, it was very interesting. Nick Ferrari was just saying that he's got uh, Diana's brother. He has a book out at uh, the moment, and uh, and I think Nick will probably was uh, yes, I think Nick was with LBC because. Um, uh, Charles is uh, sorry. Diana's brother used to work at LBC. He had a he had a phone in program because I used to follow him. I think I used to follow. It's either I followed him or he followed me. I can't remember which one it was actually. But uh, yes, and that was when we were in Hammersmith. So he's he's done phone ins on LBC before. Very nice, very nice. Oh, Zara Tyndall and her husband Mike, uh, whatever. 
were at the uh, celebrating of Royal Ascot. The Queen decided to stay at home. She obviously heard who was going to be there. And so Sophie Wessex went. Do you know, I, I don't know if it's me, but, you know, the, the royals have got no idea how to dress. Not a clue. The women, you would think that with all the, you know, things at their fingertips and all the all the designers crying out to get them to wear stuff, they must absolutely hold their heads and go, oh, God. I mean, when you look at Sophie Wessex, I mean, she's very lovely. I worked with her. And she's wearing a dress which has got a belt which you obviously just tie around the middle. It looks awful. I don't know anything about fashion, but this is this is bad. And, of course, the latest hats are fascinators, except where you get Princess Anne, who's got no sense of the occasion, doesn't really know what to wear, and so she puts on sunglasses that don't even suit her. Put... Put sunglasses on, look in the mirror, does your face look right? It's like you look at Victoria Beckham. Her sunglasses were always way too big, way too big. So Princess Anne turns up, uh, Charles turns up, and he's, he's got the flower and they've got their masks on. Strangely enough, Zara Tyndall didn't have a mask on, neither did Mike, neither did Sophie Wessex, neither did Princess Anne, but uh, Charles and Camilla did. Camilla's wearing what can only be described as a shroud, and she's sort of wearing it. And then you look at Zara Tyndall's outfit and it's a, she's obviously worn the fascinator before, but uh, they've got all sorts of people there. I think uh, Sunita was there, uh, plus Simon Cowell with his girlfriend. And uh, surprisingly, I think uh, Lauren and Sunita back the day's first winner. See, we, we used to have LBC race evenings. We had them at Sandown Park and at Kempton. And uh, we used to get the tote because there were so many of us. The, the tote would come round and they'd do it. And I, was, I, I just couldn't work out how to, how to bet. Some people study form and you can tell, you know, they go, the, 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 the going is good to soft. I don't know what that means. No idea. I suppose it just depends if it's rained or something like that. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't do very well at all. I, d I did average. Average is not very well at all. Uh, and here's a picture. Good God in heaven. Ulrika Johnson is naked in the paper today. A spot of naked gardening. Ooh. I don't really think that if you, if you, oh, I don't know. It's not, oh, I mean, Ulrika Johnson. I mean, should you really have done that? It's not good, is it? It's not a, it, it, it's not a good picture though. Why would you, I mean, I don't know why she's doing it, but she's, she so naked gardening. She was wearing just her green wellies and uh, she was raising awareness for men's bereavement charity. That's what it's got to do with taking your clothes off. Honestly, if you really don't have a perfect body and, you, and your bum is as saggy as that, dear, for goodness sake, don't take your clothes off again, please. It's awful. Uh, so, 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 Richard Maidley slammed for saying it's embarrassing for men to cry. Do you think that Richard Maidley has never cried? He says, uh, uh, my toes curled at weepy Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer on Piers Morgan's life stories. He said, seriously, it was a bit embarrassing. He's got a lot on his plate at the moment and a lot to do going on a talk show, really, and crying. It was very odd. I mean, some people do cry. You know me. I mean, I'm I'm quite good at crying. I cry quite <laughs> quite often, actually. Films, things that have upset me in the paper, things that I've seen on the telly, all sorts of things. They make you cry. It's, you wouldn't be human. You know, it's like I would be quite worried if somebody went to a funeral and of, of somebody obviously that they knew, and they didn't actually have a little tear in their eye. I, you know, I, I would think that would be slightly odd. Do you see Cristiano Ronaldo got a little bit uh, upset the other day? So he's sitting there and there's two bottles of, uh, of a fizzy drink, which is sitting in front of him. And he, he takes them off and he holds up water and he goes, I forget what he goes, whatever. The, um, um, there's a name for water. No, not water. Portuguese. What do they call it? Aqua. Yeah, he says aqua, water. So he, he, he takes off the sponsor. Uh, somebody says he eats healthy, nutritious food six times a day and there's absolutely no room for sugar in his books. Yeah, but they're paying a fortune, these people. Pay, pay money. Zora says you cry at panpipers. Yeah, all right. Make a big deal about it. Don't tell everybody. I do, I do cry at lots of things, actually. Although, strangely, strangely, I didn't cry at my father's funeral. I don't know why. I cried at my mother's funeral... But, uh, but and, I, and I tell you, I didn't actually cry at the funeral. I cried, and I'll tell you what it was. My, uh, my Auntie Grace, who isn't with us anymore, sadly, um, she was my mother's sister. There were lots of them, believe you me. The family is so, so extended. But anyway, uh, after the funeral, we, we go back to, uh, to Grace's house and she gives us a letter, me a letter and my brother a letter, written by my mother before she died, just to basically say, you know... 
uh, I hope you have a nice life and I hope you... Well, I walked around the garden. It was <laughs> blooming terrible. And uh, I'm reading this letter because my mother uh, had this uh, terminal cancer. And so she made sure that she got everything in order. But she obviously then thought, I want to make sure that they've got a little reminder. So we both had a letter each saying, you know, I'm immensely proud of you and all this kind of thing. And you think, well, she's not here to see us reading it. And uh, and I, I have to be honest, I did shed quite a few tears over that one. Mind you, I got one from my dad as well when I was first born. I mean, I don't know how, how advanced he thought I was in the reading stakes, but he was in Egypt and I was flying out with my mother and it was the first time that he'd seen me. I mean, we're assuming it's my father, I don't know. I was, I was a baby. I was a baby. I'd been born and uh, my mother had had me over here and then my father was stationed out in Port Said in Egypt. We flew out there and he wrote me a 20-page letter telling me everything about his life because nobody knows, you know, where your parents met, how many people they'd been out with before. I knew nothing at all. And my father told me everything. He said, I met your mother here. And people in those days tended not to go out with like loads and loads, of, not like today, you know, where half the cast of Love Island have worked their way through Jersey. And, um, and so he, he told me everything about their life and how he was so much looking forward to seeing me. I was a cute baby, of course. But uh, I've still got that letter. Funny, isn't it? You, you keep these things. But it was the one from my mother saying, listen, you know, look after it. Just look after your brother. God knows. Millstone around my neck, that one. <laughs> but uh, it just makes you think somebody even, you know, at the end of their life can think of something like that. That's a, that's a special person, definitely. Uh, well, I'm with you till seven this morning, whether you like it or not. There's, there's no choice on it. I have a contract. I'm, I'm duly ordained to be here every morning. You know, there's, there is sort of a, a religious experience in the offing, I feel. But uh, still to come, Yuri Geller. Lots more on Yuri Geller. Talk 24 clothing is real life ready. OK, so ready for my stroll to work? Yep. Ready for going to the match? That too. Walk it, walking the dog? Ready. A weekend hike? Yep. Ready for when I go to the gym? When you go to the gym. I said real life. Tog24. When it comes to the great British outdoors, you could say we're part of the fabric. For an extra 10% off, use the code PODCAST10 at checkout. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Nice to have your company. It's Wednesday. It's the 16th. Now, let me just warn you again, because we've had the yellow warning. and I just want to make sure that people are aware of it because, you know, people are denying the... Uh, the, the vaccine works and it's not been proven. I mean, there's some really mad people out there. But uh, when I tell you that the Met Office have issued a yellow warning, that's pretty severe. OK, and this is for Greater London. The yellow warning is of a thunderstorm with an S on the end of it from six o'clock this evening until they've said Thursday the 17th. But there is a, a chance it could run through Friday and a chance it could go to Sunday as well. They say homes and businesses could be flooded quickly. I mean, the people I feel sorry for are all the people who live by the river down in London. There's people in Walton-on-Thames and uh, places like that. This is, this is most of England because all the rain that goes up north, every time I see it up north and I go, oh, it's rain, I think that's going to come down here. And there was that, the dreadful story when they had the, big, the bad flooding some years ago down in Walton-on-Thames, which is very pretty, bits of it. And um, and this this young bloke had got um, got his, his first house. He he'd got a mortgage and then he got flooded. So, of course, the whole house was ruined with all the mud that came in and everything. Because you think, oh, it's water. Don't worry. He's only going to. No, no, no. It leaves the moment the water you know, disappears. You've then got all the mud and all the rest of it. So having got all that cleared up and he didn't have any insurance, which a lot of people don't don't bother about. Um, blow me down within four weeks. It was all back again. He, he got flooded a second time. So when I say there is a yellow warning of thunderstorms, you know, I mean, there is a small chance that they could be flooded quickly. But there is, you know, uh, damage that could come from lightning strikes, hail and strong winds. Also, there could be cancellations to trains and bus services, spray and sudden flooding. Because, you know, when, when it's when I mean, I've driven down the motorway when it snowed driving snow where you cannot see in front even the windscreen wipers on it doesn't make the slightest difference there, there is the slight chance you could have power cuts what they're doing is they're hedging their bets and saying listen it could be this we're not saying it won't be but it could be you know so when you actually look 
you know, at the at the country, it don't look too promising. So from six o'clock this evening, if you've got in your garden, you know, things like a trampoline, lots of these trampolines, if you get high winds, they take off. Literally, I've, I've seen it happening on these, you know, it'll be all right on the night type programmes and you know, the thing blooming takes off and you go, oh, lovely, as it smashes through your windows. No, you've got to be careful. If you, I mean, I think gardening stuff should be fine. It just means your hanging baskets will swing around a little bit more. But if you've got furniture, you know, luckily most of our, our furniture is OK. We, we, we don't need to worry about it going anywhere. It's never going to take off. And uh, But if you've got any umbrellas out in the garden, the big parasols, these things that go up to nine, ten foot across, make sure they're down and tied with a piece of string or a piece of cord or something so that the wind doesn't get underneath it and, and, and turn it into something quite, uh, quite dangerous. There you go. I just thought I'd tell you that now, just in case. I mean, I'm just erring on the side of caution. I mean, you never know. It might just be another heat wave for us and we'll all just sort of sit there. But I have a sneaking feeling that it won't. And as it doesn't get dark till about eight or nine o'clock now, you're going to be witnessing the full force of it, I should imagine, in the early hours of the morning. I'm going to get drenched tomorrow, aren't I? I could just I'm have to get my Macintosh out. Think of my hair. Look at that. The hair will be ruined. <laughs> uh, Steve, is Little Italy uh, reopened yet, says Martin. I think so. Yes, I think Little Italy is, uh, yes. In Soho, yes, definitely. They'd love to see people down there. They really would. Uh, Stephen Stockwell says, uh, Yuri Geller, huh, a, a close friend of Michael Jackson. Huh. Yes, he was the one who organised the interview, didn't he, with Martin Bashir, I believe. I'm sure that's what it was. But uh, there's something about Martin Bashir that I never liked. I found him a bit creepy. But then that's just, you know, I spend my life talking to people and and you can work people out fairly fairly quickly so when you see somebody on the the television who isn't very good Dan Wooten you know you do sort of look at them and you think really it's 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 just not good enough you know to, to be natural on television is a very difficult thing to be natural on radio is is even more difficult for some people because you people can spot something in your voice they can tell if you're being natural if, if you see them on television you can tell that they're doing the act you know, and uh, no auto cue on radio. No auto. I think auto cue is spelled A U T O. Uh, yeah, next page turnover. I've got it on the foot pedal. Uh, but that's it. But mainly, people sitting on the uh, the television are reading off a off a thing that's moving, and there's somebody sitting off camera you can't see who's got the keyboard in front of them, and they're turning a little thing to rotate the script for you. I told you when I worked on Channel 5 and I was doing the news for one of the channels, I think I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and it went into a Selena Scott programme for some peculiar reason. Anyway, we didn't see them, so it didn't make any difference. And we controlled our own auto cue. We had a button under the, uh, under the thing and you pushed it. And if you leant on the front of it, it moved it slowly. So you could do it at your own pace, which was very nice. So you could say the thing, thing is going to my father. And like that. unfortunately for me, I tap my foot. And at the beginning of the programme, the beginning of the news, it would do, you know, the news from blah, blah, blah. And the cameras would pan round in the studio and you'd be looking down. I don't know why we were looking down. Nothing to look at, apart from the script, which you kept there in case the auto queue collapsed. And, I, and then you would sort of look up as all the lights would come up in the studio. It was all terribly sophisticated. And I, I talked to it like a duck to water. That's what it sounded like as well. All the way through. And so, and I looked up and it had... And finally, the weather, because I'd been tapping the button so much, so I had to sit there staring like somebody who'd been caught in the headlights of, a, of an Eddie Stobart lorry on a back road down to Henley until I pushed the back button to get the thing back to begin. And they're all in my ear going, what are you doing? What are you doing? And of course, you can't say anything because you're totally governed by, uh, by the auto cue. So, you know, very difficult to do it. Uh, Steve, apart from Cristiano Ronaldo being such a dedicated footballer, trains a lot, breaking goal scoring records, really impressed me. Uh, there was an interview and he asked, why do you not have a tattoo? Answer, because I give blood three times a year. Can you not give, if you've got, if you've got tattoos, can you not give blood? I would have thought that people could... Mind you, perhaps it might, might be different over in uh, Italy. Uh, most emotional note, says Dave, I've ever received was a small card to me and my wife from my daughter on the morning of her wedding. It just said, thanks for everything. Couldn't have asked for better parents. That's what it's all about, isn't it? See, fathers are the ones who get affected by weddings because the mother's been involved in everything. Do the hair and the makeup and the dress and all the rest of it. Fathers are the ones who go, it's my little girl. It's my little girl. Uh, Shane says that my grandmother's... Funeral, it was uh, 
all right at the end of the service it was when I broke up. I couldn't stop crying. I know you suddenly realise that it's it's final. It's final. Have to wait a couple of days after getting a tattoo or piercing to give blood. Oh, right. Well, I don't have any piercings. Do you have any piercings, Joe? No. Bet you have secretly. Loads of tattoos. I know. I can imagine them all the way up your arm. <laughs> yeah, you've got me on there. Yeah, the picture of Steve Allen. Imagine a picture of Steve Allen <laughs> on your arm on a tattoo. Maybe not. Maybe not at all. Uh, so people tell me about the, uh, the temperatures and uh, how difficult it is. Uh, Vincent says, oh, ghastly, ghastly person. Worst thing about television is that uh, is that bloke. Yes, I know. Wasn't much cop as a journalist either. Uh, ta -ta -ta -da -da. Uh, when is Joe Allen's going to open, says Claire, I'm getting withdrawal symptoms. You're getting withdrawal symptoms. Blimey, how do you think I feel? I've been eating there for 37 years. You know, I'm, I'm one of the one of the old troopers. And uh, until the theatre's open properly, they can't really afford to open. I can't wait for it. What do you have to do to get thrown out of a Weatherspoons? Well, according to Molly Wood and Amy Lee, both 20 and obviously decide to dress like somebody who's going to dance around a pole, they were told their outfits were unacceptable. They don't allow men to go in there uh, shirtless in a Weatherspoons. I mean, they're, they're that fussy about it. So they were refused service by the manager who said they were in breach of the chain's dress code. The pair left, but Molly said, I was just really embarrassed. Oh, you can't have been, dear. Not dressed like that. Seriously, it is the cheapest, tackiest looking outfit I've ever seen. If you were dancing around a pole, love, I could understand it. But, you know, not in a, in a weather... I mean, they might as well have just taken all their clothes off and stood naked at the bar. Can't think of any other reason. They wanted to grab a bite to eat after watching the England-Croatia game. They were wearing halter neck tops. But, I mean, when I say halter neck tops, they've got flimsy bits of material just basically covering their breasts. You look trash. You know, and I, 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 that's why the manager refused... You, uh, you service at the bar. I wouldn't want you in there. People would think that the place had turned itself over. You'd have to change all the light bulbs to red. Ghastly. Eddie Gershon, spokesman for JD Weatherspoon, says what may be considered appropriate dress is a matter of individual judgment. Whilst no offence was intended, we support the approach of the pubs management team in this instance. She thinks so too. You see a picture of these two girls in the paper today. What an embarrassment they are to themselves. To themselves. I mean, turning up looking like that in a pub where people are drinking alcohol. What are you, stupid or something? Just absolute. I mean, cool. honestly, you can't believe it, can you? Uh, Wayne says, thank you for asking me, uh, Steve. I'm not furloughed, but thousands across the industry are. How the aviation industry is ever going to recover from this mess is a mystery. But, uh, well, I, I agree. I absolutely agree with you. I don't know how it's going to recover. I mean, what do we do? Wait another year, another two years, another three? Uh, how many years? And at the moment, ironically, they're showing a programme on Heathrow Airport, which was obviously filmed. They have to put at the end, this programme was filmed long before the uh, the pandemic. It's very interesting, but it just goes to show what people have to have to put up with at the airport. You know, when it was busy, 12 million passengers a week wandering through. And uh, no, not the Jeremy Spake one. Don't. Jeremy Spake, honestly. Jeremy Spake used to appear on this programme about the airport and he worked for Aeroflot. Was it Aeroflot? It was the Russian airline. And, uh, and the reason was Jeremy was larger than life, shall we say. He was very camp, and, but he spoke fluent Russian. So he was able to converse with people. I mean, it's quite a, quite a trick to better speak fluent Russian, you know. And he did it and they, they put him on there. And then he sort of became a minor celebrity, a very minor celebrity. But he was very fey. But, it, but he spoke Russian and he appeared on a programme on the television. And one of the team captains on the other side was uh, Julian Clary. <laughs> and Jerry Spake said at one point, and I know this because a friend of mine was working on the show, he said, uh, J Jeremy Spake said, oh, you know, my wife and I the other day, apparently <laughs> Julian Clary went, sorry, your wife, <laughs> and laughed. And Jeremy Spake got really upset, really upset, because obviously people had assumed, incorrectly, that, uh, that he sort of, you know, was sort of riding on the other side of the fence. And, uh, and he, he did a couple more little bits and pieces, and then he disappeared. But it was the fact that he spoke Russian that made him interesting because he would come and sort out these things and he used to have a habit of holding his hands in a certain way. And he was one of those celebrities that wandered through television and they all had their five minutes. It's a bit like, you know, the Molly Mays of this world and people who've been on Love Island. They have their five minutes and then we just dispense with them. It's a bit like 
Gemma Collins. Again, I watched it. I don't know how it came up in the thing again. She's sitting in a helicopter. There's four people in the helicopter. And, she, and then all of a sudden she goes, no, 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 I, I'm going to be sick. So they had to get her out. What a drama queen, honestly. But I mean, she's she's run out of things. There's, there's nothing. We've seen the act. You know, the act was falling down at those awards and disappearing from uh, everybody's view. That was the funniest thing ever. And, and the other thing was when she went out with Paul Little Arge in between his rehab stints. You know, where do we go from here? God knows. I think she needs to get a proper job. But what can she do? I'm Elizabeth Day, host of the podcast How to Fail, where I explore what failures my guests overcame and what that taught them about how to succeed. And when you need that extra bit of motivation, have you tried Peloton? It's a fitness experience for your body and mind, from cycling and running to strength pilates, meditation and boot camps. There is something for everyone. I can personally speak to that with my own Peloton membership. I always look forward to the various workouts and best of all, you can fit them into your own schedule. That should give you more time to catch the bonus Peloton episode with Joe Elvin on my podcast, How to Fail with Elizabeth Day. Listen now on Global Player. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Still trying to get over the fact that two people thrown out of a weather spoon. When they say thrown out, I don't think they bodily pick them up and threw them out. Although, to be honest with you, when you see the, the picture, you'll, you'll, you'll think to yourself, you're a bit sad and tragic. You know, mind you, they are... Molly fumed. She, she's a tech worker. And uh, uh, he said, this is the, the manager, you can't come in here. You're dressed really inappropriately and it isn't suitable. You also told her he had also refused to serve men with no shirts on. Yes, exactly. Of course, you don't want to go into some pub where there's some people with no shirts on and people dress like her. You know, go to Amsterdam, dear. They'll welcome you with open arms, but not a weather spoons. Thank you very much indeed. Molly claims she was served in the same pub whilst wearing the same outfit a week earlier. Ugh, dirty. The same outfit. How awful. I mean, at least, I mean, it just looks, you look cheap. Cheap. You know, if you're going out, dear, at least try and have some decorum, for goodness sake. Give up, don't you, completely. Uh, so, uh, the, the Queen fighting back. Uh, Jane Moore says in her column today, the Queen is right to correct Harry when he crosses the line. Absolutely. Because nobody's ever, you know, told him off. I've said this before a million times. This is the reason he is the way he is, a petulant little child. He's never going to grow up because nobody's ever, you know, there's been nobody around. You know, Charles wouldn't say anything. Charles would never sort of criticise his son. He, he wasn't that sort of person. Coronation Street's uh, Jack P. Shepherd has revealed that he's screwed up his chance of becoming a Hollywood superstar. You know, he's had a hair transplant. He had, he had this sort of... I don't know what it is, whether it's a weave or you blow dry it in or something. It's Gail's son, yes. Yes. He, he, he plays David Platt. But he missed out on a part in Billy Elliot to Jamie Bell. Well, that was the gift, Jamie Bell. I mean, what a, what a stunning actor and dancer and what a cracking film. And, uh, and that's why we love the, um, the stage show as well. But Jack revealed... He says, when I was like 11 or 12, and I'd obviously been for an audition, I was gutted in the sense I didn't get it because of the success that the film went on to achieve. Yeah, but you don't know that, do you? When you make a film, you don't know if it's going to be very successful. You don't know uh, if, if it's going to work. But I've interviewed Jamie Bell on a couple of occasions. He's quite charming. He's quite charming. And I loved the film. And I loved all the people in it. I thought it was fantastic. But the stage show, I loved even more. I didn't think it was possible for me to sit down and weep. Weep, 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 weep. That's what I do nowadays. I just cry a lot. I did it yesterday when I was having my eyes tested. <laughs> but somebody said, uh, Stella says, that eye test that, that squirts that puff of air into your eyes to test you for glaucoma. I was amazed that at the end, he was, uh, he was, he was very complimentary. I said, I don't need to see you for, uh, for another nine months. I thought, he really hates me. But they were really good in there. In the Kingston Hospital, it's just that you've got to go in and you can't wear your own mask. They give you a mask. They, they sort of swap your mask. You keep your mask, obviously, but they give you one of those paper ones, the blue paper ones. And, um, and so you sometimes had to take it off for the, for the eye thing. But no, they, they, they seem quite pleased. I was very, very grateful. Uh, Martin Bashir, again, Martin Bashir misled Michael Jackson and set off a chain of events that led to his death, it was claimed last night. Jackson's former lawyer, Brian Oxman, says the reporter duped the star into thinking he'd make a positive film, but then induced him to comment on sleeping with kids. Dear me. He says Bashir exploited Michael's kindness to let him into his home with his family, but he did it with deception. 
It's unbelievable, isn't it? Martin Bashir goes from up here to way down there. Way down there. And the circus boss, who's offering a £1,000 reward to help reunite a clown with his beloved stolen shoes. Wallace and Moo was left devastated after a thief swiped the giant custom-made whoppers from his dressing room before a performance. In Scumthorpe, the 21-year-old from Brazil stars as Wallace and the Clown has been doing his act for eight years. He said, I'm passionate about my job. I've been performing the same as always, but I know something is missing. I don't know why somebody would want to steal clown shoes. I designed them myself. Joe McMullen, who works at Planet Circus... OMG said the circus boss is offering a thousand pound reward for the return of the stolen clown shoes. You see, I like that. You know, the circus boss is doing something for one of the artists there. You know, that that's when you know you've achieved those those dizzy heights. Uh, the Flying Scotsman due to leave uh, KX eight twenty tomorrow uh, morning. What's KX? Oh, King's Cross. Oh, how stupid. Eight twenty is it? The Flying Scotsman. Oh. That'll be nice. I'm sorry, I, I could nip down after the show, I suppose. I wonder if it'll be going through Richmond. I wonder if it's going through Richmond. So if it's lit, because it, it's been through before, and it was one of the most exciting things in my life, because you know I, I like a good railway, and people were looking out the windows and waving and everything. I, I was shouting, Daddy, my Daddy, and nobody took a blind bit of notice of me. So uh, it, was, it, was, it, all got, it came through with all this steam belching out and smoke and everything else. So where's it going at 8.20? Isn't it funny you get excited over the stupidest of things? Seriously, it's something really daft, sort of like a train. How can you fall for a train? You know, unfortunately, I just do. Uh, Shane says, I watch classic Coronation Street on my phone. It's on in the afternoon at 3 p.m. It's a free app. It's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. Uh, I mean, classic Coronation Street, you suddenly realise half the people you're watching don't even exist anymore, which was a shame. We're trying to find out the root of the... Uh, of the uh, of the train, the Flying Scotsman. So it's going to leave at 8.20. Well, that'll encourage all you train spotters out there, of which I know I have many, many people who like going down and watching the train. I mean, that, that's a train worth seeing, isn't it? Out of all the trains, it's going to Cambridge. Oh, it's not very exciting, is it? Is it, is it fully booked? Can, can you book a ride on it? And then, then Norwich. Can you imagine if you're, if you're the, uh, I didn't really said the pilot, if you're the train driver on that, the excitement, the, because all the way along the route, there'll be people going, the Flying Scotsman's coming through here tomorrow morning. And, you know, kids will be there and, and mums and dads and train spotters and people who just want to take photographs of it. Because to, to actually watch it in full flight, as it were, is one of the most exciting things you'll ever see. It's just, it's beautiful. It's stunningly beautiful. Steam, yes. Steam, yes, steam. <laughs> Good Lord above, honestly. How old-fashioned. How old-fashioned. Uh, uh, Steve, very sad to hear the passing of the oldest lion in the Kenyan Masamara. Uh, he was Scarface, 14 years old. I don't know what that is in lions. But once lions, if they've got a pride, I've seen this on the Attenborough programmes, lions, uh, if they become ill or lame, the pride leave them. Because what happens is other lions will come in and try and take over the pride. They will kill the lion cubs because they're not theirs and they will start up a new family again. It's, it's very brutal and very wicked, but it's very much the, the law of the land. And, uh, and I've seen lions before who've been attacked by other lions trying to take over and they go away battle scarred and then the pride move on and they they basically leave them and they just get weaker and weaker and weaker until they just collapse and then they they die it's all very sad and tragic but it's the law of the jungle which is why i'm not living in the jungle that's why i decided to uh, to keep twicking them i had a mouse in my airing cupboard steve caught it in a trap i reset it just in case there were there were two seven mice later still reads oh God, listen what do they say that m a pair of mice can have how many hundreds of babies in the course of a year? It's something phenomenal. It's, it's like 500 in the course of a year. So you can imagine in Australia, but they've got mice coming out of their pockets. There's millions of them. So there you go. So mice are breeding machines. They have a gestating period of 19 to 21 days. A female mouse gets pregnant about five to 10 times a year and can give birth to a litter of up to 14 pups so work that out so, so how many 
140 a year. On average, the litter size ranges from six to eight. But uh, you, imagine if there's sort of 20 or 30 mice and they're all at it, like mice, uh, then you're going to end up with an awful lot at the end of the year. And so, you know, to have seven and still resetting the trap is, uh, is not that unusual. Steve, my friend's doing his preservation steam engine licence. He was the driver on the Flying Scotsman on Saturday when it went to King's Cross, says Pete. Oh, uh, that's a nice job to have, isn't it? Very dirty, though. I'd want to wear a white shirt and a hat or something with Casey Jones on it. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I've just i never been on that. I mean, I'm, I quite fancy the Orient Express, but then apparently have murders on that, so I'm not doing that one yet. You've got to be very careful. People fall out with you on the Orient Express. But I like the idea of sitting on there. And also, eating food at speed is very appealing. I used to, when they used to have proper restaurant cars on trains out of King's Cross and Euston, I would always book a seat in the in the in the restaurant car have breakfast because then you got the seat for the whole journey and that was lovely because you, you got a breakfast and you just keep ordering food and things like that cup of tea and then stare out the window having a nice time you know but uh, you might be doing that today you might be going down there to actually uh, watch it. i mean actually it's a good time now to get i mean look at it, it's half past five coming up very shortly so now is a good time to get yourself ready paul gascoigne is staying straight oh also need to wear anything but straight. Uh, oh, due to his obsessive compulsive disorder. The recovering alcoholic says OCD drives him to keep all his possessions in strict lines. What's the matter with that? I don't have any problem with that at all. And here she is, the jihadi bride Shamima Begum said she was a dumb kid when she joined the Islamic State and once again begged to come home. Yes. Uh, as she was walking down the street seeing the headless bodies from all the lampposts. That didn't seem to affect her at all, did it? So obviously not that dumb, but then she, she, she's tried doing it with the hijab and then she's uh, now wearing baseball cap jeans and no hijab. She says, I wear these clothes and I don't wear a hijab because it makes me happy. We're not falling for it, love. Nobody's falling for it. I'm afraid nobody would trust you as far as I could throw them. Uh, John Bishop has paid tribute to his beloved dog, Bilko, who's died. He's saying, you know, God, I loved it. People do love their dogs, don't they? People love their dogs. He wrote on Instagram after the death of his English Bull Terrier. He says, thank you for all your uh, your messages. So uh, so there you go. That's quite nice. Dawn Neesom's talking about Shamima Begum, who's gone from shrouded death cult supporter to a walking advert for Primark with an addiction to Jay-Z and the Kardashians. We know this because she's given another interview from the prison camp in Syria, where she's been since the fall of the Islamic State. She's complained about, you know, when she stole a passport money and managed to navigate her way to a war zone. You know, she says, can I come home, pretty please? We don't want you, dear. We really don't want you. And it's designed, says Dawn Neeson, to tick every sympathy-earning vote box going. Fully expected her to add she's got a place on the new series of Love Island and a TikTok account with a million followers. Instead, of course, she denied she needed rehabilitation and in true Miss World style said she wanted to help others. Yep. Making the world a better place by throwing gay men off tall buildings, beheading charity workers, and as for those pesky airline pilots, well, just lock them in a cage and set fire to them, dear. That'll do the trick. Hashtag be kind. I mean, she's absolutely hit the nail on the head. Absolutely hit the nail on the head. We're not falling for it. You've already been told we don't want you back here. We've taken away your citizenship. OK, what is it about? No, you're not understanding. So what do you want to do when you're older, they ask? Not that question again. If one thing's for sure, it's okay not to be sure. Because there's education and training in areas you may not have even thought of. From artificial intelligence, to genetics, to aerospace engineering. Get the jump on the skills employers are looking for, whether T-level, apprenticeship, or higher technical qualification. Search Get the Jump and see what's out there for you. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning to Faye Barker. She says, morning, Steve. I have a foot pedal for my auto cue in the mornings. A bit like driving a car. If I push it too quickly or accidentally go into reverse, things can go very wrong very quickly. I was always told, Faye, uh, to, to have scripts in front of you so that if the auto cue went down, you could revert to the script in front of you. But of course, I, I was a bit bad at turning over the pages. So I'd be reading something I'd probably already read twice before. But uh, yeah, those 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 foot pedals. But uh, still very glam, Faye. She's a presenter and reporter at ITV News, as you know. And uh, she said, when I got married in 2007, my dad did a toast to perseverance. It makes me laugh now. And it turned out to be great advice. 
But it is true, actually, isn't it? But dads are always the ones who get emotional at, at weddings. My little girl, my little girl. Watch Steel Magnolias to realise that the father is the proudest man under the sun and the, and the mother just frets and worries. But she, she was a wonder, she really was. Poem, poem for today. It's by uh, KGL. I don't know what it is either, don't even ask me. It's called Darling, I'm a Thunderstorm. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm, and my rain pelts down harsher than the words you spit in vehement violence. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm, and my lightning strikes brighter than the empty promises you made. Brighter, but just as fleeting. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm, and my rage is vast, immeasurable, filling oceans with its ferocity. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm, and this too will pass, leaving chaos in its wake. There you go. Darling, I'm a thunderstorm. What do you make of that? <laughs> just go... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 24 minutes to uh, to six. I've just read a story, says Mo. Yes, about the, the world's largest family. 38 wives, 89 children. The bloke died the other day. He died the other day, but he, uh, he obviously comes from... Uh, a uh, a community where you can marry loads of people, but he's he's got eighty nine children. That's an awful lot, isn't it? Uh, Wayne says, "I thought you'd like this picture. This is my my trolley dolly." He says, "Thought you'd like the picture of the Flying Scotsman and the dozens of tracks outside King's Cross." I said, "There's something appealing." I know people say that, you know, they were sort of the steam belching and smoke everywhere, but I mean, it's just it's all. It takes on water, you know, and it turns it into steam, and the steam powers the engine. And there it is. Lovely picture. Lovely, lovely picture. Thank you very much indeed, Wayne. What are baby mice called? Oh, um, they're called pups. I don't know why they're called pups. And uh, Wayne says, nice one, Steve. Syria can keep her. Yeah, we don't want her back. I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. I don't even know her. But she was devious enough as a child. She wasn't a, She was not a case of being dumb. She was devious. Very devious. Got married, had children. Sadly, they all died, and uh, and then she was appearing in a in a hijab. Now she's ditched that. Now she's gone all westernised. You know, please, pretty please, she goes, pretty please, let me come back home. No, darling, no. I mean, can you imagine the implications if something went horribly wrong and she, you know, as is so indoctrinated with ISIS and things like that? I mean, it could be a disaster for us. Totally. We don't want to put ourselves at risk. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Shane says the Flying Scotsman came to Australia in 1988. Sydney was its main base. It went all over Australia. It was a very big success. That was for their bicentenary. Wow. You're trying to work out how they got that. Have you not seen it where they the, there's a company in this country where they transport trains on the back of low loaders? Trains the size of the Flying Scotsman. They actually took one up to a, a sort of a meet. And it has to negotiate. And it's, this, it's enormous. Don't ever get stuck behind it. Today's poem, apt ahead of tomorrow's weather. That's why we picked it. We didn't just do this, you know, on, on a whim. No, we, we know all about uh, thunderstorms because we're going to be getting them. Not, not for tomorrow, for today. Six o'clock this evening. Steve, I swapped my white transit van for a pink Volkswagen, says Mark. I wanted a camper van. Old one. There you go. The Flying Scotsman uh, in Australia. And uh, perhaps one of the most iconic steam locomotives. Visited Australia in 88, 89 for a series of events associated with the bicentennial celebrations. 30 years on, it's, it's uh, currently owned by the National Railway Museum. That lovely. I love things like that. I think it looks really nice. And also Australia is so big. So big. I'd have to have the windows open, wouldn't you? Imagine the heat out there. Steve, absolutely nothing wrong with getting emotional about seeing a train as famous as the Flying Scotsman. After all, it's probably the most famous train in the world, says Dan, a triumph of Victorian engineering. It is. Well, I mean, I, I always, <laughs> I've said it before. In the railway children, there's a bit where... The train comes round and the kids will all rush to the end of the field, sit on the thing and wave at the train. This time, as the train comes round the corner, all the passengers are out the window waving because they, they know that the kid's father has just been released from prison. And, um, and, and, that's, they were all, and I get quite emotional at just that bit. I want to be sitting on that fence. <laughs> uh, dear. Uh, 84850, stevedlbc.co.uk. Oh, yes. Dozier. 
dozy. I was going to tell you about this one because you might not, unless you are, uh, like myself, a music fan. And when, when you grew up in my day, you were either a fan of heavy metal, things like Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and all that kind of stuff, or, uh, and they all wore leather jackets and dirty, filthy jeans and they rode motorbikes and stuff like that, or you were somebody who loved reggae or Tamala Motown or Stax or any of that stuff, and I was a Tamala Motown boy. I grew up on Tamala Motown. I would go out to a shop in Newbury called Tumas, uh, which sold lawnmowers, but at the very back they, they had a, a record shop and I'd be found in there most Saturdays and you'd go, they'd go, you'd go have, have you got any of the, the latest? And they, they'd have a list up of the latest music that had come out and they'd say, well, there's a new Supreme song, You Can't Hurry Love. You go, oh, can I hear that one? And they'd go, Booth 3. And they'd have some turntables at the back and they'd put it on and push the button for Booth 3. And you'd stand in there listening to it and then you'd decide if you wanted to buy it. That's how it went on. And so for Lamont Dozier, who celebrates his birthday today, he co-wrote dozens dozens of Motown hits for the Supremes, the Four Tops, the Isley Brothers and others. He had 14 US number ones, including Baby Love, Where Did Our Love Go and Reach Out, I'll Be There. So when you look through them, stuff for Martha and the Vandellas, Heat Wave, uh, The Miracles, Mickey's Monkey, uh, also Martha and the Vandellas again. The Supremes had loads uh, go back, go back, Supremes, 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 there, uh, where they had, uh, well, I've lost the blooming thing now, where's he gone to? When the Love Light Starts Shining Through His Eyes. He also did uh, Just Ain't Enough Love for Eddie Holland. Uh, Marvin Gaye's How Sweet It Is To Be Loved By You. Uh, I mean, just nowhere to run, nowhere to run, Martha and the Vandellas. The Four Tops, I Can't Help Myself, Sugar Pie, Honey Bunch. It's the same old song, which was a big hit for the Weathermen, but the Isley Brothers had it first. Junior Walker and the All-Stars, Roadrunner. That was one of my favourite. That was one of my favourite songs. That and Smokey Robinson's Tears of a Clown, uh, which I thought was fantastic. Written by Stevie Wonder, I believe. The Miracles come around here, Standing in the Shadows of Love, Four Tops. Love is here and now you're gone. Jimmy Mack, Third Finger Left Hand. Bernadette, I could go back and listen. There's a ghost in my house. Remember Ardeen Taylor's? There's a ghost in my house. All from the pen of Lamont Dozier. And they were so successful. Chairman of the board, Everything's Tuesday. Frida Payne's Band of Gold. Chairman of the board, You've Got Me Dangling on a String. It Ain't Love, It Don't Matter, The Glass Family. Stop the World and Let Me Off, The Flaming Ember. Westbound number nine by The Flaming Ember. Catching the westbound number nine. Oh, it's taken me back, honestly. I'm so sorry. My singing is not the best, but at least, I, at least I've got guts. And it was all of that. I mean, literally tons and tons and tons. And when you look at, you know, all of these songs in 1980, he moved to the UK to work with acts like Alison Moyer and Simply Red, whose lead singer Mick Hucknall called Dozier one of the greatest legends in pop music. He's 80 today, Lamont Dozier, you know, and the happiest of birthdays for somebody who brought, well, certainly me. Oh, I nearly cried. Uh, so much pleasure. So much pleasure, you know, when you look at all these hits. I mean, the biggest hits. And what did we say? 14 US number ones. 14 US number ones. And uh, and I think he's here. He's in this, this country. I think he lives here now. So many happy returns of the day. I hope you have the happiest of birthdays, knowing that, my God, he must be on some, some money coming in at the end of each year. Yeah, the royalties. If, if Noddy Holder is doing very well just with, It's Christmas! Lamont Dozier must be even better. Never interviewed him. Never interviewed him. I wish I had done. Wish I had done because, I, as I say, such a big fan of Tamala Motown and all recorded at the Motown studios, which were tiny. And um, the amount of people I've spoken to who recorded in there, uh, you know, Martha Reeves and all the people there when Michael Jackson was a little kid and would come and, uh, and sort of share his sandwiches and things like that. They'd all be sitting outside, then they'd bring them in. And, uh, and they would, yeah, Jackson 5 from Motown, absolutely. Yeah, and it was, but Michael Jackson, even at the early age, he was the one who was going to emerge as the, as the star of it, you know. And they ended up, but I've interviewed a few members of the, of the Jackson 5. It was, it was just, just brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. You cannot, you cannot take away from Motortown Motown, you know, what well, they used to say because what they used to make cars in uh, in Motown land, De Motown, Motown, the Motown sound. It was Detroit, Michigan, and they had this room which was 
not very big and they crammed all the musicians in and everybody played their hearts out. And uh, when I spoke to Martha Reeve, she said it was quite something. I said, I'd love to have been there. I'd love to have been there where they were playing all these uh, original songs. Fantastic. Steve, how did the Flying Scotsman get across the sea to Oz? Have you heard of ships? I don't know whether or not they're, they're familiar in your part of the uh, neck of the woods. Yes. Uh, I did go to the record centre in Rainers Lane because that was near where Dale lived. So he was he was much bigger into his uh, music, uh, you know, than I was. Uh, Steve, I made a mistake when I was 15. The mistakes you make at 15 are dyeing your hair, trying cigarettes, sneaking your dad's booze, not flying to Syria to join ISIS. Yes, I'd have to agree with you. I couldn't disagree. Leadership is about staying one step ahead. That's why the first ever all-electric BMW i5 comes with proactive care, technology that monitors your vehicle and proactively initiates contact with you when something requires action. That way, we're there before you need us. Discover the joy of moving forward. Reserve your test drive at bmw.co.uk. Test drive subject to applicant status and availability. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, nice to have your company. Beano's in Croydon was a fabulous record shop. Yes, we used to use Beano's on the programme uh, many years ago on LBC. Uh, and people would phone up with their records and uh, he, would, he would value them. But we could always tell if somebody had, had told a fib about something because a lot of people would phone up and say, oh, I've got, um, I've got a record, it's all signed by the Beatles. And uh, David Lashmar, used to, who was the, the guest used to come in, he said, uh, he said, were you there when they signed it? And they went, no, because all the Beatles signed for each other. So in other words, if they'd completed a show in London and Paul was off and uh, John was off, they, they went off clubbing or wherever they went, the other two could sign for them. And so you had to you had to check that it really was a genuine signature. We used to have on, uh, somebody on called Poppy from Fraser's, the autograph people. And she could always she could look at an, at, at a, at an autograph and say uh, two of them have been done by somebody else. The girls in the office used to be able to sign for the Beatles uh, in the Apple office. And they had auto pen as well, which was a Japanese invention, I think. And that would that would do an autograph in ink. So, of course, it looked even more or more genuine. But you could tell if they were auto penned because every single autograph looked exactly the same. Didn't uh, didn't change. Uh, we live, Steve, near the Bluebell Railway. The Flying Scotsman uh, has passed through for special events. Manic. That's uh, P and Laura. Narnia. How lovely. You see, I think that's nice to live near near stuff like that. Don't you? I mean, I'm 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 very much a, a fan of of history and even even if I if I go back to the Tower of London or Hampton Court Palace, I love to walk around and immerse myself in it, thinking, you know, this is this is what it was like years and years ago. And it's, it's not changed. Uh, a couple of years ago, Steve, we did the North Yorkshire Railway journey, departing from uh, Grossmount to Gothland near Pickering. We had champagne lunch. It was excellent says Rob from Hatfield, sitting in the Pullman carriages. Lovely memories. It is, it's, it's nice to do special things like that. It's very nice to do something that you remember for a long time. I've, I've done things over the years. I've been to places and seen things which have stuck with me and they'll hopefully stick with me, you know, to, for the rest of my days. Elizabeth in Finchley says, so wonderful, Steve, hearing you talking about Lamont Dozier. Agree with you 100%. Oh, what? what what phenomenal talent, Elizabeth. Brought back so many lovely memories. So many of those songs. That was just a small selection of what they wrote. And I used to... Uh, uh, Tamla Motan, you'd get that black label and you'd put it on the turn, and you'd put the needle on it. And then it would... Oh, so the orchestrations were absolutely fantastic. Have you any idea what Tamla means? Uh, as you knew that Motown was Motortown. Oh, it's only because they had... Um, uh, a thing they when they did a documentary they went uh, uh, Tamala Motown Motortown Detroit City Michigan Motown this is the Motown sound and so that's what I always knew but when I've when I've spoken to people who um, worked for Tamala Motown it was a very small operation it just it went global Black Sabbath fan says Gary in West Sussex always had big army overcoats from the surplus store and was six formers I was the same as you Motown. I know it was it was like when you went to the fun fair, there were certain rides that were for the people who liked the heavy metal music. And that would be the waltzer. You know, if, if you were into Tamla Motown, you'd be on the Dodgems. 
I don't know why. It's just that the, the people who worked the waltzers were always sort of like, always looked a bit big and rough and everything like that. It's probably all changed a lot, actually. Uh, Steve says, Lawrence, I can't wait to see the front page pictures of Jordan's new sponsored veneers and the facelift. Well, it's so marvellous, isn't it? She's writing a book, which she's flogging at the moment, or somebody's written it for her. And, uh, and she doesn't even bother taking Harvey on holiday. She's had three in about the last few months. But uh, there again, she's marvellously talented. Uh, Steve, have you been to the Bluebell Railway in East Sussex? It's brilliant. You can ride on steam trains. I haven't, actually. I haven't. I, I like things like that. I did buy um, a DVD once. And I think it was it was on steam trains. And I think it might have been on the Flying Scotsman because there's all these preservation societies all over the place. And these these people devote their time. Pete Waterman loves trains. He loves trains. He really does. I think he owned a very famous one at some point. But uh, there's still a huge interest in stuff like that. It makes us a bit quaint, doesn't it? It's like all the Americans think that we all live in a merchant ivory film. They think that we all go round, you know, and all the ladies curtsy and things like that. But, of course, it's, it's completely different. Uh, Dawn Neeson talking about uh, somebody called uh, Bryn Roberts. Evidently, he's head of law and governance at North Tyneside Council. Has thrown a hissy fit, says Dawn, over a display of union flags in council buildings, declaring it not appropriate and overly political. He demanded it be removed before too many fellow snowflakes also melted in a fit of permanently offended vapours. It's our national flag, for God's sake, says Dawn. Get a bloody grip. It's true, isn't it? Why do, I mean, you know, people moan about everything nowadays. Absolutely everything. And uh, here's a picture. Of, oh, it's a picture of Nicole Scherzinger. And why have we got a picture of Nicole Scherzinger? Because Ginge and Whinge are trying to hire their PR guru. Uh, American Ollie Ailing has worked with the former Pussycat Doll for seven years. He's responsible for her cringy yoghurt advert that pretty much turned eating a Muller corner into a sex act. God knows what dairy products the former American actress and her henpecked hubby have in mind. But a saucer of very sour milk springs to mind. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Uh, more than a quarter of Brits can't change a light bulb. Please tell me that's wrong. Please tell me that's wrong. Over a third rely on decorators and a similar amount get somebody in to clean the oven. Yes, there are oven cleaning companies. They will come round and clean your oven if you can't do it. And, I mean, for somebody not to be able to change a light bulb. I mean, I could change light bulbs. It's the standing on a ladder I'm not very good at. And definitely. Oh, and also strawberries... How do you eat strawberries? OK, you go and buy a box of strawberries. You peel back the wrapping on the top. You take them and you either put them straight in your mouth. Try not to eat the green bit or the stalk. Or you dip them in cream. Or apparently balsamic vinegar I've had before now. Or, or chocolate, which is not very good for you at all. But according to William Hansen, who's a so-called etiquette expert, don't you just hate them? Don't you just hate them? It was like, you know, Princess Tippy Toes telling you how to fold a towel. No, thank you. Etiquette experts. William Hansen says they should be eaten with a fork and not our fingers. William Hansen obviously doesn't get out very often. You'd hate Wimbledon, dear. Uh, discarding stems in the top left of the plate is also a must, but pouring cream instead of spooning over the fruit is a no-no. Oh, honestly, nothing worse than pretentious wallies. William, who compiled the guide for a, a company, says, Frankly, I wasn't shocked there wasn't already a dedicated guide on the etiquette of eating one of the most British of fruits. It's important to eat strawberries elegantly. Well, you've not come around anybody's place recently. Oh, you can imagine it. Well, we've got strawberry. Oh, don't invite William, for God's sake. He'll be the bore of all bores. Poor soul. Tom Kerridge says, Washing dirty dishes in a busy pub and restaurant is a highly skilled job. Of course it is. But also, you shouldn't have to wash them. Most people have got machines. You put them in there and it's called a dishwasher, yes. Here we go, Love Island's former failure, Olivia Atwood, reckons the new series could be the raunchiest yet, yes. It gave us you. And uh, as I say, lots and lots and lots of publicity about uh, Olivia Atwood, but uh, very little action. Just another dreary, I'm afraid, that you'll have to put up within the newspapers because while, the, while they've got, you know, agents who sort of promote them, it's a, it's a little bit of a short-lived job. I mean, let's face it, look at poor old, as I say, Jordan, down on her uppers, isn't she? No money at all. That's why she's getting, I'm assuming, she must be getting the uh, cosmetic surgery for, for, for diddly squat or a good discount. We don't know, but she's mentioned the clinic. Why would you mention the clinic? That, to me, smacks of payola. I think so. If I if I was mentioning, you know, Rolls Royces and Bentleys all the time, people have, been, people have written into me saying, do you get them for free then? And I go, yeah, and? 
There's no evidence, of course, of me getting anything for free. Huh? <laughs> Nigel's listening. He will he will definitely be uh, testifying to that one. Steve, you can try a, a rail via rail journey over four days from Toronto to Vancouver. Five thousand pounds. Sheila, it would have to be blooming luxury for five thousand pounds. Saturday mornings were record shop time for so many of us. My shop of choice was Small Wonder Records. In Walthamstow, punk Indian New Wave, The Cure, recorded their first single, The Small Wonder, and the owner, Pete, was a legend. If you wanted to hear a new record, it always cost a cigarette. If you didn't like a record, he'd tell you in no uncertain terms, says Kevin the Milkman. We used to go to uh, Contempo, which was just at the bottom of uh, Tottenham Court Road, and you'd go up this flight of stairs it was into this sort of like back room and he, they'd have all these 12 inch records. That was the first place I bought the Beach Boys and, and they did a disco number, a disco number. It's called something about the night. I think it was called the night, the Beach Boys. And, and Dale, Dale bought it on 12 inch. So I better buy it on 12 inch. Never managed to get anybody to dance the blooming thing, but it was a very good song. Very good song. Anyway, listen, we've got the, uh, the news coming up at six o'clock already. First record I ever bought, Steve says Maxime, was This Old Heart of Mine by the Isley Brothers. Oh, I agree. I agree. I mean, put away anything that they did, but my favourite group would be the Four Tops. Favourite group. And the Supremes were quite good until they shoved two at the back and then one went to the front. And that was called Diana Ross. If ever there was a lady who could have a tantrum, she'd be it. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. By Jove. If, I tell you, if Tamla Motown had had that orchestra that played that jingle, they could have been a bit more successful. They really could. Uh, Berry Gordy. I had a lot to answer for, but it was fantastic. Uh, great to hear you talking about Tamala Motown and Newbury, says Frank. I sometimes bought my records in the House of Tumor as well, but I mostly went upstairs at WH Smith's on the bridge in Northbrook Street. Yeah. I used to work over the road in Camp Hobson. Mr. Camp and Mr. Hobson started a, a department store. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. And I, I worked in there. That was my first... My first job, I think. I think it was one of my first jobs. Yes, I was uh, I was selling carpets. And then I discovered I didn't want to go home every day covered in fluff. So you spend all the time with sellotape in your hands, patting off all the fluff that you used to get from the carpets, of which there was tons of it. And then I worked in soft furnishing departments with Miss Plum, who was this enormous woman, but she would sort of, you know, always a bag of sweets, always a bag of sweets. <laughs> <laughs> Which was lovely. Yeah, a bit like me. Uh, spooning the cream out, Steve, rather than pouring it, isn't actually a bad idea if the cream is in a jug. Oh, who gets as far as putting cream in a jug? You just rip the lid off it and pour it. God, I've never put cream in a jug. It prevents not knowing what to do when it drips off the spout. When you put it down after pouring it, I usually use my finger to wipe it off the spout and then, oh, no. Well, you don't share it with other people, do you, after you've licked it? Oh, goodness, no. No, but I've never, I've never put cream into a jug. I know you get little milk jugs if you're going to have a posh cup of afternoon tea, but uh, but cream, no, you just take it out and slop it. And I tell you, that uh, that uh, cream that they've got in Marks and Spencer's, the strawberry clotted cream, is actually very nice. Make yourself ill on that, I mean, if you had enough of it. <laughs> they also do a cheese with Marmite impregnated in it. Yeah, I haven't haven't quite got as far as that one yet. Might try that another one. Today it's, it's, uh, it's, it's watering plants, even though... At six o'clock this evening, the heavens are going to open and we're going to... I mean, I don't know how bad it's going to be. I'm just telling you that the Met Office have issued a yellow warning, isn't it? They call it a yellow warning. Yeah, there you go. It's cream cheese and Marmite, M&S Foods. Cheese Marmite. Have you heard of such a thing? I hadn't either. I, don't, I tell you what I did buy the other day and I, I, I liked them, so I ate all of them. I bought some Tiger Rolls. Are they called Tiger Rolls? Yeah, but they, these are from Iceland. They were a pound for four which I thought was 25 pence a roll. I thought that was quite nice. And uh, they, it was delicious. The bread tasted delicious. S semi crispy, semi crispy. And, uh, and I, I just did them with sandwich spread. I'm very sad on the sandwich bread. Uh, Steve, Challenger and Hicks in Dartford was great for rock vinyl in the 80s, sadly long gone. All these places go. All these, all these places disappear. When, you know, the places that you used to go to when you were when you were younger, and especially after COVID, I mean, what's, I mean, nightclubs, how are they surviving? There was a bloke on the television the other day and he, his nightclub could hold 1,600 people. Well, I mean, how can you have a nightclub socially distancing? You can't, it's just not possible. So we'll have to wait and see. I used to go to our price records in Ilford when Ilford was nice. Oh, I used to go to Ilford a lot. It's where my grandmother lived in Ilford. And our price, they went years ago, didn't they? 
it was always run by students. Also, you go in there, it'd be some sort of long haired weirdo with tattoos and everything else. But no, a lot of places disappeared. And especially after after Covid places, our price bought by. Oh, was it really? Our price. I remember it. I used to go to the one in Staines and you go in there. But it, it was mainly catering for sort of, you know, sort of rock people. I, th I don't think they actually catered for me at all. But uh, the, but interesting, somebody mentioned W.H. Smith's in Northbrook Street in Newbury, because I used to go to the upstairs there, but I preferred Toomer's. Toomer's was actually better. And I can't remember where I used to get all my record. Probably Toomer's, I should, I should imagine. But I used to drive up from Newbury all the way down the M4 motorway. That's a boring drive. Wouldn't wish that on anybody. You know why? Because you get to Reading and then all of a sudden the lights go. And so you're driving on a motorway at night. Nothing at all. Pitch black. You're just watching the white line. I used to have to have all the windows open, cigarettes on and all the rest of it in the days when I smoked. My mother used to make apple, cheese and Marmite sandwiches to take to nursery, says Rachel. Oh, apple, cheese and Marmite. Actually, I'm told apple and cheese goes quite well. I think what they should do is make a, an apple spread. <laughs> all these convenience foods. We're not supposed to be eating convenience foods. Jane says you should visit Steve Keithley Worth Valley Railway, KWVR, which is where the railway children was filmed and still runs a steam train along its track. Do you think you could really stand on the station and go, Daddy, my daddy? Do you think you could get away with it? Or would people look at you rather sadly, pity in their eyes? Uh, love Motown too, Steve. I used to go to the Royalty Nightclub in Southgate. Wearing my flares with four button waistband, says Mike in Kings Langley. Tank top and pop. Oh, a tank top. Tank tops. You've aged me. You've aged me now. I used to love stuff like that. But the railway, Keithley and, and Worth. Now, uh, that's, if, if memory serves, that's a standard gauge, isn't it? Is it a standard gauge line? Uh, and I think it, it only does five miles. And I, that is up the, um, oh, what is it? The River Worth, isn't it? And. Uh, it was formed, the Preservation Society, I think way back in 19, I don't know, the 60s, I think, 62, something like that, uh, with the aim of returning a, a passenger service to the Worth Valley area. And so good for all the people down there because they've been, you know, talking about it. And, and I think 60, 67, 60, 68, I think it was, weeks before steam finally ended on British Railways in August of that year, they've reopened the branch line from Keithley to... Oxen hope, but I've never been on it, and yet I know all about it. It's it's you know it's one of those. It just looks nice, and the longer we hang on to all these lovely places and these lovely things which are part of our heritage, the happier we're all going to be. You know, the, the the perhaps some kids nowadays will never know the delights of going on a steam train or dancing in a huge line to Motown records. I can remember we we me and my friend Dave Maskell put on a a gig at the Plaza in Newbury. And we hired a Radio 1 DJ, OK, <laughs> uh, called Johnny Diamond. And we had these, because we worked in Camp Hobson, we could use their printing upstairs. They had a hot printing machine. So we printed all our posters <laughs> up there and we charged 25 pence to get in. And we paid Johnny Diamond 25 pounds to be our DJ for the night. And he turned up in like this huge Luton box van. I mean, we didn't know. We, I don't know how on earth we found him, but we, we, we got him. And Newbury had not seen anything like it before. And all of a sudden we've got, he filled the stage of this plaza place with speakers and, de and he had two lads helping him. Assemble. And we were sitting there and all, I was selling hot dogs, uh, which were very popular. And we sold fizzy drinks and we had quite, a, no, exactly. It wouldn't be that, but, and we, we had hundreds of people who paid 25 pence to come in and we marked their hand with a felt tip pen so they couldn't, 25 pence to come in. And everybody danced in lines, you know, stoned love by the Supremes was just amazing. And you don't get things like that anymore. You just don't, you know, it, it almost seems a bit old fashioned and ancient when you talk about watching people dancing in lines and people went home happy. There was no violence. There was no sort of people getting drunk. Well, we couldn't get drunk at any of our disco things. We only sold those little panda pops. <laughs> no, we weren't going to get excited on that. I mean, the nearest we actually got to being a little bit raucous was having a cigarette out the back and stubbing it out on the ground. It's all good stuff. All good stuff. We liked it. We liked it. Listen, if, if you don't experience all these things, 
you won't have any memories for later in life. And the one thing you want is your memories later in life, like Mike in Kings Langley. Steve, were you pleased with your uh, baskets? Yes, Pat. Thank you very much indeed. Actually, the good news, Pat, is that uh, A, they're my baskets, and B, uh, they've had their first watering and because Pat picked picked out for me and they went, that's Steve's baskets over there. They come from the farm at Chertsey and um, and they're going to be tomorrated today. So I don't know how many you've actually got. I hope you're well, though, Pat. I think about you all the time, as uh, Paul will tell you, because he's he's sort of he's sort of relaxed. He had a huge amount of hanging baskets. I only got six this year. He, I think he's ordered about 30 or something ridiculous. But no, absolutely lovely. And uh, I hope that you're, you're well as well. Uh, Steve, I've always been puzzled with Keithley. Where's the T? Keithley. I don't know, actually. I can never, I can never work out. <laughs> don't tell me those. Steve, my first music biz job at 17 was opening the Trocadero HMV. We had an opening night and I met the wonderful Phil Lynott. Dale used to work at HMV. That's where he used to work. He, he worked in a record shop because he loved uh, he loved his music so much. Somebody went to Nights in Reading Town Centre in the late 70s and 80s. Have you tried Hovis cheese topped rolls? No. <laughs> Very scrumptious. You can get them in Waitrose. Can you? Mm -hmm. Sounds quite nice. Uh, I brought frozen Greg sausage rolls from Iceland yesterday. Absolutely delicious. Well, they're the same ones that they sell in there. They, they do a whole range of... Um, of the stuff that they sell in Greg's. So if you, if you like Greg's, you can go and buy it in uh, in Iceland. Uh, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, Steve, she had a craving for blueberries and cottage cheese. Oh, I met somebody once who had a craving for coal. Coal. Pieces of coal. They wanted to suck coal. Don't ask me why. People are very odd. I, don't, I can't remember where I met them. I mean, somebody said, oh, my mother had a craving for coal. Because people have different cravings during pregnancy. Listen, I just merely pass it on. I can't tell you anything else. Oh, look, here we go. Some people at Ascot and uh, Brian Mann and Rebecca Johnson from Berkshire. Don't know what they do for a living, but one can hazard a guess. And two people who you won't know, Claudia Smith and Chloe Bowler from ITV's Absolutely Ascot. You can tell that they're from Ascot. It's, it's a really, it's, to be honest with you, actually, at least they're all fairly well spoken in Ascot. And uh, the boys are all very good looking. Whereas the boys in Towie are looking a bit jaded and dated now. You know, I'm sorry, loafers with no socks on? I don't think so. But you can tell that the, these girls are in Absolutely Ascot because their boobs are hanging out. <laughs> That's that's the that's the indication now. The Aussie trade deal, a boost for Mr Kipling and wine lovers. But UK farmers fear a fall in standards. I didn't think they had enough stuff to um, to give to us, but apparently they have. Carbon footprint's going to be a disaster, isn't it? Oh, short break. Honestly, it's non-stop on this programme. It really is. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, a pretty nice to have your company. 6.20. So, 6... Well, they've said 6pm this evening. That's when they've said the weather is going to turn in uh, in this country. And so we're going to get thunderstorms. I mean, to be honest with you, I like I do like looking at thunderstorms, but only on the safety of a television. There's some isn't there some famous man who's in the Guinness Book of Records. He's been hit more times by lightning than anybody else. I think he's a warden in in Yellowstone Park or something. He's been he's been hit something like seven or eight times by lightning. How that could be possible, I've got no idea. But he, he was in... Yeah, here he is, Royce Roy Sullivan, a United Park State Ranger in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. He was the human lightning conductor. He's been struck more times than... Uh, yeah, known for being hit seven times by lightning. My memory's getting better. And uh, he was born in uh, Virginia, started working as a ranger in Shenandoah, Avoided by people later in life because of their fear of being hit by lightning, and it saddened him. He said, I was walking with a chief ranger one day when lightning struck way off in the distance. The chief said, I'll see you later. But in fact, actually, he didn't die of a lightning strike. He died at the age of 71 from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. And two of his hats are on display at two Guinness World exhibit halls in New York City and South Carolina. So there you go. He was hiding from a thunderstorm in a fire lookout tower, which they used to have, and people would see, they'd say, fire, fire, and, then, and, and fire, and they'd have to sort of bring the fire engine out. And, uh, I mean, it, it, seven times. You see, I always thought that lightning was so powerful, it took you out immediately, but not him. 
Not him. But uh, not sure about the self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Does that mean he committed suicide? Oh, well, that's, that's very disappointing. But uh, it, it was that, uh, that, that idea that he sort of disappeared. And uh, the warm weather will continue for a couple more days. Then it turns wet. Potential travel. Di- of course, of course, travel disruption. Good heavens above. We wouldn't be in the United Kingdom if we didn't have travel disruption. You have a lot of drivers. I'm not going out and it's raining. I'm not going out there. Some areas could see intense thunderstorms with the risk of flooding. For So where is it at the moment? Is it hiding behind clouds? And then we're going to sort of see it. Uh, 6 p.m. Wednesday till 6 a.m. Friday, a Met Office spokesman said torrential rain, hail, frequent lightning and strong gusty winds could occur during this period. So in other words, all the seasons in one day. Isn't that nice? I like that. My mother used to chew coal, Steve, when she was pregnant. They found out she had a lack of magnesium. That was from George in, in Runcorn. Uh, anything that reminds us of our youth cheers us up. Mine was arcades which is now why I have the Coinless Cavern Arcade, full of old arcade games. How lovely. That sounds quite nice. The Coinless Cavern Arcade. Blimey. As you mentioned, Greg, Steve, I'm having my regular mocha and vegan sausage roll from Whitechapel. The Night Frankie Valley. And they're doing a reader of the Railway Children. They are, aren't they? They're doing, I mean, I don't know how many more rebootings of things they can have. I hope we don't get a hailstorm this evening, Steve, says Peter. A few years ago, all our lovely hosta plants were reduced to rags in the space of 15 minutes. I'm more worried about, you know, if if it's very windy, stuff flying about all over the place. Talking of uh, disco, Steve, do you remember the roller skating disco at the plaza in the youth centre down by the canal? And we used to do the local CB radio panda pops. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I lived in, I went to school in Newbury. Well, I say went to school. I mean, it was a bit of an imposition, actually. I was never very good at, uh, never very good at school. Uh, also, uh, Galaxy and Flying Fox Clubs, REF Camp, suede fringe jackets and bell bottoms. When you look at them, I bought a pair of loons. Loons. They were selling them in Record Mirror and New Musical Express. They were £1.99 for a pair of... They were tight trousers in all different colours with a zip and the bottom of them would get all manky and they'd be in puddles and everything else. Loons. They looked ridiculous. You can still buy them. They, they were like flares, only bigger. They, I, I, I might wear a pair tomorrow, actually, just in, just in celebration of being, you know, being uh, it, uh, being that I'm, I'm, I'm a good boy for something like that. <laughs> uh, Steve, I went to Guy Norris in Barking to buy my records. I remember standing in a booth with the headphones to listen before buying. Spent many Saturdays there, says Denise. Uh, somebody wants to try Marmite and peanut butter. Well, don't mention it to my former producer, Corey, who works with Ian Dale now. He, uh, he was nearly sick in the studio. <laughs> the idea of peanut butter and Marmite, he thought, was the most awful combination. I quite liked it. It was OK. I might try the Marmite cheese, actually. <laughs> Declan says, my mate, who worked on the buses giving out tickets, got hit by lightning three times and survived. He always was a bad conductor. Oh, all the old ones are the best. Yeah, you're right, you're barred. Uh, what do you think of Clarkson's Farm, says Ender in Roscommon? In Ireland. Such a, such a good name, Ender. I used to know somebody called Ender Lyons. Used to run nightclubs. Uh, Clarkson's Farm. I don't know anything about it. I've just... Uh, um, he seems quite happy with it. That's, I don't know anything else, actually. Tasty sandwiches. Cream cheese on brown bread. Slices of a crisp apple and a sprinkling of walnuts. How do you eat that, for goodness sake? I mean, you just pick it up and it all falls apart. No, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. See, when I was a toddler says Catherine, not often take coal out of the fireplace and gnaw on it. A lot of people did. So 50, 49 people on average are injured by lightning every year, three of whom are killed. Wow. The UK population is about 58.2 million people. So the average number of people struck by lightning per million people is 0.84. And the average annual number of deaths due to lightning per million people is 0.05. So you never knew that, did you? You could, if somebody says to you today over, over a dinner party or something like that, you're having maybe a nice salt beef sandwich, you know, you could say, did you know, I heard this on Steve Allen's programme. Uh, hospitality hit by a triple whammy. The Treasury is expected to announce only limited help for struggling hospitality firms. Theatre bosses have lamented the government's disproportionate response to the pandemic. Although the good news is 
that they're letting Wimbledon, the finals, go ahead. So it will be packed capacity. I mean, how they work that one out, I can't imagine. Uh, Impresario Sir Howard Panter said the industry has been left absolutely devastated uh, after Freedom Day was delayed. Venues will have to continue to operate at 50% capacity until July the 19th. Sir Howard is founder of the Ambassador Theatre Group. He said the reaction of the government is completely disproportionate to the facts. He said hospitalizations and deaths, they're minuscule in numerical terms. They're twisting the numbers. Because until they allow the theatres to open up normally, and even then you'll probably all be somewhat sceptical about it, um, it'll be a, a case of, you know, will, will these restaurants... Uh, I think a lot of restaurants, a lot more are going to go under. It's, uh, it's, it, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility, which is, uh, which is a great shame, isn't it? Great shame. Um, Britain's first, I don't know if you remember this story, I did it years and years ago, um, seven years ago, 2014, they opened up a red light district in uh, Leeds, it, they, I mean, it <laughs> doesn't seem possible, the, the neighbours didn't like it at all, it was introduced by a Labour council to improve sex worker safety, it's going to end after the number of prostitutes and customers declined in the pandemic. I thought it would have gone up, actually, in the pandemic, but there you go. Uh, since 2014, sex workers have been allowed to operate in a managed zone without arrest being made for loitering, soliciting or curb crawling. Campaigners claim the scheme, which cost around 200 grand a year, increased sex assaults. Residents said the area was blighted with incidents, such as school pupils being propositioned and people having sex in gardens in daylight. Oh, Lord. Leeds Council insisted the managed approach area was a success and rejected calls to scrap it. But the start of the pandemic last year forced it to be suspended and the scheme is now set to be ended by a council executive vote next week. I remember it when it opened. They had people saying, you know, I, my, my children go to school, they get propositioned by people in cars. I was, but it's, it ran for seven years. Oh, look, Martin Bashir. Here he is, his reputation in tatters. Even though he's wearing his baseball cap, we still recognise it's him. Sarah Vine says, don't be taken in by Shamima Begum. It's going to take more, she says, than red nail polish and some new clothing to convince me she's ready to come home. We must, she says, proceed with extreme caution. I agree. And also, the senior vice president of the British Veterinary Association, the story we did yesterday, condemning Tesco's 11 quid flat bulldog cake on the basis that Flat-faced breeds suffer from breathing complications. Seriously, says Sarah Vine. How about doing something about the exorbitant fees that are making veterinary care beyond the means of ordinary pet owners instead of virtue signalling about baked goods? Yeah, never find a poor vet, do you? That's why everybody, they say, do, do get insurance. Why? Because vets charge an absolute arm and a leg. I like the super vet, but you'll never hear them utter the price of how much the expensive work is costing on, you know, mummy's little treasure. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, Steve. No, £35 for a consultation with a vet. I just paid £300 to see a human doctor. Good Lord. Vets are not cleaning up and this misinformation is just one component to the fact that vets... Uh, no, I mean, they do make a lot. You ask anybody, anybody who's got animals, you need to have insurance because you can't afford the vet's fees. You seriously can. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, £300 to see a human doctor. <laughs> you obviously went private then. And then somebody says it isn't the vet's bills. It's the 25% VAT the government charge on top. An average vet salary is 35000 Where, Where's that come from? Where's that, is that some online oh there you go that, that'll be vets writing in there uh but uh no i think they earn a lot more than thirty-five thousand pounds but also the vets bills the the vat that the government charge on top well that's 20 percent oh it can go up to seventy thousand. Oh, that sounds more realistic doesn't it but that's why i say i'd like to find out what noel earns how much he charges for some of his things they must be astronomical because you're, because you're actually dealing with an audience who love their animals so much they will they, they will pay for anything it's like people never argue about the cost of a funeral, do they? And a funeral director would say, well, of course, it's quite reasonably priced because we don't get the money straight away. We've got to wait for probate and all these sort of things. Uh, Steve, I remember Ender Lyon says, Sue used to run the nightclub Broadway Boulevard in Ealing. Knew him well. Yes, I knew him well as well. Uh, just delivered to Newbury, Steve. Bone Lane, says Lee. And Roger says, I like the name of Jeremy Clarkson's farm. It's called Diddley Squat. 
<laughs> yes, it is actually. I now remember. I've seen the uh, I've seen the pictures. Uh, Cass says thank you for your memories this morning, which is uh, which is good. And uh, the ranger was known to his colleagues as Flash, and up until the period before he shot himself, was said to be a well-grounded individual. But as I said, we, now we've had this discussion loads and loads of times, haven't we? You don't know what's going on uh, in somebody's mind. I mean, do you think? I, mean, I should imagine being struck seven times by lightning must do something to you, definitely, definitely. From the ballroom to the beach, how Elizabeth Hurley's gowns all have matching bikinis. Every single outfit she's ever had, there's a matching bikini that goes with it. She's ever so pretty. I've, I, I interviewed her some, some years ago, and I remember sitting there looking at her thinking, you know, you see somebody's image so much, and some people, you know, I mean, if you look at anybody from sort of Love Island, they're so troweled with makeup. We had somebody that walked through. Who the Dickens was it? I can't remember. But I remember saying to uh, to Charlie Girling, this particular person walked through, and I looked at her. I thought, who on earth is that? No makeup on or anything. Else. Looked dreadful, absolutely dreadful. It was somebody from Love Island, which only goes to prove that uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of makeup that goes into them. Uh, Steve, um, uh, I've got a, a an old man joke. We had these the other day, didn't we? Dreadful old men joke, dad jokes. Told a doctor one night, I I dreamt I'm a wigwam. The next night, I'm a teepee. Doctor says, you're too tense. I mean, that's not only so, you're barred completely now. <laughs> One of my border terriers, Steve, is going to the vets today for some dental treatment, which will be anything between 300 and 600 pounds, says Tony in Woodford. Wow. Also, why, why is the government charging vets? For, I couldn't quite work it. Why would the government be charging vets VAT? I mean, you pay VAT, but that, that's 20%, isn't it? I always thought it was 20%, unless somebody's telling me it's changed. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the you know, our, my, my dog is at a super vet on Friday. It's five and a half thousand, says Rob, for a broken leg. Local vet won't touch it. Do they, do they have super vets? Well, I suppose there must be Noel would be classed as a super vet, wouldn't he? One of the reasons... Oh, there you go. Vets bills are so high, it's because VAT is levied on them at 20%. Well... Well, yes. Well, that's what VAT is. Given the high cost of vet bills, many pet owners take out insurance. I think it's the only way you can keep a pet. Let's take out the insurance. You couldn't... If you had to pay every time you went in there, you'd never you'd never survive, would you? I mean, just simple... I spoke to a friend of mine, and she's, she's got pet insurance. But just a simple thing like tablets. You know, if your cat gets cystitis, all sorts of things like that. Sometimes it's, you know, it's an arm and a leg. My daughter, Steve... Has already spent five thousand pound at the vets this year. He's a millionaire. Well, I did know a vet actually that we used in LBC years ago, and somebody went round to his house, which was very nice. And they said, when you opened the front door, you looked all the way through the house to the tennis courts at the back. I thought that's very nice. And, uh, and somebody says my partner recently left her job as a veterinarian surgeon. She was working sixty hours a week and only got twenty nine thousand a year. Wasn't worth the stress for her, says Ryan. Well, you should find a place that pays better. I mean, down our way, we've got a, a veterinary, a veterinary sur a vet surgery. They're open 24 hours a day. They won't be doing that for peanuts. That's a fact. It's literally just by the traffic lights. And no, it's um, it's opposite the cemetery. And uh, on the and, and the 316, just before you hit Richmond on the left hand side. But 24 hours a day, they're open. Obviously, because people's pets get ill, don't they? And sort of, you know darkness or so i don't know but uh, but you definitely need pet insurance i always say to people if they're getting a pet in fact we've just checked with one of my neighbors and i said um have you got insurance she said absolutely you know because puppies need their parvo virus and they need all these other injections and stuff that they have to have and uh, steve i'm a vet with 12 years experience and on 45k definitely not rich what would the equivalent nhs doctor be getting paid probably about the same that's why a lot of NHS doctors go and do private work because they and so most most people working the private sector would be working in the NHS as well. Because I had a, a doctor the other day who works, he works both and he works the private sector and he does that. So I would I would think that's exactly the same. But I mean, 12 years, it depends where you're working, doesn't it? Steve, our German shepherd has been on medication for an underactive thyroid since she was four years old, she's now nearly 13, over £100 a month. But I pay a 1000 love her to bits. So that's, you, you don't find people arguing over, over bills, do you? But I want to see Knowles. 
I want to, I just want to find out because when you look at some of the work that he does with recreating legs and putting this pin in here and he'll always say to them, you know, we've got to do this and this will work. Fine. And I'm thinking this, this sounds like this is racking up one hell of a thing. And people, because they love their animals, they don't want to lose them. So they will spend a lot of money. I mean, he's, he's done some marvellous stuff, but it comes presumably at a price. Steve, our poor Jack Russell nugget was admitted to a super vet from our vet after an accident. £4,000 for an x-ray and consultation. Wow. What, ha what happens if you can't afford to pay? I don't, suppose, well, they, I, I don't know. I, I don't suppose they do it. They wouldn't do the work. They, 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 will, they, they, they tell you what it costs before they do something. If it's something major like an operation, they'll either say, listen, it's not worth doing it because, you know, the quality of life is not going to be better. Uh, because there was a dog, wasn't there, that was just riddled with cancer. And they said, listen, it's going to be kinder to put them to S-L-E-E-P. And, um, and, but you have to pay for that as well. You can't get that for free. But that's why we've got the PDSA and other organisations that will work on animals for, for the very basic. You know, if you're working for one of those organisations, you probably wouldn't be earning the big money that is to be made out there. That's why you see these programmes. There's the Bondi vet at the moment. We've got the vet on the hill in Richmond. He's got two practices. Two practices. I know because I see him when he's, he's up on the hill and down, uh, down near Strawberry Hill. Here we go. Based in Surrey, uh, Noel Fitzpatrick works at Fitzpatrick Referrals, which is apparently the largest veterinary referral centre in the UK. There are no current fees on the website, but in 2019, an initial consultation there for a cat or a dog was 210 quid. Surgery started around 2,000, whilst a hip replacement for your pooch could be closer to 8,000 pounds. So you're going to need insurance, aren't you? It's interesting, isn't it? The, the centre's services include complex procedures, and by God, they're complex. They do cancer, brain tumours. Patients can only be referred by a vet. Animals are referred to Noel and his team if a primary care vet thinks they have a treatable condition that is beyond the scope of a general veterinary practice. But it's interesting that there are no fees, but they think a hip replacement for a dog, £8,000. I think they get an overnight stay and a breakfast for that, which is good news. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> uh, Jackie says, where has all that hug a vet thing come from? I don't know. Who's hugging vets? We mustn't hug vets. We don't hug vets. Don't hug anybody. Not at the moment. And uh, Steve, you should you say get pet insurance. Well, you can't. Listen, if somebody if, if you take your your pooch in, you know, and, and you want to know, you know, how much it's going to cost. And they quote just hypothetically, say they say six thousand pounds. Where where are most people going to get six thousand pounds from? You're not. In fact, somebody says, uh, my dog had a heart problem and I couldn't afford the tablets. It was an ongoing problem. But uh, I managed to get a prescription and got them from an online company recommended by the vets. And they were a fraction of the cost. Yeah, because, I mean, some people can't afford that, that sort of thing. Steve, the reason uh, that vet bills seem so expensive is because we're used to getting free treatment from the NHS. If we had to pay for all NHS services... Uh, the vet bills would seem normal. Unfortunately for us, there isn't an animal NHS. And yes, you must have insurance. Yes, I mean, whenever you go in there, you are paying, whether it's 50 quid or 60 quid or something like that. You're going to be paying something. You've got to pay for tablets. You can't get them. The same way you would pay for a prescription. You know, to get it for free would be a... Me Having said that, I do get it for free. I'm a diabetic. So I, I don't pay for any of my medication. And we, we seem to be increasing... But uh, there you go. Somebody says a vet earns less than a radio chat show host. Oh, I can quite not believe that at all. Definitely not believe. We've just told you how much it pays for things. Honestly, wash your ears out, for goodness sake. Nothing worse than people who can't hear properly. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, Steve. I will never understand why people with asthma don't get free prescriptions, same as diabetics. I've got no idea. I've got no idea. I don't know how it goes back a, a long way. A long way. Steve, you were talking about the uh, the vets up the road open 24 hours. £200 to walk in the door out of hours. The reason that, uh, that uh, vets' fees have gone up is because most practices have been bought out by large equity companies. Six of these companies own over 60% of the practices. But that's the same as funeral directors. 
a lot of the funeral directors are owned by insurance companies. So they might keep the name up, you know, like Steve Allen Funerals, you know, a family business. Chancer is not. The chance is not. Chance is owned by a big insurance company. And, and the same, I didn't know it worked, worked the same for vets. No idea. And uh, someone says, uh, Danny says, I had to pay recently £600 for a pot of cream for my horse who has what is that? It's like a skin cancer. It can only be got from Liverpool University where it was invented. On top of that, I had to pay for two vet visits a week for three months to apply the cream as apparently it must be done by a vet. I can tell you with confidence that equine vets earn a lot more than £35,000 or whatever was suggested. Oh yes, equine vets. I've seen some of the equine things that they have to do. It's very specialist work. That's why it's so expensive. So expensive. Uh, Steve, Bernese Mountain Dog Bella, eight years cancer, £6,000. I mean, that's it's an awful lot. It's an awful lot of money, isn't it? And uh, and somebody says, I, I dropped my uh, partner at the Royal Free early today for a massive op. Ooh. <laughs> I always get frightened about massive. I don't I never know what a massive op is. And um, and uh, I hope it goes well. I'm sure it does, actually. It's always something to worry about. Put the sat nav on to get home and I thought I'd try LBC on the radio. Wow, I got you. Here we go. Wait for it. Oh, first time it's worked in the car. I'm taking it as a good sign. Thank you for everything you do, says Pat. Well, there you go. Well, there we are. Now I could say thank you, which is very nice, isn't it? Very nice indeed. But looking about, about how much you're, you're paying for your uh, your vets and stuff like that uh, is it, it's quite, quite. I mean, £600 for a pot of cream sounds like quite a lot of money. But the specialist vets who do the uh, the equine and something like that is uh, is is amazing steve even if you have insurance you can still pay an arm and a leg for different levels if you pick the cheapest it only cover a certain amount and that's it same as the highest oh but that's exactly the same well I've, well it's not the same but if, if if you take out um rac membership or aa membership they'll go from 39 pounds a year and you think well that's very good i can call them out every day if the car breaks down no you can't once one call out a year i'm on the top scale that you can have because i'm always worried if something you know happens to the car or something like that and it's something like 200 and something pounds a year so when you see somebody goes oh i only pay 26 quid you go that's only for one call out it's so expensive you don't seriously think for 29 quid they're going to come out five days a week to you absolutely not so uh, i'm agreeing with you i'm agreeing with you even if you've got the insurance you've got to, you, must, you need to check the little uh, the little small print just to find out, somebody said, my pug needs uh, an MRI. Two and a half grand. My pug isn't getting an MRI, alas, says Ben in Hales. Don't tell the dog. For goodness sake, don't tell the dog. It'd be a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Uh, the ex-model from the 60s, Celia Hammond, has a reduced price vets practice in Beckton, says Tony in Woodford. In fact, there are lots of places. I think the PDSA still do very, very, you know, cheap. For people who can't afford... Although, you know, some people can afford, but not everybody can afford it. Uh, most dental practices are now loaned by the same equity company, says Roger in Brentwood. Well, I was always told I, I, I can set up a dental practice if I want to. Same as I can set up a hairdresser's if I want to. All I need to do is get the premises, install the equipment and bring in a dentist. And they earn their money yeah, a qualified dentist. You just bring bring somebody in who will work for you and you, you pay them, but they can earn more money by selling services that they've got, like, you know, having your teeth whitened or something like that. The same as um, hairdressers. I knew a butcher once. He'd, he'd never been a butcher in his entire life, but he bought the business and he brought in a butcher to work in the business and he just sort of sat back. Hairdressers a lot. They'll rent you the chair. They'll say, you know, for 50, 50 quid a day, you can rent this chair in my salon. And then anything over and above that you make, you keep yourself. It's quite normal now, but you're, you're right about the insurance companies that are buying into it. Lots and lots of places are doing that now. And uh, another one here, you need a for life policy or some cheap insurance. Only pay for 12 months, says Rich. Yes. Well, I'm not sure we could have even afford for 12 months, actually. <laughs> Somebody says you've made your point. Vets bills are expensive. Yeah, well, I'm just telling you because most people don't realise I'm educating you which is very good. Uh, Steve, you mentioned two of my many M and S Bliss strawberry clotted cream and cream cheese Marmite. I've got to try that cream cheese Marmite, Kang. I've done, I've done the strawberry clotted cream. That is particularly nice. 
In fact, actually, that, that we might go some of that today. I might push the little boat out. Might be a little boat that needs pushing out. And it's it's too... Oh, di I, I tried those. I didn't like those. The M&S Dinky Cheese Pinwheels. I thought they were horrid. I really didn't like them at all. I bought them thinking, oh, that'll be quite nice because the box looks quite nice. Pretty box. But uh, I might get the other thing and put it on crumpets. <laughs> Honestly, my diet's terrible, isn't it? Steve, I recently moved vets because of their prices. They were charging 40 quid for a prescription. My new vet charges £10 and the practice is within miles of each other. Well, nobody sets their prices. They actually set their own prices. There's no there's no standardisation across the uh, across the board. I don't think so. Uh, I was a soundbite. So Harrison says you were a soundbite during Eddie Mayer's show yesterday. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm on every day. I'm on every day. I'm a soundbite every day. I'm so excited. I don't get paid for it. I have to hold my hands up and say I am just a showbiz leg end. And uh, and I get featured on lovely Eddie Mayer's show every day. Which is very good. I think he's doing it to boost figures. I think that's what it's done for. You know, and they go, what is the Steve? Some of them last like two seconds. It'll be something really bizarre. God knows today what's going to appear. We shall let you know tomorrow, by which time we're either going to be paddling into the studio or, uh, or it's not going to be as bad as the Met Office have made out. But I have to err on the side of caution and warn you that with thunderstorms coming in and lightning and flash flooding, it might not be very pleasant. So tie the furniture down, make sure you've taken the umbrella down, all the usual things that you would do that you normally forget. You don't want to sort of have to start scouring the neighbourhood to go and find out where your umbrella's gone. Well, there it is. That's the hot news story. Dormice. They're being reinjured. I didn't know. I've seen some lovely photographs of dormice when they sort of hibernate. They sort of they're tiny because they used to be to climb up stalks of corn and stuff like that, which I thought was lovely. Anyway, talking of uh, talking of climbing up stalks of corn, we shall be doing that this morning because we now know who the complainer is of the church clock. Apparently he's lived in the village for four years. God, I bet he's, he's been trolled like there's no tomorrow. Uh, more than one in four payments were contactless. I mean, I do use contactless, not all the time, because sometimes I've discovered it doesn't, and I can be in Waitrose, it'll go, no, you've got to put the card into the machine, you can't just sort of tap it, and I think, well, you know, whatever. Uh, also, the cost of romance fraud, £113,000 for one woman. How people get taken, you will find out a little bit later on. And uh, what a surprise... Coronavirus cases in... You notice that, that for, for an effect... Coronavirus cases, uh, coronavirus cases in Cornwall have skyrocketed after all the holidaymakers went down there for the hot weather and uh, also the G7 summit. And so now it's all skyrocketed. Big surprise. Big surprise. Uh, Royal Ascot continues. Uh, so the cash off a cliff edge payments with physical money dropped by more than a third last year, but it's still the second most common way to pay. I mean, I, I do like cash. I do. I do carry cash. I, don't, yeah, I asked in the office the other day, actually, I, I needed to break down a 20 into two tens or anything, really. And two of the people, they didn't have any money. They had no money at all. You have, have you got any money on you this morning? Producer's got no money on him at all. Well, what, yeah, well, I suppose to get home, you've, you've got a card, haven't you? And you should, oh, you use your phone, do you? Oh, we had somebody on the bus the other day. Honestly, I nearly shouted out, get on with it. I get very cross. Who gets on the bus and then tries to sort of sign in on the thing because it's the app on the phone. Well, could she make it work? Could she buffalo? I mean, just ridiculous. But uh, anyway, uh, also ordering takeaways can be 44% more expensive than the actual takeaway from the restaurant itself. You have been warned. You wouldn't believe the markups on some of them. Uh, also, the farm shop. Just opened one big vending machine. You can get everything in it. It looks fantastic. And the price is very comparable. Very comparable. And do you remember I told you the story the other day of the Fletchers? Tom and Giovanna Fletcher. Uh, he's in a band. Is he McFly or Busted or something? McFly. And very nice person. And then it turns out the other day they got caught out. Because she won the I'm a celebrity thing and we're all going, oh, that's funny. She's going to be this and that. They're off for a chat show. Well, of course, nothing like that happened at all, did it? It's a bit like watching Gemma, Gemma Collins's career collapse completely. And there's a story on her in the papers this morning. Well, actually, it didn't make the papers at all. She's of no interest to the newspapers. Unless she does something interesting like losing three stone. Oh, no, she's already done that story. But anyway, it turns out that the Fletchers have been uh, furloughing themselves and they've been taking money. 
and it's it's quite a quite a substantial amount when their personal fortune is estimated at eight million. It featured in the paper yesterday. They've now admitted a huge error of judgment, and they've paid the money back. Yeah, but had it not appeared in the papers. I'm being somewhat sceptical this morning and thinking to myself, I doubt anything would have been said about it. It only goes to prove some of the, some of the journalists, I mean, they, they've actually, I mean, one of them, they said the financial figures reported by the newspapers were incorrect, but it was true they had used the scheme. He said, hi, everyone. They always do that, don't they? We've always had a very honest and open relationship with you all on here, so we thought it was important to address the questions. And uh, they say, uh, it's true, we did follow financial advice to furlough someone we employ. As what? What do they employ somebody? They've got eight million sitting in the bank. Anyway, they, they've given the money back. How much they actually took, I don't know. I don't know. But it's, they, they said the cash was used for a member of their team who couldn't carry out their role due to the pandemic. And the scheme was suggested as the most effective way to give them job stability and security. Could you not have dipped into your eight million pound savings? You know, only mentioned it. Only mentioned it. Uh <laughs> Uh, also, the, the Sun have failed to find anybody as cheap as the couple who were thrown out the Weatherspoons the other day, where they really did look a bit sad and tragic, but there you go. Uh, also, would-be beef eaters, wanted by the Tower of London, unfortunately, and I thought they only started axing some of them a short while ago because historic royal palaces haven't got the money because they lost so much during the pandemic. But uh, only distinguished military personnel need apply. You can't just do it because you're sort of Joe Bloggs and you went down a coal mine once. You know, so you don't want to sort of do anything like that. Uh, plus, uh, muck spreaders get their revenge on a badly parked van. Ha, 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 ha. Mind you, my favourite one was in, I think it was America, and a car parked illegally. And so somebody came out, I don't know who they were, quite a few of them, and they covered the car in post-it notes. The entire car was covered in post-it notes. When the bloke came back, of course, a crowd had gathered uh, to, uh, to sort of basically laugh at them. It's like all the Karens in America. And uh, there's one woman and she's uh, the, there's the stupid woman who's leaping in front of some kid on his skateboard in a, in a big public area. You know, she doesn't like it because she's a bit thick. And then there's another woman and she's in front of somebody on their motorbike. I'm calling the police now. I'm calling I'm calling the cops. They can call them the police. They call them the cops. And he's going, why don't you go away? Honestly, go away. You're not allowed on here. You're not allowed on here. Anyway, uh, uh, cops, are you listening to this? This is what's going on. And, and he, he keeps revving his bike up to really wind her up. In the end, I mean, I was I was willing him to run her over because she kept she kept touching his bike and he kept saying, don't touch my bike. And then there was another woman who was causing a bit of a rumpus in a coffee shop. And uh, and the police come along because they want her out. She's using foul language. Most of the, the, these people have some sort of illness. I don't know what it is. It's sort of called very annoying, I think. And this particular woman is wearing all leopard skin prints. You, you, you'll find her. She's one of those sort of Karens. And leopard skins always looked a bit cheap, I'm afraid. And um, and so so the cop and she's she's there in the seat. Don't you touch me? You know I'm not allowed. And they're, they're big into this. Do not touch me. And uh, they scream and shout and all the rest of it. Anyway, eventually it, she's, he's, he's trying to grab her because they're throwing her out the shop. They don't want her in there. She's a disrupting influence and the language is too bad. So then another cop comes and, of course, between the two of them, they literally drag her out of the shop, which was hilarious. And then she and then they have a daughter comes along and she's equally dumb and she tries to take her mother's handbag and the and the police say no you can't have it and the mother's screaming they're trying to steal my bag they're trying to steal I mean she was a real stupid person I mean some of the language on some of these people just doesn't beg a belief what you need is a zapper just to go and they vanish in front of your eyes like something on Star Trek Roger says I can put the ark away then as a few droplets was the only rain we saw last night apparently it's getting listen Darren said it's getting worse Darren said it's getting worse. I haven't actually checked with sort of uh, uh, Dominic Ellis on whether or not we're, uh, we're sort of going to sort of have it. But it says here, uh, Thursday the 17th, light cloud and a gentle breeze. Uh, and then the thunder, thunder has now vanished. Uh, they, they, yeah, rain, rain tomorrow, 17 degrees. Saturday, 20 degrees. Sunday, it's got flashes of lightning and uh, a little bit of sunshine, 21 degrees. So at least the temperature's dropped, which is good news. But uh, gone are the... I mean, I seriously thought I was going to be swept away out of the building. I really did. I mean, I was, I was thinking about how many people on other radio stations in this building I'd be taking with me. Because the canoe can't hold that many. But if you've got an ark... 
I'm going for that one. The presenters walked in two by two. Steve's Ark, I think we could definitely... Did you ever see that film about a bloke who turned into Moses and started building an ark? It was... It was just, and he, he kept growing this beard and he had, he'd been told to build an ark by, by God and he built it and the, the animals were going into it. And it was sort of, it's, it's sort of a modern day film. It's not an old biblical epic. In fact, it's nothing to do with the Bible by the look of it, unless you call, because they thought they'd found the ark, didn't they? On top of a mountain in Turkey. Turned out to be, uh, as usual, a load of old rubbish. Yeah. So Noah... Is that it? 2014? He decide, God decides to wash away the sins of mankind through an apop- apocalyptic flood. Before that happens, Noah is tasked with building an ark that can carry his family and a breeding pair of all animals. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that, that's it. I mean, it, it's sort of a sort of a cross... Oh, Russell Crowe was... Oh, I don't know. That was it. I can't think of anything else, actually. But uh, it's a feat of filmmaking. Well, it had to be to get all the animals to walk on there. And then people were going, oh, there won't be any water. And then all of a sudden the water arrives. So perhaps that was the film. But I, d- I didn't think it was called Noah. But it would have to be. Oh, there's another one. Made in 1998. And um, it might be it might be that. It's got Tony Danza in it. Do you remember Tony Danza from Taxi? He was very good. Then there's a 1928 one called Noah's Art. No, this is definitely in colour. <laughs> definitely in colour. I quite liked it. I thought it was OK. It wasn't the most brilliant film I'd ever seen. And there's something nice about all these people who'd been booing him all of a sudden. So please take us aboard. Please take us aboard. I mean, I'd have pulled the doors up. No, you're not going. Go, go swim. Go swim for it. And the water came in and uh, it, it was called Evan Almighty. Somebody's just written to me saying, and that sounds more likely, actually. Evan Almighty. Evan is the name of a person, I think. So there you go. Evan Almighty, is that it? Would that be it? Morgan Freeman, Lauren Graham, Wanda Sykes and Jonah Hill. When God warns him about an enormous flood, Evan Baxter, a congressman, is forced to build an ark to save all the animals and humans. And he turns into Noah. He grows the beard. It's like that Father Christmas programme where he shaves off the beard and then magically, because he's the designated Santa Claus, it grows back again. That was quite good. Did you ever see that one? You really don't. Don't get out at all. You don't get out at all, actually, do you? Uh, looking forward to the old football. Looking forward to what rubbish uh, uh, old spoon bender Yuri, Yuri Goller comes up with. That'll be exciting, won't it? Will he help anybody win? Of course he won't. It's got nothing to do with him. Uh, Gemma Collins has showed off her latest swimming pool in her back garden. It's a kiddie's paddling pool. That's all it is. It's a cheap plastic thing. And she goes, oh, it's got sequins all over it. I'm sorry. To... How old are you? Are you five or something? Something the matter with you? She's not the full ticket. She can't help it, but desperately unhappy. She's lost all the weight and still nobody wants to go out with her. The best that she could ever manage was poor old Arge. And to be honest with you, I mean, he's not exactly the most stable person on the programme. He turned up the other day on, well, on, because they were showing The Only Way is Essex. And they had little clips of sort of um, Gemma on there as well. I mean, with sort of that Bobby Cole Norris creature. You know, both talk about how long you've been single. How long you've been single, girl, goes Bobby Cole Norris. Nobody ever speaks like that unless they're back in the 70s. But uh, as he's never managed to bring himself up to date, poor old soul, honestly. Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty? No, yeah, no, it's not Bruce Almighty. It's, it's Evan. Yeah, so we know these things, you know. Nothing worse than snowflakes at this time of the morning, is there, really? Oh, we've got to take a break. Honestly, we've only just started and we're taking breaks. Goodness sake, honestly. 4.15. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning. Nice to have you company, Steve. We had a major storm around 9pm, says Beverly. Torrential rain, thunder and massive lightning. The lounge ceiling started to drip, saturated and fell in at around 11... Oh, my goodness. That's a bit... Have you got a roof on the house? Yeah, can you send us a picture, please? Uh, uh, somebody says, Steve, 13 minutes in and I've been laughing my head off. Don't be silly. No, you haven't. Because that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? You wouldn't be able to see the text that you'd be typing. Or the Twitter or whatever it is now. Uh, Ash in North uh, Norfolk says, we've had storms all night, some lovely lightning and thunder. Well, I don't think we ever, we ever had that. We're d- not down here, we didn't have. Uh, Steve, Evan Almighty is a comedy, the sequel to Bruce Almighty. The film you're talking about is Russell Crowe's Noah. No, I'm not. No, no, no. No, I'm definitely not Gareth. Gareth, honestly. <laughs> Such a good name, isn't it? And uh, and Connie, 
in Minnesota, part of the original Spikers group, says, Steve, happy 56th to me. Yes, indeed, happy 56th. When I get there, I'll let you know what it's like. 56 years young. That's what they used to say, isn't it? 56 years young, which is good news. So you've got... Um, what else we got? Oh, a rugby player hailed as inspiration. She was playing rugby. She's a woman, quite clearly, as you'll understand in a moment. And she comes off the, the uh, thing to breastfeed her daughter, breastfeeds her daughter, then goes back and carries on playing rugby again. And she says this is inspirational for women everywhere. This is possibly the most stupid thing I've ever heard of. Not the breastfeeding, but walking off in the middle of a game. I mean, I just don't quite understand it. I mean, I understand about breastfeeding. We've had this discussion long ago. People used to do it, I'm sure, it, because I've not seen it for ages and ages. They would sit in the window of Starbucks in Twickenham. One woman sat there with her breast out breastfeeding. Now, there are certain people walking about who would not be used to seeing something like this. and um, But somebody to walk off in the middle of a rugby game, breastfeed, and then just walk back on casually. Oh, she needs feeding. Well, then don't play rugby. I mean, can you imagine if half the half the English football team, women's, you know, sort of said, oh, wait, we have to sort of stop the game because we need to do breastfeeding. We could have mass breastfeeding. Ridiculous. Never heard anything like it. Uh, she'd been substituted. Well, you see, I don't agree with that substitution thing. I mean, either you're playing the blooming game or you're not playing it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm very tired. I think I'll, oh, oh goodness me, can I just go to a little lie down or something? I always, I always thought, actually, I mean, I was never sure whether I thought women could play rugby or not. It's like women's football. My mother used to be in a, in a women's football team. And that was like 50 years ago. 50 years ago. In the village where she lived, where, where we all lived in, uh, in Yorkshire, we had an English... Uh, sorry, we had an English. We had a, a, a women's football team and a women's cricket team as well. So, uh, you know, women, the women's game is getting very popular now. I think, though, the trouble is for rugby. It's a case of don't push... I just wash these. OK, don't don't push. OK, and throw me the ball gently, gently throw me the ball. Yeah, that'd be me. <laughs> I used to hate it. If ever I played rugby, which we had to at school, it was compulsory together with uh, hockey. Well, in the middle of winter, I promise you, you know, one, two, three foot, and then you try to whack their legs, which was always very popular. But uh, playing playing rugby, you know, people would throw you the ball and I don't end up think, oh, what do we do now? And I just used to throw it over my head. I hated being chased up the pitch. Not very good at things like that. Uh, ITV, good news, is to give Love Island contestants therapy when they come out. They will get eight sessions, I believe, either six or eight sessions of therapy because uh, three people have taken their own lives. I thought that surely even before they go into Love Island, they would be checking people because... They, they, they have to be assessed. But, I mean, all these people are supposed to be assessed. And it would make it an awful lot easier. Because, you know, if you really, really want to give up a normal life and go on to Love Island, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it because you're an exhibitionist? Are you doing it because you want the money? Are you doing it because you want to be famous? What are you doing it for? I don't understand what the purpose of it is. Love Island is full of himbos and bimbos. That's all it is. And you want to see the American versions. Oh, my goodness me. Dreadful. And uh, another one here says, where's the lightning? Waited all night for it, says Gary. Well, we've not seen it, but certain parts of the country have had it. The house, says Beverly, is a terraced Victorian cottage. Water came in through guttering over the bay window in the lounge. Oh, dear. That's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Hope you're insured. Hope you're insured. Get some people out to do it. Mind you, build. Have you noticed builders at the moment? They're coining it. They're absolutely coining it. And do you remember I told you that we have a fountain on the patio, which has now been drenched. It's all very lovely, but it's got a ball that turns at the top. Well, one of our neighbours, he's a little boy. He keeps taking the ball off the top and playing with it. Now this is solid glass. If he dropped this on his foot, he'd have a broken foot. So we're going to have stern words with, uh, with Mummy today because he keeps taking it off. Last time he took it off, it's, it broke a piece off the ball and smashed one of the, um, the tiles on the patio. So we're going to have to say to him, don't touch it. Because if it drops on his foot, we'll have to close the patio down because it then becomes health and safety. And, you know, little, little boys, you know, dropping a solid glass ball and it's, a, it's quite substantial size. Well, it's, it's not a very high fountain. It's just it's quite a low fountain. But uh, no, he, he, he's got this obsession with taking it off there and dropping it on the ground. And it was rolling about yesterday. 
So uh, we shall stop that today, definitely. Uh, drug driving bans have doubled, hit 20,000. Royal Ascot continues with another bunch of dreadful outfits. Dreadful outfit. I've never seen. I mean, poor old Sophie Wessex. God, 11 woman. Have you, I mean, have you been to Specsavers? That outfit is just awful. I'm sure it probably cost an arm and a leg or two arms and two legs. But whatever it is, it just looks dreadful. And there's a lovely picture of a group of people out on a little rowboat, it looks like to me, whale watching. And they're all looking out the front of this little boat. There's about, it looks like there's about 10 of them crammed onto it. And the whale has come up at the back of the boat. And it, it comes out of the water because whales can do that. And they're obviously a little bit curious, like, what the dickens is going on here? And they can't see it. They're sort of splashing around in the water, hoping to attract whales. Whether you feed them or, the, or whales just go there to get their photos taken, I've got no idea. But uh, it's the funniest picture you'll ever see. And then you see them all turn around and going, it's here. It's here. It's very good, actually. Tom Daly shows his uh, son the spot where his career hit his high point. We always knew that Tom Daly uh, would make a fantastic father. You know, to see his son, who I don't know, must be about six or seven, holding his hand is so cute. So, so cute. Very sweet. What do you, what's the matter now? What's the, what, what is it? Look at the son's age. How old is he? He's only little, so he can't be any more than eight. He's two, is he? Blimey. Big two. Very big two. And, uh, sorry, eight. Well, I thought he looked uh, eight. <laughs> uh, eight for eight, five, oh. Steve at lbc.co.uk. And, uh, oh dear, poor old Lara. Oh, only 15 followers, Lara. We're putting you out of your misery, uh, I think. <laughs> yes, we weren't. You mean you really need to get your brain in gear, dear. We weren't critiquing. You need to listen. Pro I can't help it if you're stupid. I mean, that I can't, you know, help you with your education. We said we weren't complaining about the breastfeeding. We we're complaining about coming off in the middle of a rugby game. OK, wash your ears out, Lara, but uh, we're going to have to lose you. Sorry, 420. And uh, and you, you'll have to you'll have to disappear, won't you, dear? So now who are you going to write to? Oh dear, I don't know. I'm sure there must be people. You must have a friend somewhere. Uh, Kim Marsh says, don't wait for a cancer check. Her father, who is 76, has got prostate cancer. OK, and it's spread. And the reason it's spread and the reason she's telling you is because he didn't go to the doctors. Now, I've said, and I shall stand by it, that uh, it's not up to her to tell us to go to the doctor. It's up to him to tell people Listen, this is the state I'm in at the moment because I didn't go to the doctor. But because she's on the television, apparently people think it's her sort of business. But he's obviously had this for some time because it's spread throughout his body. Quite quickly, prostate cancer is the biggest killer for men. And so if you feel that you've got a problem with your prostate, go to the doctors. And the, and the, the indication would be, first of all, weeing's a bit of a problem. Now, that putting too fine a point on it, you know, there could be pain. Go there. You can get uh, an ultrasound and you can you can find out. I mean, the symptoms would be, you know, needing to pee more frequently, often during the night, needing to rush to the toilet, difficulty in starting to pee. In other words, you know, you stand there waiting, 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 weak flow. Feeling that your bladder is not emptied fully blood in your urine. OK, that, that would be some of the symptoms which could ind indicate the, uh, the onset of prostate cancer. What do you have to do? I mean, it, prostate cancer doesn't usually cause any symptoms until the cancer has grown large enough to put pressure on the tube that carries urine from the bladder out of your willy. OK, but I mean, if you have any of those symptoms, like, you know, people say to me, oh, what are the symptoms of diabetes? Well, one of them is going to the toilet a lot. You know, don't be embarrassed to go. Listen, everybody talks about it. Everybody talks about it. Go to the doctors. It's like if, if you think that you've got a pain in your chest, you think maybe you've got heart pain, go to the doctors. It's no good sort of leaving it as late as Kim Marsh's father has at 76 and the cancer has spread quite quickly throughout his body into his spine, everything. Go to the bloody doctors. What more can we do? What more can we do? You, you, you can't sort of you know, impress on people enough that if there's something that is different with your body that you're not used to. I mean, the weeing thing, you know, standing over the toilet, if you're a man, because it, it does tend to affect more men than women, and you're sort of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for sort of, you know, the wee to start, 
without putting too fine a point. But if we don't talk about it, you know, more people are going to die. It's a big killer of men. You know, and if you leave it too late, knowing something's wrong, then, you know, it, it makes it even more difficult to get it sorted out. So uh, I speak from experience. I speak from experience. So you go to the doctors, you make an appointment as quick as possible, and you say to them, I've got these these problems but it's 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 the weeing thing sometimes you wait for it and then you know dribble which is uh, which is not very good at all okay so go to the doctor go and talk to somebody who knows about these things there's so many experts out there who can help you today um uh steve uh, if you need an arc talk to me i know a guy I know, I know. Right, you're barred. Uh, another one says, if you've been to Long Acre, Long Acre's Garden Centre in Bagshot, they sell the lemon puff biscuits that you like. Yeah, but are they? Because Paul Cooper bought a packet of lemon puff biscuits the other day, and I said, I bet you bought those from uh, Mr Modi's shop. And they're very nice, but they're not the same puff biscuits that we had. <laughs> Mark in Romford says... Uh, uh, wait a minute, I've lost the thing. E Evan Almighty is the most expensive comedy film ever made and just broke even at the box office. Really? So, uh, but it, would de it definitely wasn't uh, Gareth Noah. I don't even like Russell Crowe. I saw him in, uh, what was he in? He was in um, Gladiator, wasn't he? The budget, the budget for that film was 175 million. It took 173 million. Somebody's missing two million. Missing two million. You have to check all these things. Uh, Warren? <laughs> yes, you do, is the answer. Yes, you definitely do. And uh, he's, he's got his computer problems again. Computer, seriously, I mean, honestly. He lives on that computer. But that's the trouble you see at this time of the morning. This is the best time to go on the computer, isn't it? Because everybody's asleep in the house and it's, it's very quiet, which is quite nice. Uh, Steve? Uh, Jeremy Clarkson said his days in employment are numbered because he eats meat, uses petrol and is, and is outspoken. Good Lord, I eat meat, I use petrol, I'm, I don't think I'm outspoken at all. I've never thought, timid, I'm quite a shy, retiring sort of person, you know. I'm always, you'll always find me in the kitchen at parties going, would anybody like a volleyball? You know, I don't want to push myself. I don't like that kind of thing. Yeah, would you like a lemon puff biscuit? Would you like, a, I've got a little ginger beer, would you like a ginger beer? Please. I don't, I'm, I'm not good at parties anyway, actually. I'm, I'm the worst person. I really am. I, I, I just don't... I'm, I'm just not a party sort of person. I'm really not. I'm much more going out for dinner with sort of like six to eight people, which is much nicer. You go out for dinner or lunch with people and you have a few sort of bevies and then you sort of st stagger out of the front door and uh, an attempt to find your car, uh, you know, your, your, your taxi. You probably didn't know my dad, Robert. But when he was alive, he made a will and left a gift to Macmillan Cancer Support. It means that in many ways, he still lives on. The advisor, helping a patient get a grant to pay their energy bills. Dad made that happen. The nurse, advising a mastectomy patient and what to wear to her son's wedding. That was also because of him. Almost a third of Macmillan's vital services are funded by gifts and wills from people just like my dad and you. So search Macmillan Legacy today and help them do whatever it takes. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, uh, Steve. You're such a blessed prostate scaring family recently. It's, it's just, listen, if, you, if something goes wrong with your body, as we're all at that sort of age, you go to the doctor. Listen, all they're going to say is, oh, that's nothing. You know, but if you think that it's worth going to the go, go. Peter in Warwick says, uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer, 2019, during a routine check, zero symptoms, 40 doses of radiotherapy during lockdown, beat the booger, get tested. And David in Beckham says, uh, some of those symptoms can mean it's simply enlarged, so it doesn't mean it's serious. You, you go to the doctors, OK? You go to the doctors. It's as simple as that. You don't go to the doctors and have a, an ultrasound or something like that. It could be bad. And I would hate to think that somebody gone, oh, it doesn't matter. David in Beckenham said it was OK. Some of the symptoms just mean it could be enlarged. Go to the doctors. You're not an expert. Go to the doctors. You know, it's like you're in the pub, isn't it? You know, and you go, oh, I think, I, I think I'll build an extension. There'll be some drunk at the end of the bar. Oh, I'll build it for you. Lovely. That's good. Uh, Steve, uh, somebody says, when you tell people they're barred for a bad joke, is that genuine? Do I sound like I'm joking? You're barred. And uh, remember Lincoln biscuits? No. Butter puffs. 
No. Butter puffs are the things that you have um, uh, with, with cheese on. Do you know I couldn't find that cheese the other day? Do you remember we looked at the cheese and Marmite spread? No, I couldn't find it. So, I mean, I'm hoping it's going to be available soon. I found some Marmite cheese slices. Uh, but to be honest with you, they were way too expensive, about £2.90 or something. And I thought, I'm not spending that on six pieces of processed cheese, thank you very much indeed. I've become quite, quite mean. Uh, Lincoln Biscuits. Type of circular short dough decorated with some raised dots. The McVitie's version had the word Lincoln embossed on the biscuit at the centre. Recently, it's been difficult to obtain in the United Kingdom. Oh, right. So many biscuits that we remember. You know, and I used to work for McVitie's. And, no, no, please don't text in about your favourite biscuits because I'll bar you instantly. OK, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing. In fact, bet- between me and the producer, I mean, he's actually sometimes worse than I am. I'm actually quite, quite. Bene- but I mean, the first person who types in with, do you remember th- this biscuit? You'll be disappearing forever. You know, he's, 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 he's very hot on things like that. But I used to work for McVitie's, so I used to watch them making biscuits. But I don't remember them making this biscuit. I remember wafers, penguins, bourbons, shortbread uh, and other things which was very nice. And uh, Steve, when you go out for dinner with six to eight friends, are you mostly the centre of attention? I don't think it's mostly the centre of attention. I am the centre of attention, of course. It's in my honour, generally the dinners. It's, you know, if if, if I'm going out with Mr M from around here and my friends, um, we just all sort of chat like normal radio presenters do. You know, because about about three quarters of us are actually radio presenters, but all the people that we go out with are in the radio business. I've been out with all sorts of people. And uh, no, I mean, I mean, sometimes, you know, if I'd have a couple of Proseccos, I could be the, the centre of attention. Um, but that would just be the, the normal thing. I mean, generally speaking, when I when I go out to a restaurant, in fact, when I went to Little Italy, I think the last time there were people in there who were listeners of mine, who were nothing to do with our, our little group at all. They were all sitting in the front and, uh, and somebody said, are you Steve Allen? And they went, so you have to have a picture taken. And, you know, I mean, you can imagine if you were sort of like a proper celebrity, the oddest place that you met people, the toilet, the toilet, you'd be standing in, in, in the toilet, minding your own business, you know, to buffing up your fingernails. And somebody would go, you Steve Allen? You go, oh, God. <sighs> yeah, yeah, never said a word. They just recognise. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, prostate cancer affects more men than women. And... Uh, it does affect more men than women. It's, yes, because women don't have prostate. So there you go. Did you not know that? Oh, God, honestly, there's another one we have to lose as well. And uh, 0436, I think. There you go. We, we can lose you. So women, that, that's why women don't, don't go into, they don't have prostate. Do you not know that? God, honestly. How embarrassing. Did you have an education or are you just generally thick? There's nothing worse, is there? You see about these, these people, there was somebody, there's, there's a bloke in the paper today. And he's uh, he's uh, just been uh, fired from a company because he wrote something on Twitter, which was he wrote a rude word about his boss. A bit unwise because the boss saw it. And uh, and so they, they fired him. And he said, oh, I didn't think that was anything offensive about that. Uh, the industrial tribunal thought differently and uh, said, no, that, that was grossly offensive. And then he said, oh, I think I'm disabled. I think I've got... Uh, what did he say? I mean, he thought he had a couple of things and the, uh, the judge said, I think you haven't. You just, and so he's, he's one of those stupid trolls. So when somebody writes in about, you know, Steve Allen thinks that, you know, women don't get prostate cancer, it's because they don't have prostates. It's like, you know, you won't venture any further than this in your life because you're not bright enough, are you really? Uh, you know, and it's not your fault. It's not your fault, you know, because it's, it's just that you found it. There it is, 0436. So, uh, uh, love one. Uh, and also, somebody, you only have to mention breastfeeding, immediately people can't hear properly. You know, if, if, only, if only people could listen properly. I, remember, I told you years ago, somebody phoned up and said, you just said this. I said, no, no, I didn't say that. No. They said, I've just heard you. And you think, here we go, thicko, we have to try and prove it. So we played the bit of the programme back. Because you can do that on radio, it's because it's all sort of stored in the machine, because it turns into the podcast. We played it back, and then and you just heard click with the telephone, because quite clearly she was not the brightest penny in the box. Uh, Steve and da, 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 Burger King are doing frozen strawberry Fanta and frozen Coca-Cola. Do you like slushies? Well, I've seen them doing it. It's on, the, it's on YouTube. Go and watch them making it. You know, go, go and watch them making it. They do it in the Indian 
uh, street markets and they have it going round in this machine and then he takes the Coca-Cola bottle out, he hits the bottom of it, which is essential for turning it into slush, and then takes the top off and, and it, it becomes slush. I'm assuming that they're not doing that in Burger King. I can't see somebody going, picking this thing, and it just goes, it churns backwards and forwards. It's full of ice and all the rest of it. So they're obviously got something which is, uh, which is different, different. Uh, 84850, oh, steve at uk. Oh, somebody else sort of asking about Lincoln biscuits. You're barred. And uh, we'll take some more of them. Uh, <laughs> my wife said she's leaving me because of my obsession with plants, Steve. I said, for crying out loud, Petal, where's this stemmed from? That's almost intelligent for this time of the morning. I do tend to discover, actually, that as we sort of edge ever nearer to seven o'clock in the morning. This is kind of the, the end of the throes of Darren's programme. There are still a few people on major medication who are sort of hanging around and they've got nobody else to talk to, so they want to bore me. You know, like I really don't need anything like that at all. And, uh, oh, got another. You've, you've logged me out. It's logged me out. Oh, Lord above. OK, first number is... OK. Uh, second number is... Add four to that. Yep. Add one more. Add one more. Then go back to that one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we have to do this. It doesn't make any difference because you, you can't get into my uh, into my account. But we have to we, we have a, a Microsoft verification code thing which comes through. And it it confused me the first time round because somebody said, Oh, you get a verification code. So it doesn't matter where I am, if I log into my account, it will then say we are now sending this. I get it from the bank as well. You know, if somebody recently did something and we're going to send a verification notice to your phone to make sure it's you. And uh, and most of the time it is me, actually, because I've, I've never had my uh, never had my account hacked or anything like that at all, which is uh, which is very good, isn't it? Uh, eight for eight, five. Oh, Steve, the worst biscuits are Jaffa cakes. It's a cross between a stale biscuit and a cake. Oh, no, Jaffa cakes are nice and they do all different flavours. All different flavours. They're absolutely fantastic. Really nice. And uh, and Kim says, I second that. Anything that's abnormal or indeed different for your body, get it checked. Any doctor or nurse worth their salt certainly won't mock or judge you. I've never heard people do that. Never heard people do that at all. You just go there because you get the advice. It's no good sort of going onto the internet and sort of checking the internet to see if, you know, you know, I've got these symptoms, you know, have I, have I got COVID? Am I sneezing? Am I sniffing too much? Have I got a runny nose? Have I got a temperature? The interesting thing was is that they do the, the temperature at all the hospitals. If I go to get my uh, eyes tested, like the other day, they test your temperature. But I, I carry a thermometer with me. I mean, how many people do that now? Who'd have thought a year ago, more than a year ago, you'd be carrying, you know, lots of face masks with you? And a thermometer. I mean, it's just the daftest thing ever. But I loved. I do it first thing in the morning. I get up, I do my injection, and uh, and then I do the thermometer. And you either stick it in your ear, or you do it on your forehead. I get much better results on my forehead. What? What's the matter? No, it's not a gla- no. It's no. It's sorry. sorry talk among yourselves. Honestly, when I mean, you've got to sort the producer out, you can imagine how daft it gets, can't you? I bought this was. I bought this on um, on Amazon. And you, you turn it on and it goes low. And then if, if you're doing your forehead, you just hold it there and you push the little button and it tells me, oh, 180, no, yeah, 34.8. We've, we've, we've dropped a little bit. So let's try it. So then you take, take the cap off and you could do your ear and you stick it in your ear. It's hilarious this, isn't it, honestly, I tell you. This is, this is the future of radio. And there you go, you do that. 34.2 again. So I'm nothing if not consistent. I mean, normally, by the end of the programme, I think it's because it's cold in here. I think that's what it is. I'm totally convinced because when I'm, when I'm normal at home, I'm 36.2, 36.3, which is about as perfect as you're going to get from anybody. Uh, T in Kingston says, what's the weather today? A little bit wet. But are oh, you playing golf? Perfect weather for you. Perfect weather for you. Just take your, your Wellington boots with you. Quarter to five. At Honda, we've been listening out for inspiration and discovered something everyone wants in a car. Nothing. So, introducing the Honda HRV Hybrid. 
The exterior is very nothingy, just beautiful clean lines front to back. And you don't need a key or fob, so there's nothing to forget or lose. You can do everything with your phone. In the back, it's all about nothingness, with its legroom views and seats that can disappear, making way for even more nothingness. The HRV Hybrid. Nothing to it, really. Where will listening take us next? Honda. The power of dreams. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Got a lovely poem for you this morning. Very late. It's not long, which is uh, which is uh, which is good. We we quite we quite like this one. A man collapsed on the London Eye this morning. Medics say he's slowly coming round. I've not heard that one before. It's quite good actually. And John in Slough says, "Oh my God!" I don't think you can say that. That's blasphemy, John. But I'll, I won't pick you up on that. Uh, he says, you are defensive this morning. No sense of humour and ridiculed and barred four listeners only 36 minutes into the programme. You won't have any listeners left, mate. Well, A, I'm not your mate. And you were wrong. It's not four people I barred this morning. It's now five. There you go. <laughs> Poor old John, honestly. Now no friends. Mind you, stuck in slough. What's that famous for, dear? What is it famous for, John? You know what it's famous for, don't you? The Mars factory. And what did the poet laureate write? Come bombs, rain on slough. Couldn't have happened to a nicer place. Uh, I still like that, the man collapsing on the London Eye. Medics say slowly coming round. That's, that's quite a good one, actually. I wouldn't have guessed that one. Uh, Shane says, I'm on the bus. Mum says hello. We had lunch at Westfield Shopping Centre. That's not our shopping centre. It's theirs over there in Hurstville, um, which, is, uh, which is very nice indeed. And uh, Steve, I worked at Cadbury's during college holidays. My job was putting flakes on the flake cakes in the cool part of the belt. I was 18. Oh, right. My eyes were opened by the women's juicy gossip. Oh, God, bloody women in factories, Winnie. Oh, I can tell you, I used to go to the uh, McVitie's factory in Toll Cross in Scotland, and um, they used to have a big laundry up there, and I would go on factory visits, and I would head for the laundry in the morning, and the women there, you feared for your life. They were, and they'd go... You, you, <laughs> can't do the accent you'll have a drink they were drinking whiskey at 8 30 in the morning seriously i would never known anything like it it was like you would stagger out of there three sheets to the wind and they'd all be goosing you and all the rest of it it was hilarious and i discovered actually that women who work in factories they, they've got more juicy gossip than anybody else the blokes all look a bit like i mean you know you kind of leave them to one side, actually. But the women were very up for it. And it, it was almost like watching a carry-on film from years ago, which was Carry On at Your at, uh, carry on at your Convenience, or My Convenience, or somebody's convenience. And uh, with Kenneth Williams running a, a factory that made toilets. And the women, who were very feisty, and they pushed the men aside, they went, Psh, we're going back to work. It was, it was very good. It was, it was just like that. So putting the flakes on the chocolate, very nice. Very nice, indeed. I like things like that. Uh, so, 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 so. Oh, the pals thrown out of the pub. Remember yesterday, the two girls thrown out of Weatherspoons uh, because the manager said they were dressed inappropriately. And if you looked at the outfits, they were totally inappropriate. Totally inappropriate. I mean, you know, if you were working in a, in a pole dancing club, that would be completely different. But uh, no, not, not for a Weatherspoons. It would ju- I mean, people would think that they'd changed and put red lights in there. It just looked awful. So the so the Sun have got lots of celebrities who've also worn similar outfits, but there is just nobody that the Sun have come up with who looked anything like as bad as the, these two the other day. What on earth possessed them to wear an outfit like that? I suppose because it made them famous for their brief five nanoseconds. Uh, also, here's uh, Noel Gallagher, says the Sun's front page where he slates woke Prince Harry is great. He used a little bit of a rude word before that time. And uh, from Russia with very little love, leaders in frosty talks. This is Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin. Uh, no Thor in a five hour meeting. And I don't think uh, that Putin spoke English, even though we know he does speak English. I don't think he's very comfortable speaking English. Uh, also, the dangers of the medical lockdown delays. 50,000 fewer referrals for prostate checks during Covid crisis. Uh, 34,400 fewer breast cancer referrals made in the same period. Three million people miss out on crucial testing. If you have something that is not going right with your uh, with your body, then you go to the doctor. You go and get somebody to check it out. You know, you, you, you'll you always be able to get uh, um, a, uh, a referral from the doctor. And so it will help. I promise you it will help, really. 
Uh, so, two successful candidates, beef eaters, but I thought it was only a short while ago they were, they were getting rid of them. Uh, the Omen Warders are a familiar sight, but you've got to have served in the regular armed services for at least 22 years and hold the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. And the job advert reads, your main responsibility will be to stir the spirit of every visitor to HM Tower of London. 32,000 a year. Now, whether or not you live on site or off site, I'm not sure. Some people live on site. I'd love to live at the Tower of London. I think that'd be really cool. Really cool to live there, you know, in a place that has got so much history. Definitely. That'd be my kind of thing. And they do have the locking up at night, the keys, the ceremony. They still do that. And you've still got the crown jewels there, which apparently, and I only realised this the other day, that they're all in these cases. But at night when they close, the cases sink down and it's totally secure. So you don't have the repeat of Captain Blood years ago who uh, went in and robbed the crown jewels. Now you, you can't even see them after they've actually closed the place down. But I'd love to live there. It must be fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, what else we got here? Beverly Callard, who says here she will not get work unless she has a facelift. She's so worried about the ageing process, which men tend not to worry about. She claims that the industry is sexist and ageist, uh, whilst leaving her pressured into looking like a stick insect. No, the problem she would have, I mean, if we're being totally honest about it, is the fact that she is so synonymous with playing Liz McDonald in Coronation Street that that's what people would say. No matter what you put her in, she's always going to be Liz McDonald because that's what a soap does. Hilary Kingsley wrote a fantastic book, uh, which is, is there life after soap? And for many people, there wasn't. There was, you know, because people get oh, no, a bit too, too synonymous. There were a few people who managed to make it onto Last of the Summer Wine, one of the few bastions of employing people who've been in soaps who were well known. And, uh, and, and so people get typecast, even though you're known to millions, you know, and you can walk down the street and everybody goes, hello, love your character or love you or whatever it happens to be. But in fact, really, it's, it's closing doors. And as fast as one door closes, another one closes. It doesn't, uh, it, it's not always the best bit of news at all. And uh, <laughs> Steve, something else Slough's famous for, one of the highest crash for cash figures in the country. Crash for cash. Now, I know what that is. That's where somebody deliberately stages an accident. Have you seen the Chinese one? The Chinese one is hilarious, which is a bloke driving very slowly along a road in a, outside one of the main cities. And a bloke runs from the side, throws himself on the bonnet of the car and then lies on the ground, trying to pretend that he's been injured by this car. So the car reverses and the bloke follows it, jumps onto the bonnet and then throws himself on the ground again. Have you found it? It's really interesting. Really interesting. You can't find anything this morning. You're hopeless, honestly. At least he managed to find the dump button. Oh, it's an advert. We've got an advert. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> here we go. Look. I mean, it's, I mean, you watch th this man here. I wonder if this, th th this isn't the one that I was thinking of. But the moment that guy goes, he's now going to, there you go. He goes as if he, he slowly falls to the ground. He's a crook. He's a crook. He's sort of pretending that that car hit him. He kept shaking his hand as though he was injured. But some of the other ones are hilarious. It's called Pengsi, the practice of crooks, placing ostensibly expensive, fragile items, usually porcelain, in places where they may easily be knocked over. But they do it where scammers get injured in traffic accidents, but they're not injured at all. But over here, you get people who will sort of indicate and you go left, but somebody cuts in front of you. It's called crash for cash. And then the person in the car will go, I cut my neck. I cut my neck. I've got whiplash, which of course is a basic lie. You'll find more people lying about something like that, you know, <laughs> than anything else. It's funny, that they, but, but the Chinese ones I'd never seen before. But you get them and sometimes the, 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 the sort of the, because the first time it started happening, the drivers didn't know what was going on. All they knew is that there was somebody who sort of fell onto the front of their car and then fell right down in front of it. Basically crooks, basically crooks. Uh, Steve, I used to drive daily near the McVitie's factory in Harleston. The smell coming out of there is absolutely divine. Yes, I know that factory very well in, uh, in Harleston. That was uh, McVitie's factory number... Wait a minute. One was Osterley, two was Harleston, three was Liverpool, four was... No, three, three was Manchester, four was Liverpool and five was Scotland. And I know that because working for the radio there, 
we used to get uh, UBN calling cards. And so if it had no, they, they, these calling cards, they would fill in in the factories because they discovered at United Biscuits years ago that they were losing a lot of staff. So they thought if they set up their own radio station, that would keep the staff, you know, there because they, they felt it was uh, like a community. So Dale worked there. I worked there. Loads of people who ended up at Capital Radio because there was this was all prior to people uh, working. There was either Hospital Radio or there was McVitie's. Uh, and there was another one, I believe, at Kimberley Clark. But uh, United Biscuits Network was the biggest. Full time, 24 hours, DJing, £400. What was it? It was £100 a week, the money, back in these early 70s. And uh, Roger Scott was there, Nicky Horn, Adrian Love, Graham Dean. I mean, most people who started on commercial radio started at UBN because it was a fully equipped radio station going out on landline to the factories. So it was like a telephone line it went out on. And every two positions in the factories with all the girls had a speaker. And they could send these UBN calling cards in. So you'd go, oh, we've got one from Mary on Jelly Rounds number five. And she and she go, ooh, it's me. And uh, what kind of, every sort of music. There was a playlist, current music, uh, plus every hour there would be a sort of the featured record of the week. Oh, yes, we, we were on every... Uh, Every record company's mailing list, they would turn up and Dale and I go through the cars and pick up the music. And then in the Osterley factory, some of the girls, because it was it was mainly an Asian workforce, would bring their own albums in and say, Steve, could you play this? So that's how I knew all about Indian film music, because I was playing Indian film music, Bollywood. I was playing, you know, Kishore Kumar, Lata Mangeshka and all the other people in Kabi Kabi and all the other films many, many years ago. And luckily, it still remained with me. So that's good, isn't it? What are we going to ban in the next hour? I'm sure we'll find somebody. I'm feeling in that kind of mood today because it's Thursday and we didn't have the rain that I was promised, but it could arrive tomorrow. Sometimes things that are your type on paper don't always turn out to be for you in real life. That's why T-Levels, which mix classroom and on-the-job learning, can help you decide what to do next while you're doing it. Designed with employers, they can help you get the jump into work and apprenticeship or university with subjects covering software production and design construction and health and science to name a few search get the jump and see what's out there for you you're listening to a podcast from lbc morning everybody nice to have your company welcome to thursday welcome to well you might have had a lot of rain we didn't get a lot of rain in london but i'm told it's on the way which is not very good, is it, really? And and some parts of the country, judging by what people have been uh, writing in, have had the thunder and the lightning and the one thing... We, but they did warn us about the flooding. They did warn us about, you know, there would be torrential rain. So far, I've not actually experienced it. But uh, And I should have actually brought down the umbrella yet. I forgot to take the umbrella down. Mainly because I've not seen the wind. We've we got the wind coming in. We're not really sure. I mean, the latest... They, they seem to be changing the weather almost on an hourly an hourly basis because one minute I was giving you yellow warnings yesterday and then the next minute the whole thing changes but I did bring my umbrella in I'm not going to fall so thunder at six calm afterwards it's odd isn't it really very odd so we're going to get thunder at six do we get lightning do we get maybe maybe thunder calmer afterwards so no rain after eight well that's not much use I'll finish at seven but still a, 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 a weather warning. Still there, is it? Oh, well. Still there. Steve, it's freezing in Sydney. It's 15 degrees, says Shane. Oh, wow. And uh, Steve, my colleague's husband is a beef eater. It's amazing to live in the Tower of London. The outer walls are six foot thick. It's cosy. Oh, I'd love to live there. I'd love to. I've been there on, on quite a number of occasions. Quite a number of occasions. I love it. And... Um, Mo, Mo says, I've just saw a man spill all his Scrabble words on the floor. I said to him, what's the word on the street? She says, um, want to bar me? No, I'm feeling, I'm feeling quite benevolent, actually, this morning. We just had to get rid of the stupid ones. <laughs> when you get rid of the stupid ones, you know, we're, it's all fine, actually. Rock the Boat, a film of the early days of Radio Caroline, probably depicted the, uh, the best times ever. I don't think I ever saw Rock the Boat. I don't think I ever saw it. I mean, I, I didn't do that floating around in the in the sea that was what they that they could do because they were so far off the coast they could broadcast if they'd came come in any closer they used to get cars to line up on the cliffs and flash their lights and stuff like that they all started there emperor roscoe tony blackburn of course loads of johnny walker i think they were all out there i didn't do that i'd be hopeless on a boat i'd be sick all the time 
but they Kenny Everett I think was out there as well yeah happy days for a lot of, a lot of people went out and worked uh, for AB Nathan on the um voice of peace that was another boat that was floating around but i mean without these places you wouldn't have had the radio presenters that you ended up with mind you not that there were any speech radio stations that was the odd thing there weren't any speech radio stations i mean lbc was the very first very first commercial radio station on air and and it was speech and it's it's kind of still leading the way other people may be pale imitators but uh, but they can't i mean it always amazes me actually is that some sort of place is sort of set up basically using staff that we've actually got rid of, <laughs> which I always think is very entertaining. Uh, in Fulham, says Mike, in Fulham, we had an hour of torrential rain last night. Really? An hour of torrential rain? Well, I don't know. Well, actually, by the time I get home, I should probably discover that the water butt is full up to the, uh, to the roof again. But as long as the temperature stays about what it is at the moment, I'm quite happy with that. Poem. Little poem. Little poem. And... Um, this is uh, Rose Fileman, mice, just called mice. I think mice are rather nice. Their tails are long, their faces small, they haven't any chins at all. Their ears are pink, their teeth are white, they run about the house at night. They nibble things they shouldn't touch, and no one seems to like them much. But I think mice are rather nice. There you go. Short and sweet, isn't it? I, of course, can't stand mice. <laughs> I'm not very good with mice at all. And uh, and so I, th- I think I must, I must check whether I've got Rock the Boat. But the trouble is I've got so many DVDs. I'm never going to find these blooming things at all. But uh, somebody else talking about uh, uh, the McVitie's factory. You could always smell... It, it was it was sort of a, a, a sort of a cross between sort of chocolate and biscuit and everything else. You could walk into the factories and all the factories used to have factory shops. And because we were based at Osterley as part of the, uh, the studio, we had one, two, three studios, a record library and a program controller's office. And uh, it was it was all very nice, actually. It was very cosy, but it was ever so sad when it closed down. <laughs> very sad because we used to have these flashing lights. That were on the, there was like a board of green lights and red, and if the volume of a record went went low, the lights would start flashing. You'd have to whack up the volume. And I remember that uh, that the closing announcement and the, there is a tape actually, which I've got somewhere at home, which is the final hour of LBC, of LBC final hour of UBN, and it finishes with with the program controller saying the time is now so and so so and so and so UBN is now closing down, and we were all sitting in the library. And all of a sudden, the light started twinkling on the board. It was really awful. <laughs> it was terribly sad. Mind you, I was already working at LBC. So uh, I was, yeah, I was over myself. But no, I found it terribly emotional. Terribly emotional. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve. And uh, something else Slough is famous for. Apart from, is it, it, it is the Mars factory, isn't it, in Slough? I'm pretty certain. Yeah, pretty certain. Sorry? It's uh, the McVitie's factory in Manchester produces 2000 Jaffa cakes a minute. I know I've watched them making them and I know um, that they have somebody sitting there with a, a long spike. It's a long like a rod with a spike at the end of it. So it's it's bent down like that. And they sit there watching the Jaffa cakes going through. And it's their job to go like that. If the jam is off centre, they will only have the jam because it squirts, but sometimes they get out of line and then they go into the chocolate bath and you can see that they're out of kilter and they pick them off and throw them away. Pick them off, throw them away. It's a, but they're, they're, literally, it's never ending because they, you have the, the, the Jaffa biscuity thing at the bottom and then, because you can't recycle them once they've had, you know, the chocolate and the thing put on. So we used to get them in the shop. In, in, the, in the factory shop, you could buy all these sort of, you know, broken biscuits or whatever it was it was much 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 cheaper and so they didn't actually get to throw them away but they would sit there pick it up so the machine that they'd all come down thousands of them and the machine would go put on the orange stuff and then they'd get tipped onto a sort of like a grill which went through through the chocolate bath hence the chocolate only being on the top which is good and uh, (laughs) maybe you should uh, says sarah in thatcham hold a poetry competition for all of the all of the listeners oh lord I don't think we should do that. I've done that before, actually. Oh, look, cherry-flavoured Jaffa cakes. It's a nice idea. Passion fruit. Where were you? Uh, something. Oh, you can get. Uh, you can buy those in this country. Really? Cherry flavour. Do you know I love cherry? Anything cherry. 
They do. I've, I've tried the lime ones. The lime ones are okay. Seven pound eight pence for three boxes. That seems a lot of money, doesn't it? <laughs> seems, I think they should be cheaper than that. But on the other hand, is that on Amazon? I might buy them. I don't, don't want to, but I might have to. Uh, Steve, uh, up in Glasgow, there used to be the Steamies, where the women used to go to do their laundry, says Kim. Tony Roper wrote a book which became a play. My mother and I went to see it up at the King's Theatre. Terrific night. Yeah, I like things like that because it, it's bits that you don't remember. It's like, you know, do you know what, um, oh, what do they call them now? There's a name for them. It's the women who go down onto the underground at night. When they turn the power off, they will go and clean in between all the tracks for all the rubbish and everything else. Are they called fluffers or is my getting that for not that's something else, is it? There's a name for them. And these women go down there onto the underground at night and they're basically clearing all the stuff that's uh, fallen down between the tracks. Imagine there must be mice. Ev it is fluffers. I thought it was who are also used in something else, aren't they? There you go, Fluffers, London Underground, the name given to a person employed to clean the tracks in the tunnels. There you go. In fact, there was a film made by British Pathé in 1947. And in 1989, a documentary filmmaker, Molly Deneen, chronicled the work of a team of Fluffers at Angel Station. So now you know. I thought I was right, actually. Just, because you get all the fluff that comes in and it sits in the middle. But if, if you, I've stood on platforms before on the underground. I haven't used the underground ages, ages and ages now. Um, even though I get it for free. Mice running across and underneath the things. There's, there must be millions of... My, very good documentary about them. Heart of the Angel on iPlayer. Heart of the Angel on iPlayer. So, in fact, you can find, actually, you know, doing... All sorts of things, actually. You can find everything on um, on YouTube. There is nothing you can't find. I went uh, this morning, don't ask me why, I had this song in my head and it went, you're the lady, you're the lady that I love. And then she goes, I'm the lady, the lady who? And it's Esther and Abby Ofarim with Cinderella Rockefeller. And I found it. On huge, I know, I seriously, listen, I don't know, I need to get a life, I can't help it, I'm not very well, I'm struggling through life, you know, <laughs> having to bar people every day. Uh, have you had Cadbury's Rum and Raisin? No, I don't, I, I'm not a chocolate person, even though I've said I want to buy these uh, Charbonnet and Walker's chocolates, which the Queen likes, the violet, I've got a thing about violet creams, but I like Palmer Violet Little Sweeties, which are quite nice, and stuff, got some what? Some Palmer, Palmer Violets. Really? What are we doing with Palmer Violets? Oh, they came in that packet yesterday, didn't they? See, they're really sweet, but the, the, have you tried the chocolates? I'll get some chocolates. I'll, I'll, I'll go and find... Today, I will go and find the Charbonnet and what, and I'll bring them in tomorrow. And we could just go crackers, and I can have an overdose of sugar. And we'll all go, wee! Yeah, I should need the weekend to recover, actually. Uh, Barry says, I'm on my way to Harleston to spend the next 12 hours making our lovely biscuits. I'm trying to remember what you made in Harleston at McVitie's. I, c I can remember shortbreads were in Liverpool. Penguins were in Manchester. And I can't remember. In Austerley, they used to make all sorts of things. But they also used to make all the different cakes wasn't just biscuits that McVitie's made. It was cakes as well. And I, th I can't... Was it Mr Kipling's cakes? They, they did all, all sorts of things, actually. All sorts of things. But apparently, says Sam, the cherry Jaffa cakes taste like cough medicine. Listen, I might be one of those people that likes cough medicine. And, uh, Steve, when a student in the late 70s, I worked a couple of summers in the fruit pie filling department at UB Ostley, where my dad was quality control manager. Long, long hours and damned hot and sticky with wasps a go-go, but good money. But we did have, says Chris and Chelsea, a lot of rain around here, midnight last night. Not quite enough to qualify for torrential, but certainly buckets. Certainly buckets. These days there are seven McVitie's factories and each one produces different types of biscuit. Digestives, uh, hobnobs, rich tea and mini cheddars. Mini ch I don't remember them making mini cheddars, but uh, I remember them making wafers. Big sheets of wafer would go and we'd go around the fact we'd have to put a white coat on and you'd have to tuck your hair up into one of those hats. 
I look ridiculous. Why do more broadband switchers choose us? Because EE Broadband is free for three months with nothing to pay up front. It's also ultra reliable and it's powered by BT, keeping home workers working, gamers gaming, and TikTokers ticking. So switch to EE Broadband and get three months free than just $35.99 a month. Now that's why more broadband switchers choose us. Search EE Broadband deals now. Month four from $35.99. 24 month contract. Broadband only. New customers. CPI plus 3.9% increase each march. Verified EE.critic slash claims. Terms apply. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Apparently, cherry Jaffa cakes are really nice, says Anne. Well, there you go. And uh, the florist at the uh, at the top of Twickenham High Street by the Greens sell those chocolates. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to go to um, Bentall's today. No, I'm not going to go to John Lewis because I think John Lewis do all the Charbonnet and Walker's chocolates. I shall, don't worry, I shall find them. I will find them. Uh, Sonny and Cher made that song famous, says Mike. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. It was Esther and Abby Ofarim. Goodness sake. Listen, you're talking to an expert. Don't ever challenge a radio presenter. That's why they're radio presenters. Uh, also, supermarkets have all the flavoured Jaffa cakes, but cheaper, says Alan. All oh, right, OK. I quite like that idea, actually. I think you're right. Uh, Steve, I was wondering if you'd ask your lovely listeners, best place to go for a nice, quiet beach holiday? Portugal's very popular, I believe, at this time. You can go and sit on a beach there. You won't be with anybody at all, and you'll have to self-isolate when you come back. But, I mean, apart from that, it's fairly quiet. Uh, Cornwall's fairly busy. People, are, I mean, put it this way, you can't sit on a beach when it rains, can you? Although you know what the Brits are like. They will sit on the beach when it rains. <laughs> they don't care. Because you just go and sit in the sea. It's only water. I don't know why we're so frightened about water. You see people running, oh, like, you know, you're going to get wet and you're going to melt. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that at all. Uh, Perspex screens, we're told, can spread COVID. Well, that's all we need, isn't it? They say plastic screens in pubs and offices don't work and may even help spread COVID. Now firms are expected to be told to get rid of the barriers which can block airflow and so many increased risk of airborne transmissions. You know, honestly, life changes on a minute-by-minute basis, doesn't it? (laughs) And uh, Steve, must be an age and era thing for Palma Violets. Uh, You need to try Palma Violet gin, apparently. I can't do gin. I've never done gin. I can't. I know there's lots of different uh, designer gins, but not for me. It's a depressant gin. You can get very depressed on gin. So I've I've never done it. I, I I didn't mind the smell of it, but I just I couldn't actually couldn't actually drink the stuff. My friend John Warrington, he loves a gin and tonic. Actually, doesn't just doesn't like one gin and tonic. Likes quite a few, which is good. So it's definitely an age and an era thing for Palma Violet. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But it, 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 it's named, believe it or not, the most unpopular sweet. They say soapy aftertaste, cracked teeth and a pronounced whiff of an old lady. Palmer violets. I think because they used to make, didn't they make a palmer violet smell and ladies would have it as a nosegay or something like that to sort of phew, take away the, the, the smell of, you know, you see people holding something under their nose, little handkerchiefs. I think that was that was sort of like palmer violet. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, well, that's what I thought it was anyway. M&S apparently do lime and passion fruit Jaffa cakes, says Mark in Essex. And uh, so, yeah, somebody else asked me, tell me about the Palmer Violet gin. Definitely not for me. Definitely not for me. <laughs> Would be interesting. Uh, Joyce says, can you stop mentioning mice? I'm terrified of them. Well, that's, that's the way it goes, I'm afraid. That's the way it goes. Some people, I mean, I'm frightened of snakes as well. Shane says, here in New South Wales, they hate mice. I'm lucky. I live in Sydney. See, that doesn't mean anything to me at all. <laughs> it really doesn't. Uh, also, uh, Steve says, Connie, uh, we lost the actress from Gone Girl to uh, Snooker Hit and uh, Scooter Hit and Run. Yes. Uh, Catherine says... When you said there was going to be thunder, then asked if there's going to be lightning. Steve, thunder is the sound of lightning. Is it? I thought it was separate. I've heard cracks of uh, thunder. I've never heard cracks of lightning. So uh, she says, look it up. Yep, apparently you're right. Thunder is the sound caused by a nearby flash of lightning. It could be heard for a distance of only about 10 miles from the lightning strike. Well, aren't you the clever one this morning? And you're in Brentwood. I mean, goodness sake, honestly, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Uh, more outfits from um, Ascot. Uh, celebrities shining. So that's oh, that's how you know how, how close the 
a storm is by how long the thunder takes. Riveting. Do I look like I'm interested? No, of course not. Uh, Rod Liddell's column today, talking about... Um, he says, I wouldn't pin my hopes on July the 19th, being the new Freedom Day. And um, two former director generals of the BBC appeared before a committee of MPs investigating the Bashir affair. It was all about the reporter Martin Bashir using fraudulent methods to get an interview with Diana. The DG at the time was John Burt, uh, the head of news, a deeply unimpressive chap called Tony Hall. He said, you'll be astonished to discover, this is Rod Little writing, that uh, neither of them accepted very much blame for the whole business. Not me, Gov, was the general attitude. That's the problem with the BBC, a behemoth staffed with far too many executives, all of whom refuse to take blame, all of whom are risk averse. That makes for boring programmes and the sort of crisis which occurred with Bashir. Yes, never explain, or no, sorry, never complain, never explain. That's the way it goes, isn't it? The BBC, how marvellous. Well, I think we should get rid of it. We don't have to have it, do we? It's of no consequence to us. They keep, we keep being told it's our BBC. Well, we've all voted. We don't want it anymore. Let's get rid of it. BBC local radio, goodness sake, honestly. You know, I realise it's the only outlet for vicars to actually have their own programme. Bless you all uh, for sort of coming to join us on this Sunday morning. And here are the uh, people. And of course, surprise, surprise. It's uh, Holly Willabooby. And uh, but again, she didn't look as bad as these dreadful girls in the pub yesterday. They were really it looked awful. And so Molly Wood and Amy Lee, both 20 from Reading, were turfed out of Weatherspoons. They weren't turfed out. They just went, we're not serving you. You're inappropriately dressed. You know, but while the young lady showed some underboob, underboob, blimey, uh, fashion editor Clemmy reveals who boobed and who got it chest right. So funny, Clemmy, honestly. There's a career ahead for you. And she's got pictures of Halle Berry, uh, Liv, uh, Lily Allen, uh, Heidi Klum. Have I heard of them all? Yeah. Addison Ray, have you ever heard of her? I've never heard of her either, but she, she, she's a what? She is, you're quite right, actually. She, uh, 20, she channelled her inner Jodie Marsh on the red carpet for the MTV Movie Awards last month, which is never a good idea. Her barely there belt top left very little to the imagination. Oh, so that's what, so she channeled, oh, so because Jodie Marsh was famous for the belt that went, went across her booze, which we were talking about the other day. Maya Jama, uh, as I say, don't really know what she does. And also, and then surprisingly, out of all those people, uh, including Megan Fox, Theresa May. Theresa May. They've got a picture of Theresa May showing a little bit of uh, cleavage and uh, sent Twitter into a meltdown. Did it really? I don't remember that. I do remember the picture, though, at the same time. Uh, also, oh, the, the whale watcher. You've got to see the picture. It's so funny. This whale's come up for a quick look at the, these people just to see what they're doing on the on the boat which is uh, lovely. And, 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 let's have a look. Uh, Rita swimming, Rita Aura again. I thought we'd managed to get rid of Rita Aura, but blow me down, she's popped back up again. Coldplay are ending their self-imposed ban on touring after saying they couldn't travel for environmental reasons. It's amazing how many sort of uh, U-turns all these people do. U-turn if you like, the lady is not for turning. Mug spreaders got their revenge on a badly parked van. <laughs> Did they ever? This is a transit van left across the farmyard entrance while the driver went for a pint. I mean, I have to be honest, he must be the thickest driver under the sun. And also, he's drinking and driving, is he? Well, how interesting. So, he, he parks across an entrance. Yeah, he parks within the limit and then goes off to the pub, which doesn't seem the best thing to do. Anyway, it blocked a 20-tonne tanker and the spreaders contacted the local boozer in a bid to track him down. When he failed to show, they emptied their load over him. The farmer, who didn't want to be named, says, we've had a lot of problems with parking on this occasion. It was pretty obstructive. The entry's ten foot wide and the slurry tankers couldn't turn in. Apparently the lads doing the spreading contacted the pub and warned them, but the van owner later claimed he didn't recognise his own registration number when it was called out. I mean, do we all know our own registration numbers? Well, most of you. However, it ended amicably with a farmer in Wigston saying he didn't realise he was blocking the entrance to the field. He came back to find his van covered in flour. And they've got a picture of it. And uh, to be honest with you, serves him right. They tried that. They did that at Hampton Court. They had a lot of travellers who had moved on to the big field uh, opposite Hampton Court, I think for a funeral or something like that, just at the wrong moment. They wanted to, to make them move on because they came from all over the country. 
and uh, the farmer said, I'm going to be um, slurrying this field. My, my field, I'm going to slurry it, which means that they go down with this thing and you get pig slurry and all the rest of it and uh, blow me down. They, they all went, yeah, 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 whatever. And he started doing it. They couldn't get off the site quick enough. But uh, this one, he said he admitted he was totally in the wrong. They hosed his van down and everybody had a laugh. Then they went back to the pub. So he's already been in the pub boozing. Then he comes back to the van. Oh, hum diddly dum. And then they hose it down. And then he takes them all back to the pub again. And he put money behind the bar and bought the lads a drink. Seems like an awful lot of booze, doesn't it, really? But anyway, do you remember that there was a farm worker who used uh, a telehandler to haul a Vauxhall Courser out of the way after day trippers left it in the entrance of a yard and he dragged it out uh, with his... Uh, with, I mean, to be honest with you, the driver kicked out to stop the driver shoving the car into the main road in County Durham. Didn't help, did it? You know, start parking in wrong places. There's somebody on YouTube. I keep finding these things on YouTube, which are quite amazing, actually. And uh, this is one of a driver in America who's parked his car in a cycle lane. So the cyclist comes up behind him and bangs on the boot of the car. Well, the driver gets out. Don't you touch my car and all this kind of stuff. And the bloke goes... Get your car out of the lane. And the bloke comes up to him really, really close and very menacing. But uh, the cyclist won. Cyclist won on that one. Uh, Harry's set to fly back alone for the Diana statue event. I, I couldn't be less interested. I really couldn't be. And uh, apparently Megan's not coming back. But, you know, there's obviously reasons. She's given birth to a baby. And uh, perhaps they, they, they can't afford the flights. I don't know. And there's a comedian, he might have to help me on this, the comedian on how the left has lost the plot. Uh, Dear Labour, we're the working class, not the woking class. And this is somebody who is a comedian, writer and political commentator. His name is Jeff Norcott. I've never even heard of him. Never even heard of him. But, he, but he's managed to get himself sort of one and a half pages in the paper day. Jeff Norcott. Never heard of him. Sorry, Jeff. I'm sure somebody's heard of you and I'm sure you're fabulously funny and inventive and just witty and a political commentator and marvellous, but we've never heard of you round here. And these, these people have travelled. These people know all about it. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. So excited. We found the uh, Chardonnay at Walker, English rose and violet creams. You get a box of them for £35, infused with attar, of roses and violets, the essential oil extracted from the petals, enrobed, enrobed. This is what it's called. It's not called covered. It's called enrobed. That's that's the word. Uh, no, it's not. It's enrobed. All all proper chocolate people will call it enrobed. In our finest dark chocolate and entirely hand finished with crystallized rose. That means somebody's put just one piece on each. I saw them making them. The other day they did a programme on the telly. They're about as popular today and still made to Madame Charbonnel's original and esteemed recipe. Yeah, she actually existed. There was somebody... It's like, you know, people go, oh, it's obviously made up. No, 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 she really existed. She really existed. So I'm, I'm going to go today and get them. You can get little ones, but listen, if that's the favourite of the Queen, that's the ones they're going to have on the programme tomorrow. We're going to go and get them. I, don't, I, don't want to I might just get them some champagne truffles, you know, or something like that. Packet of Maltese. I used to quite like Maltese. Didn't they do mint Maltesers at one point? I'm sure they did. I, I just remember biting into something and going, oh, it's a mint Malteser. I'm pretty certain. Pretty certain. Uh, right again. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, somebody says, I can't believe you didn't know that Thunder and Lightning were manifestations of the same event. No, I didn't. No. Believe it or not. I know. It's surprising. I know 99.9% .9 of things recurring, but uh, there's always one little thing that eludes me. Like how many more texts you're going to be allowed to send. Uh, being a diabetic and on insulin, uh, as well as a fairly... Uh, there is a, a new injection out called dulaglutide. Dulaglutide. Do you think it would be OK now and again to have a naughty treat? Because I keep hearing you say that you do. Well, I think diabetics... You know, I mean, it, it, you're not supposed to, but diabetics know if they're ill. I can tell if I'm ill because I feel it in my stomach. That's, you know, that's how I know. But I've, I've now, uh, ever since I was, I was uh, not very well, uh, I had some more diabetic experts and I've completely changed my diabetes injecting. I now do it when I wake up at night. Bizarre time to do it, but it seems to work perfectly well for me. And, uh, and I also don't do it in my legs anymore. They said to me, why are you doing it in your legs? I said, well, I was told to do it in my legs. She said, but that's, that's muscle. I thought you haven't seen my legs. 
and uh, definitely I'll flab most of the time. So do it, do it in your stomach. So I did it in my stomach. And, uh, and that's where I do it now, which is much easier, much easier. But uh, occasionally a little treat, occasionally a little treat. I, d- I do have little treats, Janet. You know, every day when I have, you know, lunch, it's sometimes a little treat. I, do you know what I bought the other day? It's like, oh, I had a craving. Oh, did I have a craving? Uh, for um, uh, trifle. And I'm not supposed to have trifle. So, so what I tend to do is, because the bottom of it is all... Uh, sort of jelly and fruit and everything else and jelly is not not very good for me but I do like a bit of the custard and a bit of the cream on the top <laughs> really bad really bad but uh, but uh, to be honest with you it, it's worth falling to, to the floor on your hands and knees just for the little little bit of pleasure that I've had with a little bit of cream and a little bit of custard something about custard isn't there I just like tinned fruit that's another avenue of pleasure denied me or filling that uh, rice pudding I used to like rice, but the only thing I can't stand, we used to get it at school all the time, steamed puddings. Oof. Treacle pudding, sponge pudding. Oh, I don't like any of those sort of things at all. Not my sort of thing. But, um, so, oh, no, not suet pudding. Oh, I tell a lie. Did I ever say? No. But I had an apple charlotte once. And uh, suet pudding. No, my mother used to do, use suet. And I can't remember what she used suet for. Perhaps she was doing some some sort of main it wouldn't have been a, a pudding i don't think we had suet puddings oh that's lamb and kidney suet pudding oh right simple suet pudding beef ale and parsnip pudding so a suet pudding is boiled steamed or baked pudding made with wheat flour and suet often with breadcrumbs dried fruits such as raisins other preserved fruits and spices I obviously couldn't think what they were the british term pudding simply refers to a dessert or sweet course but suet puddings may be savory Quite nice then, isn't it? I could eat something like that, sort of, provided it had mashed potato with it. So another... Oh, I've had jam roly-poly. I like that. That's very nice. Sussex pond pudding. No. That sounds ghastly, doesn't it? Sponge pudding. No. Treacle. See, treacle. Christmas puddings. What is suet? Well, if they say so, then I have to uh, have to take their word for it. <laughs> Uh, Lee says light travels faster than sound that's why you see lightning before you hear the thunder and uh, have you ever been to Pike's Ibiza Steve heard it was the place to be seen all the stars went there Julio Iglesias and uh, Freddie they filmed Club Tropicana there did they and you went the producer said he went uh, and somebody said do you think the Nottingham Carnival is happening this year well we, we found it. it it appears to be on there's an announcement soon, but they, they do have a website up and they have said, you know, and um, and they and they think they might. But it's August, isn't it? I believe the Notting Hill Carnival. Bank holiday, another bank holiday. How exciting. How exciting. We don't mind a bank holiday. We're all right with those. But uh, Notting Hill Carnival, will it happen? If it doesn't, there'll be a lot of disappointed people or a lot of relieved people who live around Notting Hill, who generally sort of leave the area because of the Notting Hill Carnival. So uh, the answer is, we don't know. Just they've delayed. It was supposed to be announced yesterday, but they've delayed the announcement. Mainly because if they say yes and then it's cancelled at the last minute, which can happen, like the Portugal holidays, you know, that's going to upset a lot of people, isn't it? I would have thought. Uh, Steve, Palmer Violet ice lollies. What the... Good look. I've never even heard of Palmer Violet ice lollies. They sound delightful. The producer went, ugh. He thought they said because he hates things like that. And uh, Steve, I've been to Pike's Hotel. He used to go out with Grace Jones. Really? Grace Jones, slave to the rhythm. Remember that one? <laughs> she, no, she slapped, uh, not, not Parky, Russell Harty, she did. Because he turned his back on her to talk to another guest. It wasn't physically possible to do it any other way. And she's a bit peculiar. In fact, she's definitely peculiar. Uh, hot apple crumble and cold custard. Yum, 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 yum. Apple crumble. It's got to be made properly. A really proper, you know, with a bit of cinnamon in it and things like that. But also any of those sort of pies I quite like. Black, blackberry and apple is, is very popular, I think. But no, you're right. Apple, apple crumble is a bit of a, bit of a tease for us this Thursday morning. <laughs> Imagine they do it doesn't aunt bessie do an apple crumble or something i'm pretty certain i think i've seen something in uh, in iceland that said sort of aunt bessie's apple crumble or apple something it looks delicious 
Wait a minute, there you go. Aunt Bessie's scrumptious apple. Do you think Aunt Bessie exists? Or do you think she's a made-up name? <laughs> I have a sneaking feeling she could be a made-up name. So is she a real person? Uh, wait a minute. Aunt Bessie's Limited, known as Triton Foods, is a producer of... Oh. Aunt Bessie Limited was until 2018 a subsidiary of the Wils William Jackson Food Group. Oh, uh, she's, she's not real. Oh. Her frozen roast potatoes were introduced in 1999. The retail value of the brand was over 50 million. It had become one of the top 100 brands in Britain. It had grown to 110 million by 2014. And, um, yeah, so it doesn't exist. I'm a bit disappointed. I wanted her to exist. I just wanted her. It's like Miss, Mr. Kipling. I wanted her to be a Mr. Kipling. But he doesn't exist either, does he? Although Colonel Sanders exists... And not only I know he sadly passed on to that great fried chicken thing in the sky, but uh, it's, it's funny all these people that because they, they you you associate with a brand name, it's like you know if you listen to LBC, you know what you're going to get on the programmes. You know that you've got Nick Ferrari this morning, and who's he got on this morning? Don't want to miss it. Don't want to miss it. Uh, it's Diana's brother, Charles, is going to be. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Earl, Earl Spencer. Because <laughs> he used to work at LBC. I couldn't work out the other day. I think he... He followed... No, I followed him. That's right. When we were in Hammersmith, he had a show uh, sort of lunchtime and I then followed him. And I remember thinking, it's Diana's brother. I mean, she was still alive, obviously, at that uh, at that time. But no, he's he's been a radio presenter as well. Uh, Steve, I've been to that Club Tropicana place. All the drinks were free. All the drinks were free, and it was really, really sunny. <laughs> Club Tropicana. <laughs> didn't they have? Didn't Club Tropicana sort of bring about the uh, the shuttlecock story? Don't you remember? Yeah, I'll leave it there. Yes, I'll leave it there. Uh, Steve, apparently in our house, says Nicole, steak and kidney suet puddings are known as babies' heads in our house. But you've got to have a steak and kidney suet pudding with mashed potato and gravy, definitely. Shane says, can you believe I've been listening to you for years and I've never been out of Australia? Well, lots of people are like that, aren't they? I mean, why, why would you need to? Why would you need to? No thunder here in the Highlands, says uh, May. Far too cold. Even the central heating kept tripping on. Very seldom do we have thunder. Could you still buy lemon puff biscuits? Yeah, they're, they're not exactly the same as the ones that we remember. The, the biscuit was a bit more puffy than it is at the moment, but the, the actual filling is probably the same. She says uh, it's two puff biscuits with a slight glaze. Oh, yeah, with the glaze. They, they, they are similar, but they're not quite the same. You've got mint arrows. My late mum used to love those Devon violet sweets. Suet you can make dumplings with, or dough balls, as they call them in Scotland. Remember sweets called Lucky Lips? Yes. Yes, it looked like a little glycerin-type lip. I know. We had some very odd things, <laughs> very odd things. Uh, about. Uh, was it spotted dick your mother used to make with suet? Well, she did used to do some sort of suet pudding and it did have raisins in it and things like that. My mother cooked. People don't uh, don't cook nowadays. They really they really don't. They go out and it's it's already made for you. You don't need to cook. Who needs to cook? They used to do it at school, didn't they, for some people? Domestic science. You'd see all the all the people, all the pupils going home at the end of the day and on the bus, they'd be sitting there with a Tupperware box with their little offering. Home economics, it ended up being called, didn't it? I just called it cooking for people who couldn't cook. And you go home and you open up your little Tupperware box and you've made three cupcakes. You know, very exciting. I mean, girls did that. Uh, us, us boys did the uh, woodwork. Very popular. I was better at metalwork. I wasn't very good at wood. Why? I've got no idea. Why did they always, at school, give you lessons in woodwork and metalwork? How many people think, oh, I think I'll go into metalwork or woodwork or something? Hardly anybody. Hardly anybody. Long forgotten. Long forgotten. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Nice to have you company. Welcome. It's ten to six. Ten to six. Just in case you're clock watching. I do. I still see people at Waterloo Station in the morning running to catch trains. I've never run to catch a train in my life. I'd rather miss the train because, luckily, where I live, there's, there's loads of uh, loads of trains you can get. So I don't need to to run for it. But you do see people running. It's, it's almost like they've never. Oh my goodness me! You know the trains. You know depart every day at the same time, and still they run for it. Go oh, quick, 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 quick. I mean, I work it out that I can actually get to the station, and 
you know, it depends how fast the bus goes in the morning. Yesterday's bus ride was like Speedy Gonzales, which was great. So we had, we had a good bus ride to the station. And then I got to walk all the way to Platform 21, which is a bit of a tedious fag. It really is. Uh, but uh, we've got to wait because of um, essential traffic, I think, that they're doing on the railways until November, if you please. I'm not sure my feet can wait until November. And, uh, and so you sort of get there. And I, I work it out. I can normally get there and I end up with six minutes to actually get onto the train. So I can normally do it if by that time my feet are killing me so much. But I bought some other shoes yesterday. I put them on and I'm sort of, I'm breaking them in. I'm breaking them in at the moment. So we'll wait and find out how we actually go. Darren in uh, Perth, Western Australia, says earlier you were talking about the Jaffa cakes that were rejected. Why are they selling the rejected cake? Why don't they sell them and call them Naffa cakes? No, they, they, they wouldn't do that. But they, they sell them to the staff. The people who work there, because to be honest with you, as far as I'm concerned, a Jaffa cake is a Jaffa cake. But uh, they've got quality. It's called quality control. They do it. But you're right. You could actually do that. But then people after a while would probably just want the Naffa cakes because just having the the orangey bit slightly off centre doesn't seem to make too much difference. Uh, Steve, I have, we're still talking about. Oh, sorry, Steve. No, Aunt Bessie, says Jonathan. Does that mean there never was a book called Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley? No. No, but they did bring one out. They did bring out the book there to, to tie in with the, uh, with the advert on the television, surprisingly. The, the, such was the interest of J.R. Uh, do, do you have a copy of J.R. Hartley's Fly Fishing? Uh, no, I'm sorry, we don't. And then gradually they, they find it and then they, they sort of present it to him. It was his only book, apparently. But no, he didn't exist. But they did produce Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley just to cope with the amount of uh, out of interest people. So, but there are loads of loads of things that don't really exist that we think we would like them to exist. Kim says, my mum used to make a clouty dumpling at Christmas uh, with old sixpences in it. Very spicy. I've heard of a clouty dumpling and I don't know what, probably because it was, it was something that happened at, uh, at Christmas. Uh, Steve, the, uh, oh, thank you, Paul. The Twitter account, uh, all the mistakes uh, that are being made on a, on a, a certain television programme. I know. I know. Have you heard? I mean, so, one, one of the poor presenters on there, I mean, <sighs> got turned over, something chronic. Very embarrassing. Very rude. Very rude, but very funny at the same time that somebody could be that daft that they didn't uh, twig to it. Uh, Steve, I had to do needlework at school, says Sarah. I was hopeless. It took me a whole year to make a pair of knickers. You made a pair of knickers at school? How interesting. I don't know what I do without you in the morning. You set me up for the day ahead, which is good. We didn't do we didn't do cooking, actually. It was very sexist when you think about it. The, the, the cooking was for the girls and the boys did woodwork or metalwork or something like that. I don't know why that uh, why we didn't do cooking, because most of the famous chefs in the world. I know there are women who cook. I'm well aware of that. But most of the famous chefs in the world in, in the world are men. So it uh, doesn't help. Uh, Steve, I did woodwork at school. Before I sat my exams, I already had an uh, apprentice with a shop fitters doing beauty, fine, exotic and original timber, beautifying. I was a French polisher, says Nick. It's very clever, that, isn't it? I've seen people doing French polishing. It does look, it does look quite skilled and uh, love the idea. So uh, I also enjoy it. I love the smell of the woodwork actual block because there was the, the, the woodwork block and then next door to it was the metalwork block which I was very good at but needlework at school <laughs> looking at some more outfits in the papers uh, today uh, the TV racing host Francesca this is Francesca Cumani Sumani and uh, the outfit looks dreadful I mean really the hat doesn't go with it the trouble is if you've got pattern on I don't know why these people don't get dressed you know with somebody who can tell them how to, <coughs> excuse me, dress. She's a racing host. They said her outfit was cool in a black and white outfit. No, it wasn't at all. What she should have done is gone to uh, one of the big costumiers in London and borrowed something from My Fair Lady because they did lovely black and white. This just looks ghastly. It's like an upside down cheap lampshade with a hat that doesn't even suit her. Do these people put this stuff on beforehand and go, oh, well, it's obviously you know, worth a lot of money. I'll wear it. You know, when you look at Princess Anne, she's always got the wrong hat on and her sunglasses. She's always got very bad eyes, poor soul. And then two people who sort of got engaged. I mean, they look as dull as anything. Not sure about them. And then uh, somebody called uh, Nazir Bullen. She's wearing a very big feathered hat. See, I miss Gertrude Schilling. 
Gertrude Schilling was very famous years ago for her son, who made hats, to wear outrageous hats. And she would turn up at Ascot and you knew it was Gertrude Schilling because she was wearing these outrageous hats. They would be like works of art in themselves. And everybody knew who Gertrude Schilling was. Every, I mean, seriously, you've never seen anything like it. it she, was, she was just, you know, just amazing. Have you never seen her before? Yeah, she's very famous. I mean, she's not with us, obviously, now. She went years ago. But she dressed up as everything. There was nothing she didn't... Her, her son, David Schilling, uh, is a self-taught artist, and he designs a lot of the clothing seen on Ladies' Day at Royal Ascot. And... Um, uh, Gertrude died in oh ages ago, and Robert, Robert Ronald Schilling died a lot before that. Before he was twelve, he was designing hats and uh, an outfit for his mother Gertrude for her to wear at Ascot. And so she always got her picture in the paper. People would be saying, "I wonder what Gertrude's wearing." I think one one occasion was it her or Barry Hum Barry Humphreys? I think wore the Sydney Opera House on his head, <laughs> complete with sharks. I believe it was very good. And uh, Jemima says, Steve, I read a book called The Holy Bible. You're a fibber. You've never read The Holy Bible. Nobody's ever read The Holy Bible. I'm sure not even the Pope has read The Holy, but not all of it. Have you seen it? Goodness sake. I don't think God existed either. Well, I wouldn't be so sure about that one. Whether he wrote the book, I don't know, because it was it was changed uh, and it was interpreted. You know, people had to change it from one language to the other. And uh, another one, it says... Uh, uh, with your diabetes, do your feet ever go numb? Yes. Well, that's the big problem with diabetics. You, you get feet problems. A lot of diabetics have their toes amputated and uh, their feet amputated. Some people up to the knee if it, if it turns uh, septic or something like that. Yeah, it's a big problem. So most diabetics, you know, end up sort of having to take dead skin off and then put cream on and all, all the rest of it. It's fantastic. Uh, 84850. Al, you don't need to tell people that, lovey. That makes you sound a bit simple. I'm so sorry, but never mind. And uh, as I say, you'll, you'll make the grand total of that other place two. <laughs> Only two of you now. Uh, tomorrow night's Euro clash between England and Scotland could be hit by thunder and lightning. Would they cancel it if it if it's started raining heavily on the? Would they not? Would they, would they go out and play, even if it rained? Really? How exciting! S Unless it was well. I mean, if if you're going to get Thunder and lightning. I mean, that sounds pretty dangerous, doesn't it, to me? I mean, there could be a crack of thunder and then the lightning comes down and a couple of players disappear. So you, you would have, presumably you'd have to... I mean, if it was just rain, you know, high risk of, of, of affecting the game at Wembley, up to half a month's rain was due to fall in some areas. Now, I've got so many things to do today. I've got to go and get these violets and these other things as well. <laughs> hope I get them. I don't want to be disappointed. But I don't know whether or not to take the car... Because now it's rained, the car looks utterly clean. Although everybody says my car looks clean. It's the colour that looks clean. I've had different coloured cars, and this is about the best colour for looking clean, which is quite good. Sorry? No, graphite. It's grey. Grey, metallic grey. But it, it just seems to look clean all the time, whereas I had a red car once. Oh, never again. Uh, I've had green, sky blue, dark blue. I've had loads of different colours. Emerald green. I liked emerald green, actually. Because people go, you've got an emerald green car, haven't you? I said, yes, I have. And I liked it. Uh, Steve, didn't Elton John wear eccentric hats, says Mo? Um, I d uh, did he? No, just, just outfits, I think. Uh, Louise in York, another sad person, poor soul. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses read the Bible from back to front, which is done in weekly classes. Oh, right. I didn't know that. I, don't, I mean, I'm amazed that people could actually read the Bible. It's such small writing. Did you ever see they did a little tiny Bible? It was, it was miniature. It was when we were in the days of doing miniature. And I remember thinking, I'd love one of those. I'd love a little... I do have a Bible which came from Palestine. And it's the wood. It's, it's got a wooden cover, which is made from uh, trees taken from Palestine. And, and I got it years ago when I was seven and it's gold, the, the actual, when, you, when, when the book is closed, all the bits round the outside, all gold. And it's got lovely pictures in it and everything else. I've never read it, but I wrote my name in it. Stephen, age seven. 
Yeah, that's put put the value up. I think probably very uh, very good actually. Uh, Steve Wembley has a retractable roof. Oh, now we know. I didn't know these things. Seriously, I really didn't. Uh, listen, we'll take a short break. News at six o'clock and then uh, back in three. Loads more stories to find up, including the MPs ramping up the efforts to grill Greensill. We'll tell you about that after this. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Nice to have your company. Four minutes past six is, uh, is the time. Oh, apparently Reese says Wembley does not have a retractable roof. One minute retractable, the next minute not. Wimbledon does. Wimbledon has uh, a retractable roof. So we had Wembley down here, says Steve Shoreham by Sea. So it's Wimbledon has had it because they spent a small fortune. Uh, Steve, uh, da, 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 you can buy uh, Charbonnel violets and other flavoured fillings like raspberry and champagne cream in the florist shop next to... I've seen it, Jane. I've seen that florist shop. I've not been in it. I went in it before when it was a different florist shop. Apparently having children does not make you happy. I know. Tell all those poor girls in Essex who still aren't married but they're just sort of popping children out left, right and centre. One in four adults don't want them. Oh, I like the idea. See, I like the idea of big families. Wembley does not have a retractable roof. Two partially retractable roof sculptures over the east and west end of the same can be opened to allow sunlight and aid pitch growth. So there you go. So it doesn't have a retractable roof, but it does have partially retractable roof structures. Hey, you try saying that at this time of the morning. Not that easy. Steve, uh, I remember when I was a kid in the 60s, my mum made my sandwiches with the heat. The tomato in the sandwiches was soggy. Oh, I never, um, I never, I did have something the other day. I went to Greg's and, uh, and I bought a ham baguette, which had cucumber and tomato. And it was actually quite nice. It was actually quite, I like their, uh, their things. And I do like the bacon roll, but they, they can't cook bacon for love nor money. They're blooming hopeless. They really are. Especially the one in Richmond. It's the, some, sometimes you, I mean, what I need to do is sort of go and buy one of these bacon baguettes, photograph it and send it into head office going, could you teach somebody not to leave it in there? Because they have it so well cooked, you could break it, you know, which isn't how bacon is supposed to be. But I don't think they know. Uh, somebody else saying Elton John was very eccentric. Uh, that, that would be a, a good uh, good description of him. And, uh, and somebody says, I always tune into LBC's Global Player, particularly your show. But I'm 6,000 miles away in Mauritius, says Devin Sutton. Oh, that's nice. Although four hours uh, forward, the MTV family is going 6,000 miles away. I always tune into the Global Player. Well, that's good. You must go to the LBC website. I keep telling people all the time, go to the LBC website, lbc.co.uk, download the app, and that means that wherever you go in the world, you can always listen to LBC and you can then download all the programmes. And as we say, I mean, just search for Global Player. It's so simple. And it then means that you end up with... Uh, so you, you never need to sort of go, oh, I'm not going to hear Steve or I'm not going to hear Nick or James or other people. And um, and so if you do, there's loads of things on there, loads of things. Seriously, it's, it's so easy. And you get to keep all of the podcasts. I've got about 7,000 currently running but the trouble is you have to download them. You know why? Because the more they add every day, the more they fall off the other end. It'll, the system will only hold a certain amount. OK, so make sure that you download as much as possible because something you think, oh, I'll go back to that and download some of Steve's In Conversations or any of those, you know, special programmes. Uh, you, you might go there after the weekend and go, oh, it's gone. So you have to do it. You have to do it very quickly. ITV are going to give... Love Island contestants, therapy and financial advice to cope with the... Str you think they're going to be taking financial advice? I mean, I seriously don't think that's going to be happening. I really don't. But they've got a clinical psychologist. Uh, the care includes at least eight therapy sessions after filming finishes. Do you know, can you... I, I don't want to appear cynical about this, but these people think they know everything. They think they know everything. What do we have about Geordie Shaw? Oh, they're turning it into a dating show because the ratings are plummeted. You know why? Filth. Absolute filth. It really... Have you seen some of these people? It really is awful. But on Love Island, do you think that they're really going to go along and they're going to take advice from people? No, no. The moment they actually finish, it's a case of, OK, now I'm going to be famous. Now I'm going to go out to nightclubs wearing very little. Now I'm going to be sort of endorsing everything and, and doing all the... And I'm thinking, no, no, no. But they won't... They, they, they just won't learn. They just won't learn. So Dr Gould who's a, a clinical psychologist, said duty of care is not a static goal. It evolves with public expectation 
and um, it's usually filmed in a villa in Mallorca, but the location for uh, for this year is yet to be confirmed. Because you remember the, the Jeremy Carl show was axed after one guest died. And on Love Island, they've had three people, and yet they're still running with it. You know, if, if it happens again, or we get anywhere near it, they should axe the programme immediately, because this is, this is exploiting people. You know, and say they, they axed the Jeremy Kyle show after one, one guest died. I think Love Island's had its day. I think they, they, they need to stop it straight away, because a lot of people are going on there. And they, I don't know what their, what their objective is. I, I don't quite understand why they would go on Love Island. Are they that sad and, and sort of want to be famous because they think that that brings riches? Well, for many of them, it doesn't. For, you know, a good 80, 90 percent of people, they'll disappear completely. Nothing worse than being, oh, weren't you on that programme? That's the worst thing that can ever happen to anybody. And uh, Steve, uh, you can buy Palmer Violet candles. I got them. Halinka, I've got them. Uh, I've I bought them in Waitrose. I bought them in Waitrose. Is that where they say they come from? Yeah. John Lewis. Yeah. I bought them in there. Palmer Violet. I love this one of them. Producer hates it. It's old lady things. Old lady things. But I'd, I'm obviously an old lady then because I love the smell of things like that. <laughs> it's like certain shower gels I particularly like. At the moment, it's Thai, uh, lime and basil is a particular favourite with me, which I quite like. Uh, also, so Diana Ross is coming back with a new album after uh, 20 years. She hasn't done anything for 20 years. Sophie, uh, Countess of Wessex... Really, most dreadful outfit I've ever... I mean, who on earth or who advised you to wear this top with that dress? It's ghastly. Absolutely. It was so much, so much better the other day. This one today, I mean, seriously, looked like you wandered out of a badly dressed sort of dressing up kind of programme. Uh, somebody's living the good life. Denise Van Outen and her partner uh, will soon have enough for their own big breakfast. The new figures show 23% of people have dug their own vegetable patch. She's quite old now, Denise Van Outen. She's 47. I mean, you know, she behaves as if she's about sort of 20, but she's quite ancient. 47 is sort of pushing 50. 50 is halfway to 100. And um, and uh, after that, nothing. I'm dreading it. I tell you, I couldn't go. Oh, people say to me, what's it going to be like, Steve, when you get to 50? I go, don't even talk about it. Please don't talk about it. Uh, using food delivery apps can ramp up the price of food. Blimey, can it ramp up the price of food? According to a, a feature of the Daily Mirror today, wait a minute, this is interesting. The Daily Mirror takes key role in filming The Thief, The Wife and The Canoe. Wait a minute, didn't I see this picture in another paper? This is, <laughs> I'm sure, in, in the back of my mind, I've, I've probably got this completely wrong and I'm, I'm prepared to sort of admit that occasionally one maybe doesn't see the things that you think you should. Yes! Here we are. Is this Mark Stanley? Uh, the thing that viewers will see, John... Da there's, there's two people. One is filming the thief, his wife and the canoe, coming out of a car holding a copy of the Daily Mirror. In the other paper, Mark Stanley, yeah, who's been holding a copy of the Daily Star. It's, he's obviously holding two bits of the paper. It's the same film and it's the same actor. Mark Stanley. So either somebody has superimposed both papers over the same company. Yeah, but look, here he is holding the Daily Star, getting out of the car. OK. And here he is, sorry, holding a copy of the Daily Mirror, getting out the car. Somebody's being a bit naughty, aren't they? Somewhere. Somebody's doing it. Steve Parr. I knew I'd seen the same paper because I remember reading it in the Daily Star, thinking, oh, he's, he's, he's holding a copy of the Daily Star. I think the Daily Star one... I think that's a bit of photoshopping. I'm looking at a picture of the Daily Star and that, that looks to me like it's photoshopped. He can't be holding two separate papers, can he? He's only going to be holding one of them. I don't know. Well, I do, yeah, but that's different because I'm multitasking. I'm very good. Uh, <laughs> well, I like to be very good. Uh, so, Boris, Hancock's useless and I'll quit number 10 to make some money. Yeah, well, he achieved his objective. Megan, I won't come to the UK for the Diana statue. Well, we don't care, dear. We really don't care. If you want to come to the UK, come to the UK. You don't want to come to the UK, don't come. You know, you can have your little, you know, little mopsits and all the rest of it. Uh, so, 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 so. Trying to find something interesting. So the Cornish case is spiking after G7. 
And the Ryanair chief who says, I wouldn't give most ministers a job stacking shelves. This is Michael O'Leary. He's, he's a bit of a person, isn't he? I believe Michael O'Leary. And um, uh, the cellist who played at Harry and Meghan's wedding claims his tour to the US next month is under threat after his passport was seemingly cancelled in error. I don't remember this cellist who was playing at the wedding. This is Sheku Kana Mason and his sister Isata. Uh, also, uh, she, she, plays, she plays piano, actually. And uh, last night, the Home Office said a replacement passport would be issued as soon as possible. I think so, too. But uh, I couldn't care less if uh, Meghan and Harry don't come back here for the unveiling of the statue. You know, it, it really doesn't make any difference. Will he be talking to his brother? I don't know. Do I care? No. I mean, he, he, was, he was very popular at the wedding, the cellist. I don't remember that bit of the wedding, and I did watch the wedding. Perhaps there's certain bits that you remember and certain bits that you don't. Uh, Philip's death, says Sophie, breaking down in tears by the loss of the Duke of Edinburgh. Yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, though, he's still here. You know, he hasn't, he, hasn't, he hasn't gone anywhere. It's like, you know, when somebody dies, they go, oh, it's left a huge gap. And I understand that bit. But to be honest with you, he had, he had such a big presence. He's always going to be around, isn't he? You know, you, you can see him there. The Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, the gardens at Windsor Castle, which he had a, uh, had a hand in. I know some people hated him. I quite accept the fact that people go, oh, of course, you know, he was this and he was that. And I go, yeah, you know. And do you remember I was talking the other day about the, uh, the wags, little, little Rebecca Vardy? She has disappeared, hasn't she? And little Colleen Rooney. Ha 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 Good old Colleen and Rebecca. Well, apparently, I was saying the other day, it's gone a bit quiet in that front. No, no, no. They're back in the High Court tomorrow. This is the, uh, the second half. It's, you know, why it was not sorted out ages ago. This began in 2019. 2019, I mean, I thought it was, it was fairly recent. But 2019, and they have been told, listen, you're going to rack up huge costs in this thing. There's going to be no winners in it, it's, a, it's a, a sort of, I mean, they have tried to have some mediation, but it's obviously not worked. I mean, to be truthful, I can't wait to see who's going to win the blooming thing. I can't wait. I could fill a whole programme on it, you know, because I, I was never a fan of uh, Colleen and Paul. I mean, I thought she was treated badly by Wayne and I never liked Rebecca Vardy either. But there again, I don't, there's loads of people I don't like. But, you know, but when it when it gets to this and they start wasting money, somebody's going to be down about two million quid. Well, good luck to them. That's how much they, they think you, you can you can rack up on this. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to uh, to Jeremy, who comes from Hitchin in Hertfordshire. He says, I heard you mentioning London's Lost Rivers earlier this week. And knowing of your keen interest in London, I thought the enclosed might help you. I'm disposing of a largest collection of London books. You're most welcome to these two. So I've got one which is called The Lost Rivers of London and the other one is is based on London. I mean, really, really big book. I mean, seriously big book. Must have cost an absolute fortune. But um, thank you very much indeed, Jeremy, for those. I, I love the poem as well. Non-repeatable, even with the rude words in it. But I mean, it's still very nice indeed. But thank you for the books. I, I love stuff like that. As you know, the more stuff I absorb about London, the more you can you can do when you when people come to London and you can say, oh, you must go here. I always take people to uh, Upper St Martin's Lane and show them a, a very nice little bit of Regency London, which is still surviving to this day. There's a little alleyway that goes through. And uh, I, I always take people there, take them into the Salisbury, which is uh, an original Victorian mirrored pub. It used to be a gay pub years and years ago. And uh, there's some loads of little places you can go to around London, you go there. I mean, you know, if, if you're going out Tower of London Way, take people to Execution Dock, which is where we sadly used to tie people up and wait for the tide to come in. And uh, that wasn't very good, was it, really? And um, it's... Uh, is it Bridges Place? Wait a minute. Where are we? No, no, it's not that one. No, no, no. No, not that. That's... Uh, no. No, it's not. No. Regency... No, definitely not Bridges Place. I hadn't heard of Bridges Place. That's a new one for me. Uh, it's got little stairs that go up into little what look like shops as you go up there. It's, it's literally opposite the Salisbury pub. It, practically opposite the Salisbury pub. Try that one. It's, it, it's, it's very well known. Well, it is now I mention it, but of course then you come up with a new name, which I've never heard of, which is always interesting. So 
Yeah, somebody will know what it is because you're very good about things like that. Uh, Steve, the cellist at the royal wedding, says Sandra, was amazing. In fact, the whole family are talented. Yeah, well, so, so we've discovered, which is amazing. Graham in Essendon says, I've overslept this morning. Monty and Willow, not very impressed. Uh, we need a letter. I do not, um, do not expect things. And um, uh, Dave, the taxi, says, Katie Price still in the news. I don't know what paper you're reading, love, but she's not in any of my papers. Not at all, I'm afraid. We all love Katie Price. Done so well earning all her millions. She's bankrupt. What are you, mad? She's totally bankrupt. Been bankrupt twice now, earning all her millions. Honestly, Dave the taxi. How's the old tax bill going, mate? Is that going well? No, but of course, the funniest thing, again, she doesn't make the papers because they've, they've kind of given up with her. So she only makes something online. And that's Gemma Collins, who talks about installing a swimming pool at home. It's like a kid's paddling pool. Well, she's now she's in it. And she's sitting there in about like an inch of water, it looked. And she's got, oh, it's, this is the only one that's got, she just, well, she must live in some peculiar world. I mean, she's 40 going on six, which is not good. Do you remember Brooke Bon T? Uh, yeah. I think they still make it, actually. And uh, Steve, reality TV, including Love Island, is causing many of today's problems. Well, it's because people want to... Uh, people want to go on it because they want to be famous. But the trouble is they're famous for all the wrong reasons. They're famous for basically being a bit thick. That's what it is. It's not a programme that anybody demonstrates. Uh, I've never seen anybody juggling on there or fire eating or, you know, mind reading or something like that. Nothing at all. They just sort of sit on there and go, yeah, do you want to go out of me? Yeah, I'll go out of you. You know, and then and, that, and that's it. That's the extent of it. It's, it's all a bit, a bit sad and tragic, but that's their lives because they don't seem to have any work. Richard in Knightsbridge says due to his appalling behaviour, Harry should be removed from the line of succession. Well, I don't think he's had appalling behaviour. He's just been a bit naive. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it goes, isn't it, really? Listen, I mean, you, you can't expect a family that we had nothing to do with to be absolutely perfect. Charles, uh, I can remember saying about Nicholas Witchell, I don't like that man, you know. I don't like that. Well, now, apparently, he does like him. Now he does like him. I don't like that man. And uh, they've all had their run-ins with the press. None more so than Harry, of course. None more so than Harry. Steve, I've had my second Covid jab, says uh, Paul. And I got a sticker. I got one. I got a sticker the other day through going to get my eyes tested. She, as I went in, she gave me a sticker which went, checked. I thought it was great. And so when I came out, I took it off. I don't want to walk around town with a checked sticker on. It makes me look a bit silly. And then I discovered that outside Kingston Hospital... People have stuck them all over the bus shelter and everything. They should be made to go and clear it up. So I stuck mine on there as well. Because nobody will ever find me, which is good. And uh, Steve, Denise Van Outen, 47. How come she's suddenly so much younger than me? I'm 52. Well, I don't. Perhaps she's going backwards. Perhaps she's going backwards. I don't know. It's a bit difficult to tell, actually. She wears so much makeup nowadays that you can't, really, I, I, you can't tell people's, people's ages. Can you? Well, I don't think you can, actually. Uh, Paul in Lincolnshire, going Melton Mowbray today for a pork pie. No, no, just just go to Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's do them, Marks and Spencer's do them. <sighs> That's it, you know. And uh, somebody says, you sure you're not using a salad dressing in the shower, says Trevor. Oh, what, because it's Thai, lime and basil? No, I mean, it's too expensive for you, Trevor. It's not for you. If, if, if you're actually called Trev... Lime, basil and mandarin, dear, is not for you, I'm afraid. Lime, basil and mandarin is the uh, Joe Malone one, but she does another Thai lime uh, for, for Joe Loves, which is it's delicious. It really is. It's lovely. I might have to get... What? It's delicious. It, you, it, it, do you remember at school when, when you used to get a rubber and it smelt of strawberry? It did smell of strawberry. You felt you could eat the rubber. And yet you couldn't really eat it. But with this Thai lime, I mean, it's really quite delicious. It's like vanilla. I bought a vanilla candle the other day and pens as well. Mind you, I used to like the pens, which had a little ship in, which was on an ocean. Did you ever see that? And the pen would go up and down and the ship. You don't seem to see those now, do you? Well, I remember them. And uh, playing golf today. Uh, yes. Steve, you're right, re-reality TV. Matt says, uh, didn't Joey Essex make his fortune by pretending not to know things? No, he really is stupid. <laughs> he really is stupid. He can't tell the time. He can't tell the time. He, he sort of, but he has all these watches. But they're, they're, they're so few and far between the, these people. There's very few people out of reality shows that make money. Most of them are absolutely brassic. 
most of them are absolutely brassic. So, you know, but, but, you know, people still do it, don't they? They sort of go, oh, I think I want to be on, you know. And so all the boys go to the gymnasium so they can work out with other men. And, uh, and then all the girls go to the fake tanning place. And then they kind of meet and then, you know, some people get together. I mean, it's basically it's a programme about people picking each other up, which you can see in any old weather spoon. Well, you know, every night of the week. It's not difficult, is it? Not difficult. Touts are selling England, Scotland tickets for two grand. That's 46 times their face value. Seats bought for the official price of 43 quid for the Battle of Britain are being resold with these huge markups. I wouldn't pay diddly squat for a ticket like that. Two grand. You're having a laugh or something. Apparently, the Mail found more than 30 seats for the next England game for sale on a ticket resale site. Uh, some were being sold for more than a thousand, including at least one for 1,600 quid. That carried a booking fee of 400, taking the total cost of a ticket to 2,000. You must be stupid to pay that sort of money. Why would you want to pay that? Goodness sake, honestly. Stay at home, watch it on the telly. It's cheaper. Don't have, yeah, go, go, go down the pub. Have, have a sherbet lemon down there and a packet of, uh, of crisps, cheese and onion, and, uh, and watch the game there with another bunch of Neanderthals. You don't need to actually sort of pay that sort of money. They talk about diets in the paper today. Um, researchers from Bath University recruited 36 people. They found all sorts of diets don't, don't work because it's big business. It's big business. If you convince somebody fat that by doing this particular diet you can lose weight, uh, that they'll go for it. You know, even though they'll go, oh, no, I'm quite happy being fat. And you think, well, it's not good for you because it's dangerous. It's heart strain and things like that. And so, you know, Gemma Collins, I mean, how many times did you read in the paper she's lost three stone? She did it during those skinny jabs, which now she's admitted, oh, I never endorsed them and all the rest of it. No, just mentioned it at every opportunity. Don't go anywhere near them, please. Too dangerous. Uh, developed for diabetics. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. So funny reading the columnists in the papers, you know, when you when you know the, the background to some of the stories and to watch Rod Little brown nosing his way around uh, around some of the things going on at the moment is a little bit too embarrassing, Rod. I mean, come on, for goodness sake, honestly. And also totally inaccurate, totally inaccurate. Do you know there's a farm shop now that is just one big vending machine? Uh, Greg Marsh and Lucy Bowler thought they'd put their fresh local produce on sale so everything at betty's farm comes from a vending machine you go into it's like sort of a sort of a small warehouse and um they've got you know everything betty's is bringing it to the uk using redundant space in a chicken shed in derbyshire look at that it's quite clever so once you've paid locker doors pop open and you help themselves to the groceries prices and there's everything from salads bread cakes ice cream pies sausage rolls butter fresh meat jams premium teas and all the rest of it um are, are rather more comparable to those at marks and spencers than aldi they've got 400 white lockers a large wind turbine and banks of solar panels supply more than enough power what a brilliant idea because kids and also families take take the kids there okay push it because the kids know how to use all this stuff and you can buy everything you know, you can buy your milk and then the little door pings open and there's there's your goodies. It's lovely, isn't it? They were showing you a hotel the other day. Now, where was the hotel? Singapore. It was one of these programmes on the television where they show you luxury hotels. This one has got what can only be described as the biggest swimming pool I've ever seen on its roof, which overhangs. But it's it's but Singapore in particular, this thing looks like it's going to fall off the edge. It frightened the life out of me. No, it's 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 the hotel seats. Oh, sorry. Keeps two and a half thousand hotel rooms. But it's this thing on the top of it, which looks like an ark. It, it isn't just a swimming pool that's hanging over the edge. Singapore luxury hotel. And you can you can see this thing. I'm sure we'll, we'll find a picture of it. But uh, they were explaining with all the staff and their uniforms, they've got the biggest automated system working downstairs where you hold your what you're looking at it. Yeah. It's good. Look at it. I mean, it's it, it. Look at it. You look at. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's it spans three of these buildings, and it's got palm trees up there and everything else. Frights the life out of me. But the the system for all the staff to get their uniforms. They've got a huge laundry downstairs. I mean, huge. And you literally go to the wall and you take your key fob, like we have key fobs here, to open doors, and it will deliver your uniform 
do your thing. It's like we, we have, the, there's one down in Isleworth. It's a dry cleaners. But if you go there late at night, you key in your number and it will deliver your, your clothes to you. It's quite clever, isn't it? You have to pay for it. But that hotel, that thing's got palm trees. I'm, I'm thinking, say it falls off the end. I mean, I know it wouldn't. Yeah, there's the, yeah, there's the, there's the Battersea one. But you know you can only swim in that if you live there. But only certain people can swim. I wouldn't go in it. I really wouldn't go. I'd be too frightened just in case it goes... And you go, what was that? They go, wow! No, it's, it, it looks too dangerous. So I'm sure it's absolutely fantastic. And people love it and they've taken pictures of it. But as, as I have a, a fear of heights anyway, there's about as much chance of that happening as me making coconut ice cream. I don't know why. But no, I, I couldn't do anything like I can't stand on a chair. I get dizzy. <laughs> uh, 84850. Uh, Steve, I had a pen. When you turned it upside down, a gentleman's pants would fall and reveal his nakedness, Snez said uh, Phil. Well, they do naked ladies' pens and things like that. I had a mug once and it had a, you, it was a black mug and you poured hot water into it and all of a sudden bacon and eggs appeared on the outside no just me again thank you and uh, did you know on this day in 1939 the last public guillotining in france eugene vaidman who's a convicted murderer is guillotined in versailles outside the prison they've still got in a place in france a couple of these guillotines that they used to use i mean apparently it was absolutely dreadful dreadful and uh, steve what makes you feel more at home the violet candles uh, or the uh, the body wash neither neither i mean what makes me feel more at home i don't nothing i don't, I don't sort of worry about home i just like the smell of these things it's like, you know, my, my, my aftershave. I like, because I like my aftershave. Uh, Steve, my son and friends are devoted football fans and weekend players. They've tried to book a table at every pub in Leighton and Leightonstone with no luck. Many were booked weeks ago, says Anne. Oh, yeah, you can't leave things till the last minute. Stuff like that would go, wouldn't it? But, of course, isn't it um, Yuri What's-His-Face, you know, the, uh, the magician, who sort of claims that he's, that he's going to help Scotland win? <laughs> Yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. I mean, I don't know. And uh, Steve, a reply for taxi drivers to come back with when asked that predictable question, how's the taxi business now, mate? Picking up. I don't know, actually. I spoke to my uh, my driver this morning. Not necessarily picking up. He said it, at night time it, it isn't uh, any, any better than it was. Uh, Chris says, according to the internet, you seem to be 67. Ridiculous. Oh, the rubbish they put on the internet. Hello, you're listening to a 40-something man, OK, on the radio. Just, I mean, only just celebrated my birthday. Admittedly, there were quite a number of candles on the cake. 67. It was ridiculous. I've never heard anything like it. People always like that, don't they? Steve, my hubby drives from Nottingham to Melton Mowbray to get his pork pies from ye old pork pie shop, says Brit says that exactly the same ones don't taste the same from Sainsbury's. Well, they have to. They're not allowed to call it a Melton Mowbray pie unless it's made in Melton Mowbray. It's as simple as that. They sell them in um, Marks and Spencer's. Actually, pork pies are really bad for you. They're, I mean, really fat because you get the pastry. Yeah, Melton... Why Melton Mowbray? I don't know. That it's a special pork pie. I mean, they all have different sorts of ways of making the filling but it's got that jelly that's around the outside the actual filling and that thick pastry and you think that's healthy no 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 all those things are bad for you but it's it's like cornish pasties there's a recipe for cornish pasties and they have to be made in cornish pasty factories but Mel melton mowbray i think they they won a court case you can't call it a melton mowbray pie unless it's made in melton mowbray it's as simple as that it plays and it's an import, it's an important part of British cuisine and it's uh, pork pies with Melton. So they've got uh, different sort of today. It's chopped pork and bone stock jelly sealed in hot water and a crust pastry originally baked in a clay pot. Either way, it's a pork pie. You know, we like them because you can stick them in the kids lunch boxes. That's why. Over the centuries, they had a, a high concentration of Stilton cheesemakers. Development of the cheese industry produced whey, which became an ideal food source for pigs. I feel quite queasy. Just give me a good old sausage and bacon and eggs. That's all I want. <laughs> 84850, steve at uk. The vending machine reminds me of the mushroom machine outside a farm in Sussex when we were kids 50 years ago. It was a converted petrol pump and would dish out paper bags full of mushrooms. 
Really? Actually, I know people who actually grow mushrooms. Uh, you know, the, the, themselves. You, you can actually, I don't think they're that difficult to grow, really. Saturated, fat loaded. And somebody says, oh, that's it, Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore. That's the, that's the place. Marina Bay. They, they did a, a programme on it. So, uh, so there you go, which is, uh, which is not so good, is it, really? If, well, it's not so good if you don't like... I mean, if, if you like heights, you're going to be fine with it. If you don't like heights, it's absolutely dreadful. Dreadful. And uh, another one here. My birthday tomorrow, says Lee. Going to London, doing a few pubs, starting at the ship in Lincoln's Field. Is it Field? I don't know. Lincoln's in Field. I mean, I mean if you look, this Marina Bay Sands... Sky, but oh, you can get ticket prices. Yeah, I think the m minimum price room is about three hundred pounds. I think about three hundred. I mean, it goes up to cheap. Yeah, it goes up to about ten thousand pounds if you're looking for a uh, looking for a a suite, I suppose, up there. <laughs> and uh, well, you have a nice birthday, actually. I'm sure you will. Doing pub? Do people still do pub crawls? I suppose they do. Uh, Oh, oh, Steve, picking up is a pun. They pick up people. Yeah. Well, you have to explain that to yourself, do you? <laughs> God, blimey, honestly. Uh, Serena's got stitching contest sewn up. A medical student's become the youngest winner of the Great British Sewing Bee after learning the craft on YouTube. Because they, they have this programme. She comes from uh, Glasgow. She studied at Edinburgh University. She says, I hope it proves that sewing can be a hobby for everyone. Yeah, I don't think it is, though, really, is it? It's, I mean, I don't know what the audience would be for that, but probably not very many. Not very many. You're listening to a podcast from LBC. Morning. Nice to have you covered. A lot of dairies in Dorset now sell their milk in special dairy queen vending machines. Joe in Acton says, I'm 67 on Saturday and you were born March 17th in the same year as me. It's an outrageous allegation. I've never heard anything like it at all. Uh, Javier. It says, I've just booked Oslo Court for a delayed birthday celebration beginning of July. Can't wait. You'll love it. Seriously, we, we, my friend Daryl took me there ages and ages ago. And uh, I always say to people, if you're looking for something that's sort of, you know, it's, it's what you want, that would be the place to go. Check it out online. Check it out online. All birthdays today. Phyllida Lloyd. The filmmaker from Somerset directed The Iron Lady and on stage the Tina Turner musical. First film. Her first feature-length film was the ABBA musical Mamma Mia. She said she got through shooting with sleeping pills, intravenous caffeine and a certain amount of vodka. Uh, Phyllida Lloyd is 64 today. Happy birthday. And hairdresser to the stars, including Nick Ferrari. Nicky Clark celebrates his birthday today. So many happy returns to him. His hands were once insured for a million pounds, but he says my insurance certainly didn't pay up when I broke both my hands after falling off my Vespa. And uh, he was booked by L'Oreal to style film star Isabella Rossellini's hair. He said, I did three blow dries for £12,000. <laughs> and he's 63 today, Nicky Clark. Actually, I've, I could tell you a funny story, but I can't, I can't tell it on air, which is a great shame. Dale was on holiday and bumped into Nicky Clark with somebody. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Uh, house price is falling. Uh, Weinstein faces uh, more sex charges. And apparently cash use crashes. Isn't it funny? More people are not using cash now. Uh, the child of Sting and Trudy Styler, Sumner. That's uh, Trudy Styler. Uh, Ellert. Uh, is it? No, it's Elliot. I don't know if it's Elliot. I can't tell, actually. Elliot Sumner is enjoying a romance with the lingerie model, Sarah Holt. So they're both... Uh, the 30-year-old who plays a bodyguard in the forthcoming James Bond film No Time to Die enjoyed a date in London, Soho, with Agent Provocateur campaign star, also 30, from Cornwall. Most people assume I'm some blonde bimbo. It's amazing, actually, how many girls are coming out now recently. I mean, all of a sudden, it's been like an epidemic in the papers. And uh, they haven't disclosed how they met, but a friend said... Uh, Elliot was recently using the dating app Bumble. I don't even know what these things are, seriously. I'd only ever heard of Tinder and Grinder, but apparently there's like loads of them now, absolutely loads. And guess who, uh, who who was taken to the races the other day by Princess Anne? Andrew Parker Bowles. Nothing like keeping it in the family, is there really? Because as viewers of Netflix hit the crown, will know the pair enjoyed a passionate romance before the. 
uh, brigadier wed the future Duchess of Cornwall, who is now out with, uh, now married to Anne's brother. It's very Prince Charles. Very complicated, isn't it, really? But, uh, you know, Anne and Andrew have remained close friends for decades. Yes. Uh, she does have a husband, doesn't she? Uh, who's called... Whatever he's called, I can't remember, actually. I'm sure he's absolutely lovely. Meanwhile, Prince Edward wore a face mask emblazoned with an image of the Royal Yacht Britannia, decommissioned to the uh, dismay of the royal family. Uh, they have offered uh, a sort of a £200 million yacht to the Queen, but apparently she's turned it down. Yeah, but Boris, I think, did that, which seems, seems quite nice for him, doesn't it, really? Could have offered it to me. And uh, so, this morning, you've got Charles Spencer, brother of Diana, and... Um, I think it should be uh, should be a very, very interesting uh, interview. Bless the Scottish football team, Steve. Oh, but my sainted old aunt Edith, it'll take more than Yuri Geller's spoon bending and Lorraine Kelly's tartan bonnet wearing to have us uh, a wee win. I don't think it's going to happen, actually. I'm, I'm actually predicting it's going to be England. I've had a prophecy. I've, I've been to the same uh, PR agency as Yuri Geller, and I'm making a prediction that it's going to be... 2-1 to England. There you go. 2-1 to England. If I'm right, that means I'm as gifted as Yuri Geller and he'll be rubbish because he thinks it's going to be Scotland who are going to win. But I don't think so. Uh, Steve, is it possible to put the podcast on a CD Then I can listen in the car? I've only got a £5 Asda phone, so I'm able to download the podcast. Well, you need to change. You need to change, definitely. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, Stella says, I texted what I thought was a hilarious joke to Nick Abbott. He got to the punchline and said, is this from a Christmas cracker? Oh, he saves them all. He, he loves stuff like that. He really does. He's, he's very big into those things. Uh, Joy says, have you been to the top of the Shard? No. I went to the, uh, the restaurant there for afternoon tea, which was very nice. But uh, I, I, I haven't been to the top. I've been to... No, not really expect... They're all... Rub they're, all the teas, the afternoon teas are much of a muchness. Anywhere between 40 up to 70 or 80 quid. For after it, depending on whether you have a glass of champagne with it as well. Oh, look, a dormouse. I wouldn't hold one. I'd, I'd be thinking that, oh, they're so cute, aren't they? But they have to sort of, uh, they're so sweet. You can't see this, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, another one which says, uh, oh, somebody also asked you about the podcast. Just go to lbc.co.uk. OK, you can download the app and then you can download just about everything that you really want to have. Uh, Boris Johnson branding Matt Hancock totally hopeless. <laughs> just, it just honestly it gets more and more exciting by the day, doesn't it? More and more exciting. Noel Gallagher and Keith Richards have been comparing notes on difficult front men. The Oasis star estranged from Liam for a decade. For 10 years now that's gone on. 10 years, your brother. Bumped into uh, the Rolling Stone, a bandmate of Sir Mick Jagger at a bar in the Bahamas. Oh, honestly. Poor old uh, Noel Gallagher. What are you doing in the Bahamas, dear? It's not for you. Not for you at all. Noel says, he said, I've got a great thing. One thing I've always wanted to ask you. Who's the bigger, your singer or mine? And I said, well, your singer wrote some of the greatest lyrics of all time, so I'm going to say mine. So <laughs> there you go. There, all this falling out of people is just absolutely hilarious. It goes on all the time. Uh, England fan Ryan Hall has scored with Phil Foden's Gaza 96 look. The most stupid haircut I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, I mean, it's like me sort of going out there and saying to my hairdresser, uh, we're going to be having uh, bleach today. I did try it once, actually, but unfortunately, because I'm pale, I looked even worse. I looked like a milk bottle. Celebrity couple Tom and Giovanna Fletcher have said sorry for using the furlough scheme. Yeah, because they were pilloried in the paper today but they paid the full amount back good good shouldn't have done it in the first place but there you go at least they've given it back and john lewis is giving young staff maths lessons as they've been failed by our schools honestly i was looking at a news program the other day on the television whoever was doing the typing on the screen send them back to school they can't spell nothing more embarrassing is than somebody who can't spell you know i mean obviously standards in journalism must have fallen quite substantially Chairman Dame Sharon White says some of the 16-year-olds in its stores lack basic literary skills. So the firm, John Lewis, are having to fork out for basic maths, reading and writing to get them up to a decent level. My Godfathers, what are they doing at school? Well, obviously nothing. And believe it or not, and you won't believe this, because I didn't believe it, a quarter of children have never eaten an apple. And a fifth have never even heard of a banana. How is that possible? 
Despite having an average of four pieces of fruit and veg a day, a poll of kids aged 6 to 11 found many had no idea where they came from. A third of kids said they thought the produce just came from the supermarket, whilst 11% thought it was made in a factory. 21% of children had never heard of strawberries. 27% never heard of lemons. And you wonder why Mark's, uh, why John Lewis has given their staff maths lessons. Why are they employing them in the first place? Ridiculous. I've got to go. Got a maths lesson booked in. I'd want to, you know, nothing worse yet. When twenty one, I had it in a shop years ago. I'm, tomorrow I might tell you which shop it is. Let's see what the weather does, shall we? Today might be interesting. Might uh, might not be. On today's little bit extra podcast, it's worth getting. Probably is. Uh, the Kardashians are in the news again for the most tedious of reasons. Meghan Markle, we are told, isn't coming to London with Harry. Try to contain, to, to contain the disappointment. And uh, some of my top tips for riding the buses. All you do, as I say, you just go to lbc.co.uk, download the LBC app, the global player, or wherever else you get your podcast. Now, then you can listen live to LBC, which means you can listen back to this and all the other LBC programmes, as well as this huge range of podcasts. I mean, there really is. It's a fantastic uh, load of podcasts and we go back a number of years you can download programs going back but do them now rather than later because as we add more to the system more fall off the end it's like a long conveyor belt with a lot of podcasts on i'll be back with you tomorrow morning at four i wish you all a pleasant day take an umbrella just in case you never know